I rise to present urgent, uh, matter of urgent public importance. I seek your permission to enable me stand under order 8 rule 4 and at the same time add the second leg under 8 rule 7 to enable me to present the motion of urgent public importance on the urgent need to reverse the Nigeria Customs Service ban on the use of badges for evacuation of containers and other cargoes to and from ports. The motion on urgent need to reverse the Nigeria Customs Service ban on the use of badges for evacuation of containers and other cargoes to and fro from the ports. The House notes the prevailing and perennial traffic gridlock that has paralyzed operations and commercial activities around their Papa and Tinkan Island ports, which beg for innovation, innovative modal options to moving containers from and to the port, such as the use of badges and the rail system, in order to reduce the pressure on the road network and the narrow access to the ports. Worried by the Nigeria Customs Service Directive issued on the 12th of March 2020, banning the use of barges for evacuation of containers and other cargoes in and out of ports, and accusing some batch operators of diverting containers to illegal warehouses. Concerned that Nigeria Customs Service Directive banning the use of barges is against the concerted effort of the federal government and the Lagos State government various efforts to create international best practices, multimodal transport options, and in improving the free flow of traffic around the port. Also concerned that Nigeria Customs Directive is coming at a critical time when the federal government enforces closure of land borders with its West African neighbors, forcing the diversion of cargo through the seaports and shooting up the port throughput suddenly. Cognizant that adoption of batches as a mode of transportation, being the latest of the aggressive effort by the port authority to lift containers from the actual wharf and take them to lighter terminals all around Lagos, contribute the ease of chronic congestion in and around the port. Also, condition that some badge operators unscrupulously overload cargoes and occasionally compromise issues of safety and security on the waterways, requiring the increased regulations, which is what is needed only to save the situation. Note that rather than drastic measure of a total ban on badges, as a mode of transport of containers, the Nigeria Customs Service will explore options of consultation with relevant bodies and stakeholders with the aim of enhancing and standardizing the use of badges as an effective alternative mode. Worried that, we sh that this should the ban not be reversed, the worst congestion within and around the port which will readily hold the fragile Nigerian economy is looming. The House resolved to, one, urge the Controller General of Nigeria Customs Service to immediately halt and reverse the ban on the use of badges to evacuate containers and other cargoes to and from the ports. Two, direct the relevant committees to invest stakeholders involved in port transport operations such as Nigeria Customs Service, Minister of Transport, Nigeria Port Authority, FPA, National Inland Waterways Authority, NIWA, President Badge Operator, Operators of Nigeria, 
Nigeria Association and President of Association of Bonded Terminal Operators for consultation and review of the custom directive and the other mode of transportation and report back to the House in four weeks. I so move, Mr. Speaker. Straightforward, put the question so we can move on. Um, those in favor of this very important motion by Honorable Lake Abejide, please say aye. Without even asking for nays, it looks like the nays have it. Honorable Abejide, did you do your homework? Maybe they weren't listening. Honorable Abejide has brought a very important motion to do with customs and revenue. Those in favor, please say aye. Those against, please say nay. I have it. <laughs> My name is Honorable Ifain Chudi Moma. I represent the people of Ihiala, federal constituency. Mr. Speaker, Honorable Colleagues, I'm from Anambra State. I rise to present a petition on behalf of Mr. N.B. Mbachu Anyangu, Mr. M.C. Engineer Chijindu, and Mr. Philip Alaoku. Mr. Speaker, honorable colleagues, the petition borders on intimidation and unbridled abuse of power by the MD CEO of Metallurgical Training Institute, located at Owe Road, Onicha, Anambra State, against these aforementioned people. So I crave the indulgence of this honorable house if I could lay the petition, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. The House also set up an ad hoc committee to investigate the non-inclusion of waste management in the $10 billion NLNG Train 7 project as moved by Representative Yusuf Gagdi. I rise, Mr. Speaker, to move a motion on matter of urgent public importance regarding to an urgent need to investigate the non-inclusion of waste management and disposal in the in the Nigerian liquefied natural gas project seven. And Mr. Speaker, I consider it very important because it affects the environmental degradation of some communities within the country that we stand to represent. Mr. Speaker, may I move that? Order on may I come under order eight rule four, order four rule eight, to move that to allow me move this motion and to equally suspend the relevant section of our standing rule. I so move, Mr. Speaker. Those in favour of the motion, please say aye. The motion, Mr. Speaker, is on the need to investigate the non-inclusion of waste management and disposal in the NLNG train seven projects. Mr. Speaker, I may wish to note that sometimes last year, the final investment decision, FID, for the Nigerian liquefied natural gas, NLNG, train seven project was assigned. Mr. Speaker, the House may also wish to note that the estimated cost of the project is $10 billion, Mr. Speaker aware that the project is currently at the stage of sign-off by Nigerian liquefied natural gas, NLNG, to CPM, Shoda, and Dewu as a consortium. Concerned, Mr. Speaker, that the environmental impact assessment did not cut across the two host communities of Finama and Boni, the environmental impact assessment only covers Nigerian liquefied gas industrial area and residential area. Engineering, procurement, and construction, resident camp, and project site only. Also concerned, Mr. Speaker, that the project did not consider the treatment of sludge generated from industrial and human waste. Worried that the issue of industrial waste, industrial waste and sleep disposal by the international oil companies and the national oil companies are, remain, has remained a precarious problem which has caused a lot of environmental hazard in our host communities. Human life are threatened by the failure of those companies to comply with internationally accepted standards and 
subversion of industrial regula regulations. Mr. Speaker, I may wish my prayer for this motion is to set up an ad hoc committee to investigate the non inclusion of waste management disposal and sluice disposal by the various companies operating within the shore of this country. I so move, Mr. Speaker. The crux of the matter was in relation to an investigation being conducted by the House of Representatives on alleged revenue leakages of more than $30 billion. Mr. Speaker, our colleagues arise, I mean, under the eight to four to, to raise a motion, four and seven, to raise a, a motion on urgent need for the House to authorize the issuance of warrant of arrest against any person or head of organization that failed to appear or honor invitations to investigative hearings before any committee of the House of Representatives. Mr. Speaker, I will I so move. Thank you, honorable colleagues. Mr. Speaker, issuance of warrant of arrest against any person or head of organization that failed to appear honor, failed to appear or honor invitations to investigate hearings before any committee of the House of Representatives. The House knows the precarious economic situation Nigeria currently finds herself, heightened by the global economic recession, driven in part by the coronavirus pandemic and the unfortunate crash in international oil prices. The House further knows that the current price of crude oil in the international market is below $29 per barrel, approximately 50% down from the budgetary projection of $57 per barrel. Concerned that the continued dependence on oil revenue to fund the programs and projects of government is not sustainable and worried that existing corporate tax re uh, revenue leakages are hindering the diversification of the nation's revenue bills. The House observed huge revenue leakages over $30 billion attributable to corporations who systematically evade the remittance of the appropriate taxes despite public declarations of exorbitant revenues and profits. The House, at its sitting of 5th March 2020, acting in line with the provisions of Section 62, 88, and 89 of the Constitution, empowered via a resolution its committees on finance, banking and currency, with assistance from uh, uh, banking and currencies, with assistance of over, uh, with, uh, from other relevant government agencies, to conduct in-depth investigative hearings into all incidences of corporate tax revenue leakages. The sole objective of these investigations, honorable colleagues, by the House, is to ensure that Nigeria's tax regime remains fair and competitive and expected tax revenue uh, payout by any organization and or individual is paid appropriately and accordingly into the government treasury. The Committee of Final Banking and Currency, in furtherance of its obligations as directed by the House, issued letters of invitations to various corporations to submit documents of, of their full compliance with the laws of the Federation. The House is amazed that some of these corporations, particularly the telecom operators, under the agencies of incorporated trustees of operation of licensed com telecommunications operators of Nigeria, upon the receipt of letters of invitation, chose instead to file cases in court. The House notes a judgment in favor of National Assembly was delivered on the 13th of March 2020 by, Lord, by Her Lordship BFM Iyako J, which reinstated that National Assembly is empowered by sections 88 89 of the Constitution to invite any persons for investigative purposes. The House is aware that the 30 billion tax revenue leakage is based solely on documented evidence. This is not fishing expedition or an attempt to harass any law abiding entities comply with our letters of invitation, we afford any persons or organizations the opportunity to challenge any false allegations. The House resolves. The House resolves to invoke sections 89, 1D, and 2 of the Nigerian Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria as amended, which states entirely, I quote, to issue a warrant to compel the attendance of any person who, after having been summoned to attend, fails, refuses, 
or neglects to do so and does not excuse such failure, refusal or neglect to satisfaction of the House or the committee in question and to order him to pay all costs which may have been occasioned in compelling his attendance or by reason of his failure, refusal or neglect to obey summons and also to impose such fines as may be prescribed by any failure, refusal or neglect and any, so, and any fine so imposed shall be recoverable in the same manner as a fine imposed by a court of law. End of quote. 89.2, Mr. Speaker, I quote, it says, a summons or warrant issued under this section may be served or executed by any member of the Nigeria Police Force or by any person authorized in that behalf by the President of the Senate or Mr. Speaker of the House of Representatives as the case may require. The committee hereby seeks an amendment of the company income tax bill currently awaiting assent to the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria to, to insert any company or persons indicted by National Assembly that fails or refuses to pay or remit statutory revenue returns to the federal government through the appropriate quarters should have its directors criminally prosecuted for violation of our tax laws, barred from further business operations in the country, and, and the company blacklisted and delisted from the register of Corporate, uh, from the Registrar of the Corporate Affairs Commission. Mr. Speaker, Honorable Colleagues, has shown me. On the 5th of March, passed a resolution authorizing the two committees of finance, banking, and currency to investigate a motion which was brought to the floor on the over $30 billion revenue leakage. In the attempt, of course, to have the views of the organizations that are alleged to be responsible. We wrote letters to those companies, and some of them, of course, came up as an association, especially the telecom industries, the telecom operators. They came up to say, to, to, to they file a, a case in court, which, of course, was done last in the late assembly. And on the 13th of March, and on the 13th of March, Mr. Speaker, the court delivered judgment in favor of the National Assembly to the effect that the House or National Assembly has power to invite anybody for investigative purpose. Mr. Speaker and Rep. Colleagues, the, the Nigeria that we are today they deserve critical actions at this critical time. Majority of these companies, Mr. Speaker, have been invaded taxes by turning their books over and over again, taking loans, foreign loans, for example. I'll give you some critical examples, Mr. Speaker. There is a particular company, Mr. Speaker, that operates 100% in Nigeria, but only have 10% of its annual income being taxed here in Nigeria. Because the other 90% is based in Mauritius. And this company only have a, a, a representative office in Nigeria. What it means, Mr. Speaker, is that 90% run, run into billions of dollars, which are, which are taken to Mauritius, do not enjoy any tax, or is, I mean, it's not taxed by FRS or even the government of Nigeria. Mr. Speaker, we have companies who took loan overseas in foreign currency called equipment loan. These equipment, ordinarily under the uh, FRX uh, regime, uh, if it was brought in, we give them a capital allowance to reduce the, the value of the tax or the turnover and the value of the tax they are going to pay to Nigeria. But on one hand, they took the loan in foreign currency, brought it into Nigeria, and the next day, it was credited to a foreign country, to, a foreign, to their shareholders in a foreign country. It was credited. It, to, I mean, they took the loan, about $90 million, Mr. Speaker, let me be precise. 
The money came to his account, to the, com to the company's account, and the next day it was transferred to a shareholder in Mauritius. What does it mean, Mr. Speaker? <laughs> they then bring it in for record purpose, for record purpose, so that they could take the capital allowance certificates from the bank and seek tax relief from FRS. On the other hand, they now take, they apply for Forex from CBN to also pay this loan, thereby depleting our Forex, the, the money that was not used in Nigeria. And thirdly, Mr. Speaker, the equipment that was supposed to be brought in and duty paid, custom duties paid, were not brought in. These are the skeletons in their cupboards that they don't, they don't want the house to expose. And so, by going, to, by going to court, they seek to prolong and delay the activities of the National Assembly. If we allow this to continue, then we have no business assisting Nigeria. Mr. Speaker, and colleagues, there are so many infractions, and by the time we have the details of their infractions, run into billions of, of dollars, and we are saying, look, these details that we have, we don't want to believe it until you submit your own documents. Rather than being, being free to submit their documents and defend the documents before us, they felt that the best way is to stop proceedings by approaching the courts. Of course, the Constitution of the, of the country empowers us, Mr. Speaker, sections 88 and 89, to invite anybody under the sun, even Mr. President, if we need him to answer to questions, he will be invited, and I'm sure he will honor us. How much more Nigerians who are, support, who are making monies and billions of naira in Nigeria refusing or don't want to honor the invitations of the National Assembly? Mr. Speaker, honorable colleagues, I think it is time to shake the table. I so much. Thank you, sir. I acknowledge what is happening in this very important sector. Mr. Speaker, our economy is bleeding. And so we need to work hard around the clock to ensure every cobo that should get into our federation account is taken. And so I want to thank him. I want to thank the committee for doing this very excellent job. I will have said ordinarily, you don't need this motion to evoke those relevant positions uh, of the Constitution. But for emphasis and for others to know I think it's important that we debate this matter, though it's investigative. I mean, our, our own, by our procedure, investigative hearing are not normally supposed to be subjected to intensive discussion. Mr. Speaker, it is funny that when those companies were seeking for registration, they came as individuals. Individuals as, as a corporate company, individuals as persons to go to corporate affairs commission to seek for the decision of the various companies. Now, it comes to the issue of remitting what is supposed to be partly what should go to the services of our nation. They want to come as a, an association to say, no, we will not come to National Assembly, we will, no, we will not be held accountable because they have called what is called an illegal, as far as I'm concerned, association. This should not be encouraged, it should not be allowed, we should do our work. And I'm saying for emphasis, Mr. Speaker, that such lawyers, if there are emphasis, if there are provisions, for them to be sanctioned, you are seeing your country, it is only in Nigeria that this nonsense that will happen. Every nation in the world today is trying to live up to its own responsibility to ensure every dime is being brought into the system because of the corona impact on the various levels of economy. Unfortunately, Nigerians who are supposed to help the system work are the ones who want to sabotage. I want to say thank you to this uh, chairman, and we should encourage, Mr. Speaker, we should not waste time to evoke the necessary provisions of the Constitution. And I want to employ on the security uh, apparatus that when such uh, uh, orders are given, they must comply. Fellow to do that, we will find them complacent and would we'll take them as associate as far as I'm concerned. And economic sabotage all over, I think the highest punishment should be death penalty. Thank you very much, sir. 
are where we are because of the acts of these companies, in not only the telecommunication companies, including those multinationals in the petroleum sector. As you are aware, last year, the revenue we expected for customs dropped. The one from uh, FRS dropped. Why did it drop? It dropped because of the activities of these agencies. They come in different names and take away our money in different forms. In terms of capacity, which never comes. They take the money away, foreign exchange, capacity building, it never comes. They take them in the form of equipment. But being that as it may, that Nigeria is bleeding, if we also rely on our legislative houses pass and privileged out of Section 4 and Section 5, I think that is sufficient for us to invoke. That is sufficient for us to issue the warrant of arrest for anybody who is looking at the position of Nigeria today that our budget has been cut by 1.5 trillion. That is not the end because it's just starting. We don't even know what tomorrow we may give. If we rely on that act alone, it's enough for us to make sure that they do the proper thing. In this process, all the other companies, all the servicing companies, that more will be revealed at the public hearing. We are not taking position. That's why we are not mentioning the names. But let them come up here, run into the courts. Because you give them the protection that they don't, they don't deserve. So I so move, Mr. Speaker. The grand norm of our democracy, of our governance, is our constitution. And Mr. President, in obedience to the provision of our constitution, do appear before this house, Mr. Speaker, first one to section 81, to lay our budget estimates annually. And whenever occasion demands, it comes to this parliament. Mr. Speaker, we are talking about the revenue side now, which is very, very technical. Because the United Nations, under its protocols and conventions, resolved several years back to curb corruption. There are a lot of schemes. People come under tax avoidance. When in actual fact, they are evading taxes. There is need for Committee on Finance to research and work along that line. Because people will come to want to defend themselves by deploying tax avoidance scheme. We all know all over the world that gone are those days. Because even in Switzerland, where people used to hide money without disclosure are gone. We now have the where without to remove the veil and to know who is who behind any entity. I don't want to belabor us with the provisions of our constitution section 89 as uh, adumbrated by both Honorable, uh, by my leader, the Deputy Speaker, Honorable Faleke and Honorable Victor. The provisions of the legislative houses and privileges act Section 4, Section 5, also very clear. But Mr. Speaker, I also want, I want to inform Nigerians that even when we generate this money and we appropriate, and those people will have the, give the powers to manage the money. And Section 85, 53B, expects them to render accounts to the Auditor General of the Federation, Mr. Speaker. Unfortunately, the Auditor General cried in his report of 2017, that over 323 MDAs, corporations, refused to render accounts. It will interest you, Mr. Speaker, that serious organizations that we rely on, the plant based on which our annual financial budget are based, in the last six years have been, do not have audited accounts. I mentioned customs, Mr. Speaker. Nigerian customs, even the FRS, Mr. Speaker, that we get power to collect taxes. They are here to submit their 2017 and 2018 accounts. On which basis do we formulate our MTF? On which basis do we formulate our budgets? So, Mr. Speaker, sir, this motion came at the appropriate time. There should not be sacred cows. Nobody is above the law. And like I observed, if Mr. President 
comes to this parliament in obedience to the constitution to lay, the, to lay his budget estimates. How, how, how much more? I mean, a, 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 a CEO. The appointee that, that he appointed. Is that the way to pay Mr. President back? By disobeying the provision of the constitution? By not writing accounts? Mr. Speaker, I will mention names. The DG of Central Organization of Nigeria, we've written four letters. Mr. Honorable Professor was only being smarter by bridging this matter. In our report, which we just to lay next week, we've written four letters that to cause appearance. And so many of them. Mr. Speaker, so many agencies have floated subsidiaries to defy the TSA Act, the TSA I mean, scheme. We all resolved that, okay, everyone should bank with, under TSA so that from a window we can see the true financial position of this country. You see all sorts of schemes. People floating subsidiary companies are now banked with commercial banks. How many of us are aware there are over 15 subsidiaries under CBN? How many of us are aware there are over 18 subsidiaries under NPC? Even some agencies, you ask Auditor General, he doesn't even know they exist. Some also come to tell us that they are not government agency, and we ask them, remove the veil, who owns you? You find out it is government. So, Mr. Speaker, this motion is apt, it's necessary, it's important, and I want to commend the brains behind this motion. I support this motion in its entirety, Mr. Speaker. This motion is timely. It is timely because it revolves around our tax system, Mr. Speaker. And there is no better time, Mr. Speaker, than, than now for us to talk about the evasion of taxes by these corporations. Mr. Speaker, as you know, the budget for 2020 was based on $57 per barrel. Today, the price of crude is $25 per barrel. And the budget has been reduced by 1.5 trillion. We do not know if the price of crude is going to go down, Mr. Speaker. And then, of course, it will be much lower than that. But why I'm bringing this into consideration right now, Mr. Speaker, is because, because of the low prices of crude oil, what our economy is going to depend on mostly now is tax. The economy needs stimulus, and that stimulus is going to come, a lot of it is going to come from tax. Where there is evasion of that tax by these corporations, Mr. Speaker, it becomes an issue. Mr. Speaker, in the Seventh Assembly, I was the Deputy Chairman for Local Content, and we investigated a company that had been paid over $10 billion in projects in Nigeria. That company had only one office in Lagos. It didn't have any assets. It did not have anything, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, we are now in a situation whereby the country as a whole will be depending on income from tax in 2020 to avoid a recession. So I believe this uh, motion is timely. And Mr. Speaker, I urge every single member in this chamber to support this motion. I thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this is a very important motion. It's important for Nigerians to realize that payment of tax is a moral obligation. When organizations are invited, they should understand that nobody is witch hunting them that nobody is looking at all their operations. When we invite them, it's mostly restricted to the issue of payments of taxes. And it's important as a country that we look at various ways of getting revenue because we know the situation we are right now. The fact that we are over-reliant on oil is a big issue. And that's why we have to look in, in, inwards. And that's one of the reasons we are looking at this. Every organization, every individual has a moral obligation to pay, pay tax to the country. So I, I think it's very important that when they are invited, they must answer, uh, answer the parliament. Of course, we, 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 we have, we have uh, constitutional backing to do, to do so. We also, also, also have a uh, um, judicial precedent 
to also do so. So, Mr. Mr. Speaker, I support this motion fully, and we should have the power, because we do have the power anyway, to issue warrants of arrest to heads of organizations that flout the law of the land, that do not pay taxes, because if you, if you don't pay tax, where in the world or how in the world are we going to run this country? So, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I support this mo motion, and I, I, of course, urge members to support this motion because this is very important, not just to the, very, the, the committees involved, but to all the committees in the House. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. Just very quickly say and thank Honorable Falike for bringing this motion. Our democracy rests on a tripod the executive, the judiciary, and the legislature. And each one, particularly the legislature, has the power to summon. And if organizations can adhere to the summons of the judiciary, of the executive, there is no reason why they should not succumb or bow to the majesty of our democracy by obeying the summons of the House. And it is for this reason that of all the three arms of government, the one the framers of the Constitution deemed fit to expressly provide for the power of arrest, power of summons in the Constitution is the legislature. Uh, Honorable colleagues, the most important power this house has is that of the purse. If you recall, a few, a couple of weeks ago, this house resolved to set up a committee headed by the chairman finance to look into the dwindling revenue, which would affect us, would shake the very foundation of our democracy if we don't make the revenue that upon which our budget is based. To look into the dwindling revenue, the House resolved to set up this committee to find out ways and means upon which we can look for alternative sources of income. I think that was a responsible thing to do, which we did. In their work, and I'm giving a, I'm intentionally going around giving a proper background to this, so that when we decide to do what we do, we will find enough justification. In the course of their work, the committee discovered shortage of revenue, either deliberately or inadvertently, by certain committees, uh, organizations, particularly private organizations, in form of taxes. They wrote, and these organizations responded by saying they were not going to appear before the committee because they had simply filed a case in court. When the chairman informed me, I specifically asked them which committees, and I, I'm going to ask the same quest, question. We're not going to hide or cover any uh, organization. Honorable well, Falike, who were the, well, which of the organizations did you write to that said they could not come before your committee? The uh, organizations are the telecom operators. The uh, under their incorporated trustees. But they put their names there. Uh, as MTN, Globalcom, Airtel, uh, Spectranet, Main One, and so many, so many of them. I mean, about 15, 15 companies, actually. Well, the MTNs, the Globalcoms of this world are not above the law. We said at the beginning of this night assembly that we shall be, every now and then, we shall shake the table. This may just be one of those instances where we will have to shake the table. 
we will not sit down and accept for the House of Representatives or the National Assembly as a whole to be handicapped. Because some companies somewhere, particularly the foreign companies, are sitting down somewhere, and what they cannot do, the summons they cannot, I'm sure if uh, MTN was summoned by the South African Parliament, they will rush to Parliament. But well, now you're being summoned by the Nigerian Parliament where you do business and you say you cannot show up. I believe they, they have been given fair hearing. But I believe uh, the committee should write to them one more time so that we exhaust the issue of fair hearing under the Constitution. There is something called contempt of court. There's also something called contempt of the legislature. If you refuse to obey the summons of the legislature, you will you be held in contempt. And the, the, the consequence of that is arrest as prescribed in the Constitution. What many people fail to understand or don't take cognizance of is not just that the Constitution says that you can arrest. The Constitution also actually gives you the power to arrest and to place a fine on the airing company. So they are subject to arrest and subject to fine as imposed by this house, whatever the father fine may be. So we will not allow these organizations to bring our democracy to its knees. So I will ask that the chairman of the committee issue one more final notice, and this, is serving, this serves as notice as well. And if in seven days you do not hear from them, then please, my doors are wide open, let's kickstart the process, I will arrest whoever needs to be arrested and compel their attendance at the, uh, uh, at the hearing. Let it be clear that when you thumb your nose at the at the legislature. You're actually thumbing your nose at the country. And we will not sit for that. So I'll put the question. Those in favor of the motion, please say aye. Those against, please say nay. Ayes have it. Honorable members, Small and Medium Scale Enterprises Development Agency Act, Amendment B 2020, first reading. Entrepreneurship Education Promotion B 2020, first reading. Free Internet Access in Public Places Bill 2020, first reading. National Rogastic Commission Act, Amendment B 2020, first reading. Charter Quality Institute of Nigeria, Assembly Bill 2020, first reading. Reading of a bill for an act to establish the Chartered Institute of Social Works Practitioners and to make provisions, among other things, for training of personnel members and control of the profession of social work. And for related matters, honorable members will recall that the bill that the House, in the Committee of the Whole, on Tuesday, 17th of March, 2020, considered and adopted the report on the bill. I now invite the Leader of the House to move that the bill be now read the third time. Leader. Mr. Speaker, by your leave, I rise to move that the bill for an act to establish the Chartered Institute of Social Workers, Practitioners, and to make provisions, among other things, for training of personnel members, members and control of the profession of the social work, and for related matters, HB 358, be read the third time. Mr. Speaker, honorable members, I so move. And those in support of the motion, please say aye. Those against, please say nay. Ayes have it. The clerk is invited to read the long title of the bill. Honorable Speaker, Honorable Members, a bill for an act to establish the Charter Institute of Social Works, Partitioners, and to make provisions, among other things, for training of personnel members and control of the profession of social work, and for later matters, third reading. Honorable colleagues, based on the House's resolution today, to set up an annual committee on the urgent need to investigate the non-inclusion of waste management and disposal in the NLNG Train 7 project. Following are the members of that committee. Honorable Jarik Beyagom will chair the committee. Honorable Yusuf Gagdi, Honorable Ahmed Jaha, Honorable Maki Yeleman, 
Honorable Benjamin Kalu, Honorable Abubaka Nalaraba, Honorable Wave Francis, Honorable Professor Julius Yovere, Honorable Idu Igariwe, Honorable Musa Pali, Honorable Yemi Ali, Honorable Adebanjo, Honorable Ibrahim Al Mustafa, Honorable Yao Galadima, and Honorable Fakeye. Four bills passed through second reading, including a bill sponsored by Representative Ozuribu Gunna, which seeks to amend the Economic and Financial Crimes Act in sections dealing with assets recovery. Mr. Speaker, the bill I have I, to amend the Economic and Financial Crime Commission Act 2004 is all about an area of four amendments that we want to achieve. First and foremost, Mr. Speaker, just recently, the name of Nigerian prisons was changed to correctional services. So, Mr. Speaker, I seek first and foremost to amend Section 6, Subsection 0 of this Act to delete the name prisons and incite the name correctional service board on this bill. Secondly, Mr. Speaker, we intend to achieve to secure the livelihood of Nigerians who are employees of business concern that have been established by what that have proved to be proceeds of financial and economic crimes. The, the already existing law, Mr. Speaker, have not show, given any room to secure the jobs of these employees who are innocent of whatsoever crime that was committed to establish those business concerns. In section 26, subsection 2, the law provides that whenever a property is seized under any provision of this act, the commission may, one, place the property under sale, b, remove the property to a place designed by the commission. Mr. Speaker, if this is an ongoing business concern, we don't need to push all the employees that are working under this establishment back to the labor field. Most of them must have resigned their previous jobs to go into this business, or some of them must have stayed at home for a very long time before they secure this business or this um, job opportunity. So selling the property, to me, Mr. Speaker, and to us, I don't think is ideal. That's why, Mr. Speaker, in this session 26, Subsection 2, we want to amend by inciting a new subsection 2C, which we read as follows. That where a forfeited property is or form part of a going business consign and corporate entity with employees, the commission shall not see the property. Corporate entities or business consign, but shall appoint receiver managers to take over the property corporate entity or business concern until such time that the property or corporate entity or business concern shall be disposed in accordance to this act or order of the court. Mr. Speaker, the receiver's managers appointed pursuant to this subsection shall be persons of high integrity and they shall be accountable to the commission. The third amendment we tend to achieve is, Mr. Speaker, that we are stakes or local governments who are victims of financial and economic crimes shall be benefit shall benefit from the proceeds of recovered funds or properties of that state. It's wrong, Mr. Speaker, that any property or funds that are recovered will be paid directly to a consolidated account of the Federation if when it is not known that the crime or property that was involved belongs to either the state or the local government. Right over, Speaker, recently EFCC actually returned about 263 million belonging to Kuala State government. But that we must formalize. It will not be done out of favor. If you watch um, other, the session 31, one, two, three of this act, it have not shown any seriousness to return this property. Silence, please. Silence, please. 
to the state or local government. Mr. Speaker, also, we want to amend all the provision of Section 14, Subsection 3, yeah, how is that? 20, well. Subsection well. 1 and 2, 21, Please. 22, Subsection 1 and 2, 29, 23, Subsection 3, to read hmm? as follows. How now? That in any of this session in the principal act, oh, no. the amendment should be by inserting the words or to the account of the state or local government whose funds or property is subject matter of the offense immediately after the word federation of government. Right, honorable speaker, also in session 31, we we'll have to strengthen this by amending section 31, section option 2, by inserting the words provided. The Secretary of the Commission shall not dispose the property where the state or local government is the beneficiary of the forfeiture order, but shall transfer ownership to the benefiting state or local government immediately after the World Federation. Mr. Speaker, one will ask what of the funds incurred in recovering this property or funds, what of the administrative charges. That's why we tend to insert a new sub session to this sub section 31 to read as follows. A state or local government being a beneficiary of a forfeiture order shall pay to the commission such administrative fee as may be determined by the Attorney General. Right honorable colleagues, there's no further financial engagement on these proposed acts. We are not looking for any other financial responsibility or engagement on this, or rather we try to amend the Economic and Financial Crime Commission Act Cap U1, Lord of the Federation of Federal Republic of Nigeria, to make it possible for states and local government who are victims of the financial economic crime benefit from the looted fund, also Mr. Speaker, to secure the life food of Nigerians who are already employed in these businesses and properties that form part of proceeds of financial and economic crimes, and as well as correct that nomenclature of prison to correctional service board. Silence, please. Silence, please. I urge my Honourable members take your seat. Please support this bill so we can actually. Ben Kalu, Honourable Judoka. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I remain Uzoma Nkim Abonta, Mr. Speaker. I'm privileged to speak for Kwa East and West Constituents of Abia State. Mr. Speaker, I will be speaking in the merits and goodness of this amendment sought by Honorable Oduribo. Mr. Speaker, he's only asking that we should amend the act in a way that will not be creating further unemployment. He's asking that we amend that sections of the act so that our discipline will not be accusatorial in nature. So that we may not pass judgment before hearing. Mr. Speaker, I want to support this with a, a specific example. There was a company that had 400 employees. Upon being involved in an, uh, 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 the uh, problem of economic financial matter. They got the company sealed. 400 persons were thrown into labor market, Mr. Speaker. Four months after, the matter went in favor of the company. But by then, they've destroyed the company, they've destroyed the race, and today, they're in the market. What he's asking for, that in such a situation, we should seek to preserve the going concern by having a kind of receiver manager of some certain qualities. He labored to describe what that would be, and I think that's for the committee. At the committee level, I'm probably trying to decide what caliber of persons, experts, who would do that. But if we do not take away the powers to seal, let me give you an example, Mr. Speaker. Assuming, not consenting, that leadership or whatever got involved in EFCC matter, are they going to seal the National Assembly pending the hearing? It's a kind of thing. I'm not drawing a larger picture. So he's saying 
which is desirable, should such a company as a going concern get involved, do not foreclose, do not seal, pass the management to a responsible person who can continue that so that persons benefited under the act should be working pending the final for future or whatever. Therefore, there are alongside other things that will be let it go to the committee level and we should not only pass it but fast track it so that we amend it and keep Nigeria going. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, Honorable Mangunu. Mr. Speaker, Honorable Members, this amendment sought to be brought to the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission Act is very relevant and germane, especially against the backdrop of the fact that states are prepared of resources that is needed for the purpose of uh, propelling their economic development. And most of the economic and financial crimes that is being perpetrated is either at the local government level or at the state level. And therefore, it is great injustice being meted out to the state for monies that are recovered from funds that are misappropriated or looted from state or local government coffers to be taken over by the federal government for the purpose of its own development. As rightly pointed out by the sponsor of this motion, it's like uh, robbing Peter to pay for. So therefore, Mr. Speaker, our own members, this motion is very apt and, and germane, especially that aspect of the amendment that seeks to give monies that, are, that is recovered, that is meant for state and local governments to be given back to them rather than the federal government taking over such monies. I support the second reading of this bill. Thank you. Those who in favor say aye. Those against say nay. That's have it. The clerk is invited to the long title of the bill. Among those speaker, honorable members, a bill for an act to amend the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission Act, Chapter A1, Laws for the Federation of Nigeria 2004, and for related matters. Second reading. Bill referred to Committee on Financial Crimes. Let's speak, colleagues. The sixth order of the day is the commencement of debate on the general principle of a bill for an act to provide for the establishment of federal roads and highway forest guards charged with responsibility and, among other things, to dictate and prevent crime, banditry, kidnapping, terrorism, and violence, apprehend offenders, preserve laws and order, and protect lives and properties strictly within the forest lying 100 meters adjacent to all federal roads and highways in Nigeria and for later matters standing there, Honorable Usman Deju Mashidi. Honorable members will recall that the bill was heard the first time on Wednesday, 1st March 2020. I now invite Honorable Shidi to move that the bill be read the second time. Honorable Shidi. I rise to present a bill for an act to provide for establishment of federal roads, highways, forest guards, charged with responsibility, among other things, to dictate, prevent crime, banditry, kidnapping, terrorism, and violence, apprehend offenders, preserve law and order, protect life and properties strictly within all forest lines, 100 meters adjacent to federal roads and highways in Nigeria for related matters. I move that this bill be allowed for second reading. Six for an act to establish federal roads and highways, forest guard, which principal responsibilities that among other things be to dictate, prevent, banditry, kidnapping, robbery, terrorism, violence, apprehend offenders, preserve law and order, and protect life and property in all forests strictly lying 100 meters adjacent to all federal roads, highways, railways in Nigeria. By the interpretative provision of this bill, Federal roads and highways, forest means such areas of land, whether or not covered by vegetation, trees that lie 100, 100 meters adjacent to all federal roads. Highways and railways in Nigeria and shall not extend to any purpose for animal husbandry, 
Oh, Ranchi. Mr. Speaker, the purpose of this bill, this bill is born out of, out of my passionate desire for all of us as lawmakers to individually and collectively find legislative solution to continue to the continual widespread insecurity and violence in Nigeria today. The adverse effects of insecurity are really challenging and it becomes on us, on, not only on me, but all of us as federal lawmakers to collaborate this fight in the interest of the nation. Mr. Speaker, honorable colleagues, all of us are aware of the fact that our forests and our highways have been taken over by bandits, by kidnappers, by terrorists. The forests have become a safe haven for our kidnappers. The, the bandits and kidnappers today have become a serious challenge even to our economy and to our security. Bandits are becoming government in Nigeria. At the point, some state government are even negotiating with them. But the speaker, honorable colleagues, if we are not careful, these lawless Nigerian citizens Tomorrow, we will not be here because we might turn to be like they will turn to be like the the, the uh, drug baron in Mexico and Colombia. Honourable colleagues, if this bill is passed and accepted to, there shall be an establishment of a specialized security outfit called Federal. Federal Forest Guards, which will specifically man the various forest line 100 meters adjacent to federal roads, highways, and railways in Nigeria. In so doing, the current spate of crime, kidnapping, banditry, robbery, terrorism being experienced in the brutal hands of criminal elements that launch their attacks on federal roads, highways, and railways users. From, from, from nearby forest will, will be a thing of the past. The guards shall be provided with arms and ammunition. I would end my I think you have exhausted your time. I uh, want to believe you have given us the very good lead of what was quiet in terms of the flesh of what they have been stands for. Mr. Speaker, honorable colleagues, um, I just want to commend my colleague who has moved this, who is proposing this bill. Um, but unfortunately, I think that um, this bill is not necessary at this time. And if you look at the, the legislative brief which he has put up, he even listed all the agencies that are doing almost similar work. And he is trying to prove or justify the non interference of functions with other agencies. We have the Federal Road Safety Agency, which we can't even really fund. We have the National Park Service, which have the National Guards working with them. All we need to do is to fund them. We don't need to create a new arm of young men and women who we cannot fund. We have the civil defense. They're even interfacing with one another. We need funds to keep these agencies afloat. Now I'm creating another one, and I think I won't hear him talking about bearing arms and all that, will be just duplication and duplication of issues. There is a customs on the road. In fact, there are too many people, Mr. Speaker, at some point we are trying to prune them down and not to increase them. We must find other ways. We have arable land for people to farm if they are looking for opportunities. So on that premise, um, no personal aggrandizement towards my honorable dear colleague Shindy. All I just think is that this, this, mush, this bill shouldn't go further than this, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, sir. Uh, Honorable Osman Danjuma Shidi, for bringing this to the fore, 
The matter is on a bill for an act to regulate and provide the establishment of federal roads and highways, forest guards, and other matters ancillary thereto. Mr. Speaker, honorable colleagues, I represent an area of Goji River Federal Constituency from Enugu State. Mr. Speaker, I know the spirit behind this bill, you know, is manifested based on the things it wants to cure. But I know there are highways and I know that there are forests. A combination of both in forming a guard will be a look uh, uh, anachronistic. So, Mr. Speaker, honorable colleagues, I think we know that there are forest guards or forest rangers, but anything that will make such outfits continuously federal in nomenclature will go to I mean, it, it does not address the imperfections of what we have presently. Because as a matter of fact, in various places, we already have enabling state legislations that are dealing with these issues. In any state, we have forest guards. And these are people who are addressing some of the imperfections we have. And we also, there is a sufficient argument about state police. These are issues that are on the table, and they are being addressed. As a matter of fact, my colleague, uh, Honorable uh, uh, Chidoka, had also pointed that, look, there are so many federal agencies, immigration, civil defense, um, the, the uh, road safety, that are responsible for some of these issues in terms of highways, in terms of uh, guards, I do not think that we want to complicate our situation by establishing a federal highways and forest guard. These are some of the responsibilities. We are making too much effort and it's becoming, it's like belaboring the obvious that we should titrate some of these things to the states. As a matter of fact, there is an amendment to the constitution that was brought by the uh, minority, uh, by the majority whip, Honorable uh, Mungono, with regard to reducing or devolving to the state some of the uh, schedules of our constitution, with regard to railway, with regard to police, with regard to some of the responsibilities which they can much more, that can be much more efficiently done by the states. So, Mr. Speaker, Honorable colleagues, Whereas the intentment of the motion is quite good, but it's a modus operandi and the structures that will guide it, I think that from our past and from the imperfections of the various agencies we have, that this will not, you know, uh, it, it, in fact it will meet the same challenges and perdition that the present agencies are, are, are meeting. So I think that it should be stepped down and now uh, properly addressed. Thank you very much. Very far thinking in order to address some of these challenges. The Boko Haram, the banditry we are all experiencing from Lokoja, Abuja, uh, Lere, Toro, Nasrawa are all taking place in these forest reserve areas. We need it. We need the preservation of those areas. But I want to believe that they are supposed to be properly manned and secured. And for these good reasons, I want to plead with colleagues not to kill a bee. Because the challenges, I want to say, from an informed position, are quite very serious. And I pray that members are aware of how these movements are done. Their hideouts are in those areas. But what could then base to cure and ensure we mitigate is what we need to take in depth. 
either we allow it pass the committee to do this. That would, that would be my appeal, rather than killing. Put the question. Four. I, 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 it's just to appeal to our conscience. I think everyone will argue based on his own knowledge and what he wants to stand for. I so much agree to what Obina said. I've been in the Committee on Environment for good eight years, four years. I know the challenge. He was chairman in the last house on Committee on Environment. He was trying to protect them. But he knows in their budgetary provision, I don't think they have more than 100 million per year. Two hours. So how will they man this, the, the, the forest uh, that, 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 uh, that is there? Meanwhile, it is very vast. I am coming from one of the boundary areas, from Sambisa to uh, uh, the one in Bauchi, right to, uh, up down to Yankari. It's very, quite very large. And these are the areas these criminals hide. I think we beat and we need it. Thank you very much. Now the question is that the bill be raised second. Those if you ever say aye. Those against say nay. Yeah. The have it. <laughs> Clark. Honorable Speaker, Honorable Members, a bill for now to, to provide for the establishment of federal roads and highway forest guys charged with responsibility, among other things, to detect and, and prevent crime, banditry, kidnapping, terrorism, terrorism and violence apprehend offenders, preserve law and order, and protect lives and property strictly within all forest lane, lying 100 meters adjacent to all federal roads and highways in Nigeria, and, and for related matters. Second reading. Bill referred to committees on works, agriculture, production and services, and then environment. Security? all the relevant committees of the House. Respect colleagues, the seventh order of the day is a commencement of debate on the general principle of a bill for an act to establish Federal College of Fisheries and Agriculture to a more Delta State charged with the responsibility of pro to provide full-time courses in fisheries, agriculture studies, and for late matters standing in the name of Honorable Julius Pondi, honorable members will call that the bill was uh, read the first time on Wednesday for December 2019. I now invite honorable Pondi to move that bill be read a second time. My name is Julius Barbosa Pondi. I represent the very wonderful and industrial people of Putu Federal Constituency, Mr. Speaker. In Zonkame, I'm from Delta State. I rise to move a motion for a bill for a bill for an act to establish Federal College of Fisheries and Aquaculture, Puma, Delta State, charged with responsibility to provide full-time courses in fisheries, aquaculture studies, and for related matters. I so move, Mr. Speaker. I am still Honorable Dr. Samuel Babatunde Adejari, and I represent all the wonderful people of Agege Federal Conference, Mr. Speaker, from Lagos State. I rise to second the motion as moved by honorable colleague. I so, I so second. Speaker, thank you for the opportunity for me to speak in two minutes on this bill. Uh, this bill is like uh, every other tertiary institution that have a governing council. But the difference is that it is targeted at the environment that we, that we live in, that the people live in. Mr. Speaker, this institution is of the proposed College of Fishing and Aquaculture to more is intended to be a specialized institution that will provide both academic and practical education in fishery science. Sciences. The college will also impact knowledge in the very intricate areas of biodiversity which nature bestowed on the people of Bhutu local government. Mr. Speaker, by any standard of measurement, it is a progressive leap towards 
in the quest for scholarship in the field of fishing and aquaculture. He shall offer courses in every considerable area in two fields, both at the national and higher diploma. Mr. Speaker, the, this, this college will attend to the coastline, ranging from Delta to Bayesa and across the country. Mr. Speaker, Brutal local government area is one of the very oldest local government areas in this country. But if we speak, honorable colleagues, there is no federal presence by way of institution other than federal assets where endlessly crude oil is being pumped. And there is no any sign of development in Brutal local government area. Mr. Speaker, honorable colleagues, it is my prayer and appeal to this house that if this bill passes through, the people of Butu will not only be happy, they will not only say that the bill or the Ninth Assembly has graciously, graciously approved the very first institution in their local government, they will say that it happened under the regime and leadership of Femi Bajabia Amila and of course under that honorable Idris Wase. So I want to appeal that this bill should, my colleagues should support this bill, I believe in this bill, that the people of Brutu are highly marginalized by way of education and that this bill will come to their aid and will also be measured equally with other parts of this country. So, Mr. Speaker, I beg that this bill should be allowed to go, my honorable colleagues, that at the end of the day, we would have done a great good to the people of Brutu. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Improving our standard of uh, practice in agriculture and education. So I now put the question. Those in favor that the bill raise second time say aye. Those against say nay. That's have it. Bill referred to, sorry, uh, Clark is invited to the, the long title. Honorable Speaker, honorable members, the bill for now to establish further collective of fisheries and aquaculture to a more data state, charged with the ability to provide full-time courses in fisheries aquaculture studies and for later matters, second reading. Bill referred to Committee on Agricultural Colleges and Institutions. I don't know whether tertiary institutions are supposed to be part of it. So I say relevant committees of the House. Let's pray, colleagues. The eighth order of the day is a motion on need to protect the Iron Marshall Line in or be a local government area of Bayel State, standing in the now honorable Oboa Freight. Honorable Oboa is invited to move the motion. Of officers of the, of the Federal Road Safety Commission from engaging motorists in hot chase on highway, standing in the now honorable Oluemi Tayo. Honorable Tayo is invited to move the motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, sir. The House has called on the Federal Road Safety Corps to stop high-speed chase of traffic offenders on highways in view of attendant dangers, as moved by Representative Oluyemi Taiwu. I have a motion on a need to caution officers of the Federal Road Safety Commission from engaging motorists in hot chase on highways. The House knows that security of lives and properties is provided for in section 14 of the 1999 constitution as amended as the primary purpose of government. As also notes that the Federal Road Safety Commission was established for the purpose of managing traffic, preventing and minimizing accidents on the highways, supervising users of such highways, educating motorists and members of the public on the importance of road dis discipline as well as checking road worthiness of vehicles and other related matters. I was also informed of the incident of a horse of an 18-seater commuter bus filled with passengers along Ogo on Shoy Lawing Road on the 8th of February 2020 by personnel of the Commission, which led to a loss of lives and destruction of properties. I was also informed of a similar incident of Mondia area of Ibadan on the 13th of April 2019 which led to a loss of one life and subsidence of serious injuries by many others. And another incident on the 6th of November 2019 along the Lagos-Ibadan Expressway 
which led to the loss of three lives, including a personnel of the commission. The House worried that personnel of the commission who are supposed to ensure safety and protection of lives and properties of road rushers now routinely engage motorists in all chases on the highways with motorcycles, thereby endangering innocent lives. The House believes that if personnel of the Commission are not dissuaded from engaging perceived errant motorists in hot chases on our highways, more lives will be lost to the Ineos and highly barbaric conduct. The House therefore resolves to hold the Corps Marshal of the Federal Safety Commission to instruct his personnel to desist from engaging perceived errant motorists in hot chases on our highways. The House also uh, resolves to mandate the Committee on Federal Road Safety Commission to investigate the recent incident of 8th of February 2020 along the Bumajo Ilorin Road and report back within four weeks for further legislative action. I hereby move, sir. We put the question. Those in favor of the motion say aye. Those against say nay. They are savvied. Respect colleagues. The alleged non recovery of more than 81 billion naira of the CBN's and co borrowers program is to be investigated after being raised by Representative Sergio Ogun. Meanwhile, the tenth order of the day is a motion on need to investigate the usage of uh, funds disbursed by the Bank of Agriculture to ANCO companies under the ANCO borrowers program, standing in the Honorable Sergio Ogun. Honorable Sergio is inviting to the motion. I'm Sergio Ose Ogun. I represent Eastern Northeast, Eastern Southeast, and I am from Edo State. Needs to investigate the usage of funds disbursed by the Bank of Agriculture to anchor companies under the Anchor Borrowers Program. It has notes that the Central Bank of Nigeria, CBN, in line with its mandate, established the Anchor Borrowers Program, which was launched by the President, President Mohammed Buhari, on 17 November 2015, with the intent to create a linkage between anchor companies involved in processing and the smallholder farmers of key agricultural commodities. The House is aware that the trust of the Anchor Borrowers Program is the provision of loans to smallholders, smallholder farmers to boost production of key agricultural commodities like cereals, rice, maize, wheat, etc., etc. Cutting roots and tubers, cassava, potatoes, yam, ginger, etc., etc. Tree crops, oil palm, cocoa, rubber, legumes, Soya bean, sesame seed, cowpea, tomato and livestock, fish, poultry, ruminants, with the aim of stabilizing input supply to agro processors and address the country's negative balance of payment on food. The House is informed that out of the 104 billion provided by the CBN for the scheme, a total of 86 billion was disbursed to the anchor companies who will serve as processors. And the sum of 81 billion is yet to be recovered from the defaulting anchor companies. The House is worried that with the non-recovery of outstanding 81 billion, other potential smallholders, smallholder farmers, who would have the beneficiaries of the scheme are being denied the opportunity to benefit from the scheme. It has its concern that the non-recovery of the said balance of the loan from the anchor companies is negatively affecting the overall objective of the anchor borrowers program being a revolving fund. It has resolves to mandate the committees on agricultural production and services and banking and currency to investigate the non-recovery of 81 billion from defaulting anchor companies under the anchor borrowers program 
and particularly the role of the Bank of Agriculture, the Central Bank of Nigeria, the Nigerian Agricultural Insurance Corporation, and other relevant bodies involved in the Anchor Borrowers Program, and report back within weeks, within four weeks, for further legislative action. Mr. Speaker, honorable colleagues, I so move. I rise, Mr. Speaker, to second the motion. This wonderful motion has simply moved by Representative Right Honorable Sergius Ose Ogo. I so second, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much, sir. Those in favor of the motion say aye. Those against say nay. That's a bit.
Nigeria, the most populous country in Africa, is situated on the Gulf of Guinea in West Africa. The country is blessed with agricultural resources. In most parts of the country, you have rich soil and good weather conditions that allows for the cultivation of various food crops. Plata State is one of such places. The state is the 12th largest state in Nigeria. It is geographically unique with captivating rock formations, chains of hills, beautiful waterfalls and metric tones of food. In the 1980s, food internment, production and rural income were a central pillar of the broader economic development agenda. The objectives was to create food, security, rural stability, surplus income and labor supply to drive broader industrial development. Today, agriculture has lost its pride of place in the Nigerian economy as all focus lies in the oil sector. In an effort to restore the agricultural sector, the government has initiated numerous programs to restore agricultural sector back to its glory because it is the mainstay of any economy and is fundamental to any nation's development. Plateau State is known for both agricultural and manufacturing activities. Agricultural products are produced in large scale. The soil and climatic conditions of the Joss Plateau favors the production of an exotic hidden treasures of fruit called African Black Oli. African black olive is also called canarium fruits. Because of the similarities in their fruit and leaves, canarium fruits may be confused with olive. Canarium fruit is a, it's a tropical fruit gotten from the canarium tree, which is commonly known as atile. This is the fruit of canarium. This is commonly known as atile here in the northern part of this country. And it's known as African elemi, that's the common name, English common name. It's a big tree that grows up to about 40 to 50 meters high. And um, it's African, it's in the tropical African country. And it's originated from Africa because the name African elemi, that's some kind of sign that, I mean, commonly since it is found in Africa, I suggest probably it's originated from Africa. In Nigeria, Pangshin local government area of Plata State is the largest producer of canarium fruits. Most of the time you find them around the mountains, around the hills. They grow very comfortable around the hills and all kind of things. Studies I've told you is very limited about it, but Pangshin has about the highest number of trees on ground. If you go towards Pangshin, you see quite a lot of things, a lot of traditional attachment to it. The canarium fruit is bluish purple, three to four centimeter long and one to two centimeter thick. It is a delicious fruit consumed in Plata State. The skin is smooth, thin, shiny and turns purplish black when the fruit ripens. The canarium fruit grows on a tree called elemi. The trees and their edible nuts have a large number of common names such as Atli in Hausa, Pet and Ngas. The Italy is being propagated by the seedlings. Normally, if the node is left within the refinery, only on the germinates. And once they germinate, you can pick it and replant it. In propagation, you can do it through seedling, through what we call wildlings, or through direct planting of the seed. But before you can plant the seed, then you must have tamper or manipulate the coat. And that can be achieved by just dipping it in hot water. 
if you dip the seedling in the hot water, that will have broken the toughness of the outside coat, and that will allow the sprouting of the seed on time, as different from when the local person is planting. Because you take time for it to decay, to rot, before the seedling can be coming out. But we can get the germination faster by manipulating the tough outside coat of the seed of the seed of the fruit. The African element tree grows very slowly and over many years. It's a big tree, I've told you, 40 to 50 meters. It can grow to that level. So it's very big and the canopy can cover a radius of about 20 meters. It's a tropical tree plant and um, it's of multi-purpose. Uh, apart from the uh, the fruit that uh, we call a atili, that has its own characteristic uses again, the tree itself, if it's propagated and established uh, as research has found it, can grow to cylindrically as, as tall as 50 meters. In Pangshin local government area, the African element tree is traditionally burned for fumigating dwellings and used for firewood. This is an Italy tree that has stayed over 200 years. At least, I think, the generation of our forefathers. There are at times you discover that Italy, maybe once they are wounded, you discover gum are oozing out of the trees or the roots. As you can see from the from all over, these are injured points where the gums are oozing out. As you can see, this is one of the gums. And the gum is very, very useful. Useful in the chasing away of any wild beast, like snakes and other spirits. Unfortunately, they are not mostly domesticated. What I mean, they are not domesticated. Not quite a lot of work has been done on them. We still leave them to grow on their own without very good care because most of the trees are found outside there in the wild. Not too many people have taken time to understudy these things scientifically, to know the agronomic practices that will give it. We have different varieties of it quite already. You find that, I mean, some of them, the, the, the flesh is bigger and then the seeds are small, smaller. Some of them will have big, uh, big seeds, small flesh, all those things. Some mature early, some mature late, some are uh, uh, medium maturity. But we have not documented the study of this thing agronomically at all. Uh, well, it's unfortunate that this tree has been infected by a parasite known as Mr. Two. We discovered that they are competing favorably with the plant for nutrients. And by virtue of this uh, parasite, you discover that it has now overshadowed the whole plant. And uh, the plant is now losing control of the nutrient, and that's why it's about dying. Normally, this Parasite is being transmitted by birds. Once they take the seed, you discover that they transmit it from one plant to the other. And this paras the seed can, can germinate favorably on a plant and thereby driving nutrients from the, the host plant. That is why, in most cases, you either trim the mist or cut them away for the new generation of the plant to grow up again. Otherwise, the plant dies off. I think that's the problem we are having within the community uh, settlement, that most of the Italy tree have been lost by this Mr. Two. Because of the commercial importance of the fruit and the relatively big size of the tree, the wood is used in making kitchen utensils, carved wooden bowls, fine furniture and decorative items. Coming in 
Green to Plata State from neighboring states brings one face to face with these small black fruits. We have been selling this utterly for about nearly 30 years now. We have been doing the business. When we get the money, we normally do a dashi and we buy some materials with it to, ex to export it outside for people to come and buy so that we gain another interest. When we get the interest, we'll buy more because we are not selling it in this town alone. It normally goes to different states, Lagos, Aba, Abuja, Onicha. Now, this small bag, they normally give us at the rate of 1,300. This one for basin, they normally give us at the rate of 1,8. Then this of the bag, 1,9 or 2,000. And then this one, we normally get it at the rate of 1,7. I love it. Like if I'm traveling sometime, it is my. It used to be my snack. I just take it and uh, I'll be taking it along the way as I as I move. In Pangshin local government area of Plateau State, where this fruit is found, elders are invited before the harvest of the fruits. They will sit, and the youth will pick them to be shared among the whole family. Yeah. The skin and flesh of these fruits are edible after soaking in warm water. Just put carinium oil in your mouth like this. Hold it like this. It will just cook. It will just warm. It's, if it's warm, it will cook. Because all that it needs is just some heat. You put it like this, move around for some time, it will just cook itself and then you swallow. Yes, but normally you just, the general practice is warm some water, warm some water, put it inside for about some two, three, four minutes. It will just cook. The fruits contain all protein, fat and carbohydrate, thereby making it an ideal food. Olive fruit contains, um, is very vitamin rich and it contains vitamins like vitamin A, vitamin, vitamin E, vitamin K and uh, these vitamins are actually antioxidants and uh, what antioxidants do actually they mop up free radicals. Free radicals are products of the body's work, body's metabolism and these free radicals are damaging to the cells. Apart from that, uh, of course, the olive also contains anti-inflammatory agents. It also contains uh, uh, very good fatty, as, uh, 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 fatty acids. The unsaturated fatty acid range called um, uh, the, the, yeah, the unsaturated fatty acid range. These are actually better for consumption than the saturated range, uh, in, you know, which you have, you know, and particularly from plant sources. You have this unsaturated fatty, and we recommend that uh, they're taken because of the, the risk of cardiovascular events that is reduced. The most important product from African black olive is the canel. When raw, it resembles the flavor of roasted pumpkin seed, and when boiled, it's mild, naughty flavor and tender, crispy texture. Its canel separates easily from the hard shell without drying. It is used for baking cakes. in baking the cake because the canarium fruit serves as a very good uh, nutrient in the body. The canarium fruit helps most especially the oil of the canarium fruit. It's been extracted from 
the Canarian fruit itself, then you get the oil from the Canarian fruit. And now you are using it as part of your uh, cake or your mixture as a butter. Then the fruit itself, the Canarian fruit itself, it serves as fruit in a cake. And that's why you are seeing some dots of black in the cake. The Canarian fruit serves as another fruit, aroma, flavor in your cake. And when you eat it, you perceive the aroma of the Canarian fruit because that is what it is made for. It has its own flavor. African black olive fruits are also used to produce oil. When you go and bring it from the, from the tree, you invite the people to come and help you. When they gather it for you, then you take it to the refinery place where you can produce the oil. Then you bring a pot, put it on the fire, bring the water and put it, then we bring the Italy and put it inside the hot water. Then bring a pot, store it there for at least two to three or four days. Then you mix with mix the water, then we leave it there, it will stay for one day. Then the next day, then you come and open it. Then you will see the then you will see the oil. We cook it should in case if there is any diseases, then that fire will kill the disease. Then we come to the final state that it will be ready for use. The sediments are normally used for seasoning in making uh, the dawa. Uh, it's normally known as karkum. It's used for cooking soup. I think one of the best traditions that you, you prepare your soup with. This water is a leftover of the refinery. It is uh, a fermented water that is used in the production of the oil. It is drinkable because it contains nutrients and it helps in the building of, of the body. Let me take it and you see. It's mild already because it's fermented. It's mild and uh, it's nutritious. The oil is used by the Ngas people of Plateau State to perform marriage rites. Canarian fruits and oil are used as marriage rites because it is pure. Traditionally, the aim is to show the bride that she has been accepted into the family of the groom. The oil has a citrus smell, a bit spicy, and is pale in color. The canarium oil is seen as magic oil, which is a therapy for the soul. The oil can be kept perfectly for as long as six months. It can be extracted and used for cooking varieties of food. One thing I know for sure, it makes the food taste better than when you don't use it on the food. In fact, if it's even jollof rice, sometimes I eat my yams with it. Sometimes I eat jollof rice, I sometimes I dress my meat with it. We dress meat with it, we dress our salad with it. Just try it and you find out, I mean, it tastes better with, it tastes better with Italy. This is the already refined, finished product of Italy. It is used for various purposes, either in terms of snake bites, poisons. Once you take it, it neutralizes the poison. The olive oil is the oil extracted from the olive fruit, just like we've uh, talked about. Those um, uh, components or constituents we talked about in the fruit uh, are available in the oil also. So you have the, free fast, uh, the unsaturated fatty acids that are good for the heart and uh, are preventive, are protective 
against cardiovascular diseases like coronary, uh, you know, coronary artery disease. And you also have antioxidants, we mentioned that already, and you have anti-inflammatory um, extracts that are there in the olive oil that actually uh, maintain the integrity of the, of, of the body so that you know, inflammation, inflammation actually damages you know, that's, uh, the integrity of the cells. And so these anti-inflammatories actually reduce the effect or the impact of inflammation around the body. So we, we, we recommend the, the olive oil as healthy eating oil. Uh, and it can substitute for any of the other forms of vegetable or animal oil and fats that we use uh, because of the health benefits that it has. The oil gives a feeling of peace and tranquility. It can be used as blended massage oil or diluted in the bath to assist with nervous and respiratory conditions. We are living in a polluted world now where everything seems to be polluting the world. And so if you have artillery, it's, it comes very handy. If you use it on massage or you eat it, it helps to take away some of these pollutants from your, from your skin, from your system. So I would advise and recommend highly that you at least every day take half a teaspoon or a teaspoon of artillery oil. It will help you know, to remove all the free radicals from your system. The utility of African black olive is amazing as most parts of it are useful. The strong shells are excellent as fuel. The seeds are roasted and eaten as nodes. It is also used for local draft games. We use this seed because we came out and see or saw our forefather playing this local draft like this. Because we use this we while our time here, we play, we joke. The African black olive is one of the most extensively cultivated fruit crops in the world. The 10 largest producing countries, according to the Food and Agricultural Organization, are located in the African region and produced 45% of the world's production of African black olive. It can be served as a good source of income. We intend to raise some seedlings. Raise seedlings because I've told you already that nobody is older than this canarium fruit in Pashin local government. We met these uh, trees here as a people. And I believe probably we will leave these trees here. But we'll do that to make sure that uh, we raise new one that can now give us for the importance of the economic importance of this tree. Market is to work by and in turn, definitely we will get something out of it. Canadian fruit with its tree called African Elemi has great potentials to develop into a major industry in Plata State. There are bright prospects for the future development of this fruit in Plata State. The consultant who is helping us in trying to bring out Plato into the international market. We were there in Anaheim with him in the USA, and um, we actually have assigned some certifiers, like I've told you, international ones, that will certify that this is it, upgrade it for us, give us, let it go into the international, the FAO, the Food World Organization must go there. The, who would have to agree with their, 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 their session of these things. However, the immediate concern in the production of African element tree and canarium fruits is the difficulty of propagation. Therefore, the hidden treasures of the fruits need to be discovered.
Original Africa's Heritage. Coronavirus specifically targets the respiratory system. Here are some characteristics of the COVID-19 virus, which you should be aware of. One, it's actually when you sneeze or you cough or you even spit, uh, and you have the virus, and you're infected with the virus, it goes about 14 feet, much further than what had been previously estimated. Uh, it remains in the air for about 30 minutes after one has sneezed or coughed. So this is really bad news, and it can last on surfaces for up to three days. Someone who has a virus and he spits or he puts his fingers on a, on, a, on, a, on a surface, it can last for about three days. And there is no vaccine or cure at this point. So whatever treatment they will give you is to, uh, it's going to be mostly symptomatic support, give you a lot of oxygen through a ventilator, give you a lot of fluids, uh, and deal with any uh, bacterial infections. The virus has receptors that it has an affinity for in the trachea, the upper respiratory tract, the higher aspects of the lungs, and the lungs, the alveolar themselves. So you need to obviously cover your face as much as possible, but of course you can't wear a mask everywhere you go, but you need to take in things that will help to protect your upper respiratory territory tract. So the things we've mentioned before, like the uh, nano silver. Also very, very important is vitamin A because vitamin A is one of the vitamins that help and that act to help and protect. It stimulates the immune cells in the lining of the, of the respiratory tract that's uh, activated and can attack the virus when the virus comes. So, or if the virus comes. So take a lot of cod liver oil. Cod liver oil contains vitamin A and vitamin D. Um, and it can go a long way, but you, of course you need a, need a really good product, a really good brand. But cod liver oil is a good place to start. And of course, vitamin C, vitamin D, zinc are also very, very important. And as much as possible, please come cover your nose and your mouth when in public. God bless. You can follow us on all our social media platforms, Facebook at NTA Network News, Instagram at NTA Network, Twitter at NTA News Now, YouTube at NTA News Online, or visit www.nta.ng. For live streaming, visit www.nta.ng. Now, you can stay updated on the go, be it on your TV, iPhone, laptop, or iPad, or download the NTA mobile application from your Play Store or App Store. NTA, you can beat the rich. NTA I has gone mobile. Catch your favorite programs anywhere in the world by going to Play Store on Android and App Store on iOS. Search for Vision TV UK, download and install, then you're good to go.
COVID-19, the global pandemic, is here with us, ravaging communities and nations, even those with the most advanced health care. The speed of infection is increasing. In just a few short months, the global economy has been left reeling, supply chains disrupted, millions of jobs lost, and oil prices plummeting as billions are placed under lockdown. Nigeria has 200 million people cramped together and at risk. How can devastation be averted in the continent's most populous country? The federal government, in its bid to contain the virus and avoid the spread, gave the stay-at-home directive, the observance of social distancing and banning of social gatherings. What has been the level of compliance so far nationwide? That is our focus today on Dateline 360. We thank you for joining us. I am Lydia Odije Ochi. You're welcome. The interventions announced by the federal and state governments to curb the spread of the coronavirus pandemic includes the stay-at-home order and the demand for social distancing. Obehi Otobo Apresai monitored the compliance level in the Benin metropolis and its effects on the social life of the residents. This is Ogbazu. It is one of the most popular recreation centers in Benin metropolis. And during the weekends, families gather here to unwind with their loved ones but with the coronavirus pandemic especially with confirmed cases in Edo state and neighboring states the place is devoid of its usual activities on ground is i can only see the animals and a few staff but i happen to come across the only visitor here at the park today uh, when you come here, usually, what is the scene like at the Ogbasu on the weekend? Yeah, it used to be busy more than this at weekends. But since this um, coronavirus of the thing came on board, I just was surprised I came here for visit with my children. But the numbers are few. I can say I'm just the only person at the zoom now so i'm scared i want to go but i really commend the federal government and the state government for their work and i commend the citizens for abiding by the law visitors influx has actually reduced because people are obeying the stay at home order uh, so business wise we'll say is a bit slow we have measures on ground you know we ensure that people do sanitize their hands before coming to the zoo and uh, even while the few ones are coming, while on their way out, we equally ensure that they do the same, repeat the same procedure. It is a similar scene at the National Museum at the King's Square. Its doors are shut to visitors till further notice. Social events, such as funerals and weddings, have become quite rare. The only one that held at the Oedo Council Marriage Registry on a Saturday had less than 20 guests in attendance. The groom says it is in compliance with the social distancing directive. It's because of the situation on ground. Everybody in the country knows that the, the country is somehow, according to a do state government order, that's why we see everywhere like this. Religious organizations have also adopted less intimate protocols of worship. Some have understandably resorted to streaming their services online. The church also, through media and other means, have been able and is still disseminating this message, the message of the federal government to her parishioners to stay at home for now. Stay at home and pray. Masses have been streamed. I've said my mass this morning. I've prayed for everybody. I've also sent it uh, via social media. A lot of persons streamed it in St. Paul's. By 12 o'clock, they streamed their masses and uh, people participate. So for now, we encourage our parishioners to stay at home. And a lot of them, a lot of them, we thank God, have really cooperated. The government, in, in their wisdom, they have said that uh, they, we should, we should uh, try not to uh, engage in any gathering. So we are, that's why we are complying, because uh, engaging in any gathering, we, we bring, bring a, a situation where many people will, be, will not be affected. However, 
traffic and human movement are still considerable. Government say more go to that for us. I just have Peking. One city of Razmi no get for us. I no get one other. I must come out, find what you don't go eat. It will affect the social life of our people because this is the first time we are seeing this kind of a global um, pandemic. And for us, it calls for a total reflection on how we have been doing and what we intend to do now. This might be an indication that some people are yet to clearly understand the full gravity of the coronavirus threat and the need to comply with the various directives adopted to check the spread of the scourge. Thanks, Obehi, for that update from Benin. The coronavirus, also known as COVID-19, has been declared by the World Health Organization as a global pandemic. While clinical trials are ongoing for a vaccine and a possible cure, there is no known treatment for the coronavirus. Nigeria has recorded some of these cases and people are advised to take these preventive measures to keep themselves safe and contain the further spread of the virus. Wash your hands frequently with soap and water or use hand sanitizers all the time. Maintain social distancing. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Practice respiratory hygiene. If you have fever, cough, and difficulty breathing, seek medical care early. Do not panic. Stop the spread of unconfirmed news. Follow the official government news outlets and report all cases immediately. This message is brought to you by the Nigerian Television Authority, NTA, Africa's largest television network. As coronavirus pandemic keeps rising in Nigeria, in addition to the non-compliance with the stay-at-home and the social distancing directive, the Kaduna State Government imposed a dusk-to-dawn curfew on the entire state to prevent the spread of the disease. Ahmad Umar Kudan monitored the situation in the state for Dateline 360. The state government says it is not leaving anything to chance as it adopts stringent measures to prevent the disease from taking any route and spread in the state. Part of it was the initial ban on large gatherings, religious services, and business activities in the market, except those selling food items and drugs. The United States government has decided to move from advice to actual enforcement of its restrictions on large gatherings, especially in churches and mosques. It's a good measure. You know, just to contain the coronavirus, at least we have to collaborate with the government. We have to, we have to cooperate with the government, and we have to cooperate with ourselves. Because if it happens, uh, it's the people that will suffer it. As a step further, the state government bans the activities of tricycle operators, while commercial bus operators were directed to observe social distancing. The government has taken uh, uh, good measures. I just put only two passengers in the back seat, the center seat, two passengers, then in front, only one. At least by taking such measures, maybe the issue of that virus will go away. It's for our own good because of the uh, coronavirus that is in the uh, town. So as government decided that they should carry two to, to give each person gap, huh? Because they told us that if you cough, you can contact it. If you throw saliva, you can contact it. So the uh, way government brought the issue is very good. Schools, including tertiary institutions across the state, were shut down, while recreational and sporting centers also came under lock and key. The students have left, and then we have also issued bulletin for officers on grade level 12 and below to stay at home. Only management staff that are available. You can see that the campus is uh, empty. We have sent out bulletins, uh, giving ad advices to our staff on how they can best uh, maintain social distancing, uh, personal and environmental hygiene, and uh, to desist while they are at home, they should not be roaming around. All sporting activities globally has been halted. Amadebele Stadium, not, uh, not exception. In fact, we have ensured our security department. We issued them an order 
for anybody coming into the stadium to go back to his house as directed by the ministry. As a result of non-compliance by residents, the state government imposed a 24-hour curfew throughout the state, all in a bid to prevent the spread of the virus. The sad fact is that there is no consistent and significant adherence to the ban on large gatherings and the closure of shops and markets. There were also reports of certain persons not obeying the ban announced on motorcycles and the Kekenape tricycles. Amidst this unfortunate indication that many people are yet to absorb the enormity of the danger that COVID-19 poses to lives, the government pays tribute to all the residents of our state who have complied with public health advice and stayed home. Markets are deserted. Motor parks closed while major streets are without the usual vehicular movement. Security agents in strategic locations to ensure compliance. With the announcement on the docks to dawn curfew, our officers and them are also out there in collaboration with other security agencies to ensure that there is maximum compliance with the directive of the state government. The real estate government says all of the measures taken are not meant to add hardship but to prevent the spread of the virus as prevention is better than cure. Ahmad, the curfew is definitely a step in the right direction. Residents of Mina, the Niger state capital, have commended recent measures put in place by government to control the spread of COVID-19 in the state. They are, however, appealing for relaxation of some restrictions to allow them to have access to some basic supplies for survival. Dauda Mohammed filed in this report. Mina, the Niger state capital has since the commencement of the stay at home directive issued by government been deserted during the day. The trend, however, is that since the stay at home order starts from 10 o'clock in the morning to 8 at night, most residents of the town rush out in the morning before commencement of the directive to make last minute purchases. While a cross section of residents of Mina, Niger State Capital, say they are fully in support of the restriction order put in place by the state government to check the spread of COVID 19, there are some issues that need to be addressed. For example, the rush for petrol. Due to the time of the restriction order that is supposed to start by 10 o'clock, most motorists have besieged most filling stations around the town to get petrol. The major markets in the town, the Abdelkadi Kure Ultra Modern Market, Obasanya Shopping Complex, and all other business premises have remained under lock, with the exception of banks, where the automated teller machines have remained accessible. Now, let's imagine this closure of uh, almost all businesses and all kinds of things continue for, for a whole month. How can we survive? Now there's a need for me to travel today, and that's why I'm back on a journey today. Okay, sir. People should comply with the government. The government direction is very important. This is, is real, and it can kill many people. People should stay at home and comply with the government directives. And if people should, they can use this at two hours, and come out and buy whatever they want. And maybe if they open in the night, they can also utilize that two hours. After that, we should, you should keep calm and stay at home. Mm, all my prayers, go just take this disease away from us. They are trying in order to curtail this uh, dreaded uh, vice that is uh, killing the whole world. But I want to let them know that there are certain things that are very, very needed, like fuel, like uh, food items. Myself, I trade on food items. People are short of food items and shops whereby people can buy provision, something of that nature, and drug. They should try to liberate it so that people can get what they need. At the Federal Secretariat, only organizations on the essential services list were at their offices, though no indication that senior civil servants were at their duty post. With most residents adhering to the stay-at-home order, a handful of others were seen flouting the order, prompting a response by officers of the Nigerian police force. Use the enforcement they should use because without using enforcement, it, it, 
people, they, they, they didn't follow the enforcement. They, in fact, they could be so bad, sir. They, they, they government use the enforcement. Force people to stay in the, in, in the house. That's a very good idea, sir. I think it's um, people are really taking it because you can see the road now. There is nobody really moving like that. It's just maybe from house to house, very close to you. <laughs> so I think yeah, people really took the thing serious because they are where the thing is um, um, is real. I want the government to consider, most especially, big restaurants in the state. Let the restaurants operate. But to allow all the individual going to the restaurant to buy a food, but in takeaway, uh, that is my observation. But I'm still calling on the Nagerlite to obey the rules so that we can stay healthy. While solar commuters could be seen waiting for vehicles at some strategic spots, some residents were also observed moving about while they advanced reasons for their action. Worship centers around the city all complied with the order stopping mass gathering of people. With all recreational centers and hangouts closed, children on some streets devised means for fun by engaging in a game of street football to pass the time. Dauda, the restrictions are in place for the greater good of all. Despite government directives to stay at home in its efforts to curb further spread of COVID-19 in the country, there is also a partial compliance in Adamawa State. Simon Asha, who monitored the situation in places of worship, recreational centers, and night hangouts, among other places, reports that the people go about their normal activities, but devoid of the usual hustle and bustle associated with such places. As COVID-19 pushes the world into lockdown, global struggle to curtail the virus has been put in place by countries of the world to contain its prey in a bit to safeguard the lives of the citizenry. Nigeria is not left out in this regard, as various states of the Federation intensified measures to combat the virus. For instance, in Adamawa State, the government banned any garden of people more than 50 with regular washing of hands, use of sanitizers, among others, are some of the measures put in place by government to combat the spread of the disease. The government also advised us to be very careful in you know interacting with people, not to be too congested in, in, in an activity. There's also this uh, uh, social distance uh, order as well. Due to the government too, they also gave a standing order by telling all civil servants from levels 1 to 12 to stay at home. In compliance with this directive, Modibo Adama Central Mox, Yola South, and St. Teresa's Catholic Cathedral, Yola not local government areas of Adama State, were all locked down with little or no compliance in some of the worship centers across the state capital. I am happy that our people, especially the congregation of St. Teresa's Cathedral, um, they are very understanding because it's all, it was not easy at the first instance to tell people not to come to church. Not coming to church during the weekdays was okay. But on Sunday, it's something that was never done before. So they had a lot of issues uh, coming up for that. But we insisted that people should stay at home and pray at home. And they have complied and we are happy with that. The government said that a garden should not be more than 50. And where I'm coming from, we are not more than, we are not up to 40. So that is why our service helped. All glory to God as a child of God. No, no disease, like no evil thing can come near me because I am under his shield, like I'm under God's shield. Uh, government did not tell us to stay at home. But what they said that we should not gather less than 50. So that's why in my church today, we are not up to that 50. And we have um, two services today. Bear Palos and recreational centers witnessed low turnout of customers. Whereas in Anama State Secretariat, civil servants were seen going about their normal office activities. I'm glad those instructions have been given. I'm happy also the people are getting to comply with it. Not fully yet, but I'm sure we'll get to that point when people know they should comply fully and stay at home. Observe the stay at home by the government. Even though no case of coronavirus recorded in Anama State, adhering to government directives is key. 
The coronavirus, also known as COVID-19, is spreading at an alarming rate all over the globe, including Nigeria. With the number of infected persons in Nigeria increasing daily, prevention is better than cure. Coronavirus has no cure. The virus spreads from one person who affects two persons and by the time the affected person is isolated, the two persons have affected four and it keeps spreading. You must take preventive measures to save yourself and that of the people around you. Always wash your hands with soap and water. Put distance between yourself and others. Whenever you cough or sneeze, cover your mouth. Clean and disinfect surfaces. Stay at home if you're sick and contact the proper authorities. Together, we can cut down the spread of the coronavirus. This message is brought to you by the Nigerian Television Authority, NTA, Africa's largest TV network. Following a successful response to Ebola more than five years ago, Experts say Nigeria is prepared to contain the virus. According to health experts, the most effective measure to contain the spread of coronavirus is for everyone to stay put at home. With millions asked to stay at home, concerns have been raised about fiscal stimulus to cushion the effects on the informal sector, which constitutes a bulk of the country's population. However, Experts say it is a time for every Nigerian to be and stay committed in this fight to stop COVID-19 before it overwhelms us. A quote trending on social media, which makes sense, says, The virus does not move. People move it. We stop moving. The virus stops moving. The virus dies. It's that simple. That's our package today on Dateline 360. Let's stay at home and stop coronavirus. And that's our package this week. We thank you for joining us. I am Lydia ODJ Ochi. See you next week. Goodbye. When it comes to the immune system, one of the things that you have to pay attention to, and I've talked about this over and over again in the laws of life, is that you need adequate sleep. You can't be shirking on your sleep. You can't be messing up where that is concerned. You need to have seven to eight hours of sleep in a dark environment with very little noise or activity. Uh, your, the night time and that sleep time is when your body is repairing. Your body is repairing its brain, your body is repairing the organs, but most importantly, your immune system is recovering from all the activities of the day. So you've got to have enough sleep so your immune system can recover. And remember, your immune system is the one thing that is standing between you and coronavirus. All the reports say point to a compromised immune system as a reason why you not only do you, are you more susceptible to the virus, I'm not saying that if you have a strong immune system, you won't be susceptible to it, uh, but you'll be less susceptible to it if you have a strong immune system. And even if you do have the infection, you're going to have a much quicker recovery time and a more complete recovery if your immune system has been strong and you keep the immune system strong. So it's very, very important 
that you sleep well so you can recover well and so you can continue to live a long, healthy, lasting life. COVID-19, the coronavirus, traveling is, can actually expose you to a lot more risk, whether it's traveling by road, traveling by air, traveling by sea. One of the reasons for that is that you're always going to be in close contact with other people and the risk of meeting somebody that has the virus is much, much, much higher. Now, in a plane, especially if you're traveling overseas, 15-hour flight, oof, you have in the air that is circulating. So if someone has the virus on the plane, uh, there's a greater chance that you'll be exposed so some of the tips that people talk about is trying to get a window seat, that there's less exposure to it than if you're in the aisle seat. Uh, of course, you can't control that. But what I would do, what I will continue to do, days before I, st I travel, I'm traveling very soon, days before I travel and on the plane, I'm going to be taking a lot of vitamin C. You need at least, I, I'm going to just tell you what I do. And this is, uh, research bears this to be true. You need at least five to six grams of vitamin C a day. So I just take a whole big teaspoonful, put it in a bottle of water, and I drink it throughout the day. You don't, you don't want to take it all at once. Now, vitamin D, you can take that all at, all at once. So normally you should be taking about, I, sh I take about 10,000 international units a day. People say that's a lot, but the research says that 10,000 is good. Some people take as much as 150,000 and beyond. Um, so it's uh, to each man or each, each, each his own, but that's what I do. Vitamin D, vitamin C. I also talked about nano silver. This is, has a lot of research behind it. This is not colloidal silver. It's an activated nanoparticle of silver that comes in liquid. It's, it's extremely safe. There has no toxicity whatsoever. I'm not saying, saying you should do, this is a treatment, but I take it for myself so that I can boost my immune system. If you can't afford these, you can get a lot of garlic. You can take a lot of ginger. You can take a lot of cucumber. Just take those fruits and vegetables that will strengthen your immune system. I want to avoid fried foods, especially fried foods, processed foods, um, and all the other foods with all the extra sugars in them. So you want to, because sugar really depresses your immune system. So the less sugar you take, the less, the fewer fried foods you take, the more of the raw vegetables that you take, especially the ones we've mentioned, the stronger your immune system will be. So please pay attention to that. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You can watch ATA International live on your TV, computer, iPad, tablet and phone. Log on to visiontv.co.uk and click on entertainment, then NTAI. You can also download the iOS or Android app on your mobile devices to watch NTA International on the go, anywhere in the world. NTA International, your window to the world. Welcome to the news on NT International. At this hour, I am Habiba Oladipo. Latest report from the Nigerian Center for Disease Control, NCDC, says Nigeria has recorded 23 new cases of COVID-19, bringing the total number of confirmed cases to 174. Nine new cases were recorded in Lagos State, seven in the Federal Capital Territory, five in Akwa Ibom, one in Bauchi and one in Casino States. Nine patients have been discharged after testing negative upon receiving extensive care at the isolation centers while two deaths have been recorded. Meanwhile, the Euro European Union has commenced the airlifting of German and French nationals residing in Nigeria for the international wing of the Mutala Mohammed Airport, Lagos. In the meantime, the defense headquarters has enjoined Nigerians to disregard a misleading video clip circulating in the social media. A statement by the coordinator of defense media operations, Major General John Enenche, indicates that the trending video clips are past incidents of 2012 and 2013, stressing that they are not related to the present military engagement towards the COVID-19 lockdown. The statement notes that the circulated clips are part of attempts by mischievous elements and perpetrators of fake news news to tarnish the professional integrity of the armed forces. And away from our shores, New York rushed to bring in an army of medical volunteers as the statewide death toll from coronavirus doubled. 
in 72 hours to more than 1,900, while the global number of people diagnosed with the illness edged closer to 1 million on Thursday, as hot spots fled around the U.S. in places like New Orleans and Southern California. The nation's biggest city was the hardest hit of them all, with bodies loaded onto refrigerated mug trucks by gurneys and forklifts outside overwhelmed hospital. There are 884 deaths in the U.S. in 24 hours, a new record according to the John Hopkins University, which has tracked virus figures globally. The latest victim include a six-week-old baby with more than 216,000 and now infected. The world highest figures. Meanwhile, the latest figures put total confirmed coronavirus cases in Africa at 6,473, the World Health Organization says. And those are the stories trending at this hour. Many thanks for being a part of it. Coming up next on the network service of the NTA is our current affairs program, The Platform. Please stay tuned. Welcome to this edition of Platform. I am Muhammad Kudu Abubakar. The federal government has continued to relax the total lockdown it imposed on the Federal Capital Territory, FCT, Lagos, and Ogun states to contain the coronavirus pandemic. Food markets now open from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. every day. And the supermarkets and pharmacies now open from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. every day, but with a proviso that they maintain a high level of hygiene. The new guidelines also ban bus services during the lockdown. It is now illegal to allow a mass gathering of more than 20 people. All these are against the rise of COVID-19 cases to 174 across Nigeria as at Wednesday, April 1st, 2020. This edition of Platform examines the federal government's strategies of containing the coronavirus and challenges. Our guest is the Minister of State for Health, Senator Olunbe Mamora, a former Speaker, Lagos State House of Assembly, and two-term Senator who represented Lagos East Territorial District, 2007 to 2015, and a medical doctor by training. Senator Olunbe Mamora, Minister of State for Health, welcome to Platform. Thank you very much for inviting me. And thank you for accepting to be here, Honorable Minister. As usual, uh, on the panelists section, we have Rabi Abdullah, NTS Head of Health Desk. It's a pleasure to be here. And of course, we have our regular panelist, Ruth Aguele. Thank you very of much. Of the NTA's Current Affairs Unit. Honorable Minister of State for Health, Senator Olorun Mbe Mamora, welcome once again to Platform. Thank you. Uh, let us begin this conversation by taking uh, Nigerians back to this immediate past, if we like, or let's put it, since the manifestation of the coronavirus itself, how has the federal government, uh, what strategies did it adopt uh, so far, and how did it begin the containment? Right. Thank you very much. Um, you will recall that um, when this thing broke in um, China, Wuhan, we started preparing here because the way the virus was spreading then naturally gave the entire world, so to speak, cause for concern. Um, so we in Nigeria, we started preparing. And what was that preparation? The 
emergency operation centers were activated, as well as the National Emergency Operation Center, which is the coordinating body at the national level, and of course, under the Ministry of Health, but as managed and directed by the uh, Nigeria Center for Disease Control. And um, when the situation in China was escalating, and of course, getting out of the country, then what we activated, it became inevitable for us to escalate it. That is, be on the lookout. You recall that we started by monitoring the, particularly the flights coming in into Nigeria. Mm -hmm. Believing very strongly that uh, if we were to have our first case, that is in this case, most likely it will be through airport, that is air point of entry, if you like, as opposed to land, border, or the sea. Um, point of entry. So, what did we do? We alerted the port health officials to put in place thermal scanners so that um, passengers coming in can be scanned in terms of their body temperature, which is one of the first things that uh, will come up when you are infected that is high body temperature to the level of fever that is about 38 degrees centigrade the fever is simply elevation of body temperature above the limit of normal and of course when that happens it does not say that yes you have a coronavirus disease you recall that it was along the line that WHO sat down to now designate it as COVID-19. Hitherto, it was just known as coronavirus disease. Now, in addition to that, the port health officials were to also do what we call visual observation. That because even not being a medical person or health official, if you see somebody that, is, that looks ill, you may be able to say, oh, this person is not looking well. So that is visual observation. In addition to checking, the temperature. And of course, we, if the temperature is high or the person looks ill, there's a holding room where that person will uh, be further interrogated to know the travel history, to know whether that person is on medications, to know whether there are other symptoms that are not you know, readily obvious as at that point in time. Okay, Honorable Minister, um, we had done all of that just to checkmate uh, the importation of uh, COVID-19 into the country. Um, we started from where all our efforts were geared towards more of that prevention. But a lot of things had happened. We're you know, at a stage now where we have to deal with still prevention. We have to deal, you know, step up our responses. And we have, we're dealing with containing containing and just containing it and you know putting a halt we have, we've been reporting cases and as the days go by we just keep you know reporting cases where did we get it wrong is it about the attitude of nigerians themselves or a lacuna that gave rise to where we are today well i really, i may not say that uh, we got it wrong but that is not to um, that is not to say you don't have a point in terms of attitude, attitude of our people. You recall that uh, as part of the containment is this social distancing, and the whole essence of social distancing is to limit contact. Mm. Because we know that if there is no contact, the chances of getting the infection are limited. Mm. So that is why the issue of social distancing becomes very, very critical. Aside the other basic measures like personal hygiene, and particularly as it has to do with 
hand washing with soap and water on the running water and of course the use of um, alcohol-based sanitizer. That's also important. Of course, the respiratory hygiene where we ask people to cover up when you sneeze, when you cough, and if you do not have handkerchief or towel, uh, paper towel, you cough into the bent elbow. Now, you discover that not everybody is observing all this. Not to not talk about, and don't forget our, our culture is such that we, we, we tend to want to bond We're as much as possible, person. exactly. So, people, people are still trying to have parties and all that until we, we, we are now seeing the devastating effect of this. Is because the, the, the countries, don't forget, we also need to take advantage of the experience of other countries that experience these things before us. So, we need to take all this on board and ensure that we do what is right and we follow the directives. We said people should not travel, particularly to the high burden countries. Some of our people still travel and some people still you know, came, in. came in from some of so the these are some of the that's why I told uh, you know Rabbi earlier on that yeah, some kind of attitude again. That is we must learn to listen okay, but to directives, to advisories and uh, you know, they like. But following what she said, from the start, we're just dealing with an index case. And yes. I know that there are processes before this whole spread became something we're trying to deal with now. It starts with active surveillance, yeah. then early detection, isolation, case management, then contact tracing. Would you say it was quite challenging, or it is still challenging for Nigeria, because the numbers are increasing? If at a time we're dealing with just an index case and today we're counting 100. Mm -hmm. Why, 174? There, there, there is no doubt that it's challenging. I mean, I must, I must admit, it's challenging. Um, a few days ago, the, the DG, Director General of the Center for Disease Control, did say that we had about, uh, about 6,500 contacts that we were trying to trace. And, uh, you know, the whole thing is dynamic. And the more cases you, 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 you detect, that is through uh, PCR testing, and you confirm, that means the, 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 that case has also had some contact. Mm. So that is added to what you have on ground. Mm. And of course, contact tracing is not an easy thing because you need logistics in terms of transport, in terms of personnel, in terms of everything. So, we are challenged. There is no doubt about that. And particularly, you know, in Lagos and Abuja that have the high uh, yeah. numbers. That well, we are what will you say to about. some people who are saying, as we observe the lockdown, there should be a uh, scaling up of uh, the process of testing? Well, you see, there is no doubt that, uh, as she rightly mentioned, that is detection. And you cannot, you cannot confirm that somebody is positive or negative without testing. But having said that, we must also take on board the realities that exist in our own country. I was listening to a program earlier today, and uh, from WHO, and one of the top shots they say that in all this, each country will have to be innovative, will have to be adaptive, will have to be flexible. That takes me in approach. Mm. Okay, sir. So testing is critical. But unfortunately, we are just expanding now our testing capability in terms of the PCR testing mode, which is what we adopt because it's the most reliable. There have been issues of rapid test, uh, testing kits and all that all over the place. But as a policy for now, we have not adopted the rapid testing kit uh, mode of testing because 
not very large. So how many T-shirt centers do you have now? In the we have seven right now. Where and, and, where, and where? We, are, we have um, in Lagos, the Lagos University Teaching Hospital. We have Nigeria Institute of Medical Research in Yaba. We have in uh, Oshun. Oshun. That's uh, um, the uh, African Center for uh, uh, Genomic Studies in Ede uh, in Oshun State. We have in Abuja, which is National Reference Laboratory, that's uh, the, the domicile at uh, NCDC. Please. And then we have um, Edo. we have Irua uh, Teaching Hospital in uh, Edo. Okay. And then we have um, we, we a new center just opened in uh, UCH, yeah, uh, yeah, Ibadan, yeah. and then the, the one in Abakali. Sorry, sir, that takes me to the next question. You, you, if you recall, during one of um, the Ministry of uh, uh, Daily Briefing on uh, COVID-19, I had um, asked this question then. That was when we had just five laboratories, and I, I wasn't comfortable you know, with the spread, because I noticed that for just the, no, geographically anyway, yeah. for Lagos you had two. One in Oshun, still southwest, you had uh, Edo, south south. And my question then, and you have one. No, in you Edo. have Lagos and Yaba. Yes, you have no, right. So you have two, two. Yeah, two mm -hmm. in Lagos, mm -hmm. then one in uh, Oshun, yeah. mm -hmm. one in Edo, then the fifth one in the FCT. Mm -hmm. And my, my question then, and my observation revolved around the fact that. You had five laboratories then, which I felt were not, you know, evenly you know, spread. I looked at, you know, the map. None, because if you, for people in the northeast, means they have to f probably fall back on you know, the one in the FCT. You have the Ostwest Colonel with the population. Mm. I'm still saying that we've expanded now. We've added one uh, in uh, that's Ibadan. Mm. That, uh, that's Oyo, mm. which is still southwest. Mm. And you have one in... Ebony, uh, Abakalike. What is the issue around here now? Because you know the the infection is spreading, the virus is spreading like wildfire. Yeah. What is the fate of the people from the northwest, mm. northeast, north central? And even, yeah, north central. No, Abuja could say to be serving north central. Mm. I'm still saying, what are the issues? Because I have said, is, don't we have uh, facilities that could readily be converted to serve this purpose? Ravi, this, uh, you see, your observation is right, but I can assure you that efforts are being made right now to look at those, you see, those institutions that have developed the capacity for testing. Some of them are already on ground. And um, you see, the, the, the PCR, what we call polymerase uh, chain reaction, the testing uh, mechanism, some of the institutions around, they have this facility on ground, but they only need to configure the machine to be able to carry out this test. And of course, we will now have to get the um, reagent. So if and when these laboratories that also are in existence are supposed to start from the scratch, because to, to really start from the scratch and build a laboratory that will have that capacity, it will cost not less than about 150 million. But so it's not, it's not even that cost. So, but so we are looking at those who already have the testing capability. That I mean, that capability that only that the machine will have to be reconfigured. So the government to, is not thinking of having a mobile testing, uh, if you like, facility. Well, not 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 now because of what is involved. Because apart from having this capability in terms of uh, the machine, and you also need the competence of the laboratory scientists. Because they are specialized, they are not the routine kind of tests in the lab. But you need uh, those who are qualified okay. and experienced. You know, when we started, so, so what we logistics now? Uh, 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 let's come back to this issue. What logistics are you, uh, is the ministry and the Center for Disease Control putting in place to make sure this issue of logistical distance that IB has pointed out yeah. is reduced to the barest minimum? If they are like. Need the need for tests and cases from the far northeast and the far northwest. Yes, I was going to say that even initially, before mm. we got to this point, mm. no, no laboratory in Nigeria had that capacity initially. The, 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 the first few cases that we had to test, the samples were taken to South Africa mm. through the help of WHO and other. But the um, 
the regions, when the regions now became available and some of the existing centers had their uh, machines reconfigured to handle, then we, be, we started testing. And of course, there are plans in place to expand that uh, facility, that is to test. Hitherto, and even in some of the centers up to now, the um, samples, they have been transported by a courier company, a specialized courier company that has the capacity to handle samples of such um, very, very uh, significant uh, you know. Sensitivity. Yes, sensitivity. But do we even have um, enough test kits? Because if you're thinking of expanding these laboratories, what about the test kits? If we're looking at the logistics involved, we don't have enough, and no country, not even the United States, has enough. <laughs> because you, you, no country has it. That's the truth. So how because will it, this how will is, it come into place if we're going to expand these laboratories? That is why what we are doing now is what you can call targeted testing. Because, you see, one of the things, you cannot, I can understand, I can understand... What do you mean by targeted? targeted okay, well, I, yeah, I'm, I'm going to explain that. Yeah. I can understand the anxiety yeah. of people. Yeah. You see a lot of people now, we, ha we, we take calls virtually every minute, I want to be tested. Yeah, I think I have been exposed to yeah, somebody. People yes. are getting paranoid. So, yes. that is it. So, there is a lot of fear all over the place. Oh, I got in contact with somebody. And there, or some, we can even understand somebody who is saying, "Oh, I've just, I, I, I got, I mean, I was in contact with this person that has tested positive." But you have people, the slightest cough now is associated with uh, yeah. COVID-19. So, and just is the anxiety. So, when we now say targeted testing, we are talking of people that fit into what we call the case definition. And what is the case definition? They have fever. They are coughing. They are having difficulty in breathing, and uh, on top of it all, one, maybe they have come in contact with somebody that has tested positive, or they are people arriving from high boarding countries. So those are the people that we will give priority to, and that's why we call it targeted testing. As opposed to people, if, if somebody comes in and says, oh, I think I have come in contact with somebody that, that has tested positive, we say, just hold on go into self-isolation, observe yourself, if you start developing symptoms that we can now say this fit in into our case definition, then we will come for you. But so that, that, that's, that, 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 is, that is that's why I said, because we, couldn't, we don't have enough capacity and testing materials to go around but from uh, what, you know, everybody. But from what you're saying, yes. it's like the population, it's bringing the burden on it from what you're saying. But are there other means, like collaboration with other countries? Because if we look at the multifaceted nature of the virus and the impact it's having on the economy presently, globally, everywhere, not just Nigeria, any collaboration with other nations? Because this is a time nations oh, should Oh, definitely. If you recall that uh, when this thing was getting escalated, you know, there was a, a meeting of uh, um, uh, ministers of Health of the ECOWAS uh, sub-region, I was the one who attended that meeting in uh, Bamako, Obama. Mali. Yeah. Thereafter, because the, the Honorable Minister of Health was somewhere there, thereafter there was another meeting organized by the AU, African you know, in Addis Ababa, which the Honorable Minister himself attended. So this collaboration is always there, because no person has all the answers, and was because this is a novel, you know, you recall the initial name was novel, novel coronavirus, because it's new. And the, the behavior of the virus, even as so much is known now, so much is still unknown about it. Then that quickly brings me to the issue of this uh, uh, a mask. Some people will argue that, look, if you're not showing any symptoms, you don't, you don't have to wear a mask. But we cannot, some, some people are still saying that this thing could be in the airborne, air, 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 air yeah. air, air, air aerosol, you know, uh, transmitted. So there are still arguments here and there. So the opinion is, uh, the concern is that look, if you feel you 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 will be you will be 
uh, protecting yourself and protecting other people like you, I mean, around you, then you, <laughs> you can go as I don't, I don't know. Now, now we're on the issue of the mask. Let me, let me observe that your mask appears different from we, the ordinary persons, own. That's number one. Number two, the Crossover State uh, Governor. Mm. Uh, Professor Ayadi is quoted to have said that uh, in Cross River, as far as he's concerned, no nose mask, no movement. Will the federal government adopt that in the areas that are now under lockdown? Well, you see, if you, if you listen to, to uh, the presidential broadcast, which, I mean, I stand here, or I am seated here, to thank Mr. President for that broadcast, which was easily one of the best in terms of the way it's structured, in terms of delivery, in terms of everything. What did Mr. President say? Mr. President said that uh, we will approach this issue through proper guidance, through professionalism, and uh, being systematic. And that's just the thing. You see, the, 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 and I did say earlier on, we also need to take on board the realities of our own situation. If you say everybody should start wearing masks, do you have enough masks? So these are some of the things that have to be taken on board. We, we won't just uh, come up with a policy which may be difficult or even impossible to carry out in our own situation. So those are some of the things that we need to take up, and that's why we talk of you know being uh, guided by so many things, so many factors. Now, now, will you say the WHO is being alarmist when it is quoted by saying the COVID nineteen cases may hit one million in the next few days? The the the, the WHO is not being alarmist. Look at the you see the the, the rise in the figures, yeah. you know, has been exponential. Yeah, it is. And that is, the, that is the thing about COVID-19, the ease of spread, the ease of spread. And uh, this, is, this is a virus that has no respect for anyone. Look at the high and mighty that have been infected and have tested positive. So that's just the, the, the WHO has a duty based on research, based on evidence to put across to the people of the world that this is what we are getting. And it's now left for us to know how best to do what we think should be done in the circumstance. Okay, that's uh, taking a look at the peculiarity of uh, Nigeria as a country. We all uh, agree here that um, COVID-19 has really situated the level of weakness of the weakness of the Nigerian health system, which had been over time, even though this uh, administration has been making efforts to, you know, reposition it. And that's why I want to ask you, as a practicing medical doctor, before you ventured into politics, I'm sure you must have, you know, observed the way things had been as a practicing medical doctor, and now that you're a politician and even a public office holder as a Minister of State for Health. What are some of those weaknesses that COVID-19 had exposed when Nigeria is concerned and what lessons are we learned? Because learning from that, because and there's how, going to be, how are you addressing that? Yeah, because there's definitely going to be a post-coronavirus era, which we hope will come soon. Amen to that. Rabbi, thank you very much. Um, yes, there is no doubt that um, most of African nations or developing countries we have challenges in terms of our health system. Generally, we have weak health systems. And one of the areas that you easily know what the health system is like regarding the strength or weakness is to look at the figures, uh, maternal mortality, infant mortality, the primary health system, primary health care system. These are some of the areas that you will easily know. You know, um, issues of um, the high population vis-a-vis -vis a 
access to health care. Out of pocket spending. Out of, yes, pocket spending, um, immunization coverage, um, nutrition. These are, these are some of the basic things, even water supply. Because a lot of times, some of the things happen in the health sector. They are not necessarily issues of the health sector. They are issues outside of the health sector. If you talk of water supply, for example, if you talk of nutrition. So these are some of the indicators that tell you, no, you are not there. So when a kind of either an epidemic or a pandemic like this now happens, mm. it now exposes the weakness in the system. Because you are not just dealing now with that issue at hand, you are also dealing with some other issues. Which, we talk of vulnerable groups and all that. So these are the situations that we, that we tend to now define what we are into. Now, we ought to have put in place, because this is not the first epidemic that we're having, even though it is a pandemic, but we've had an epidemic of Lhasa, See? we've had an epidemic of uh, Ebola. Uh, Ebola and all that. But how many states, for example, can boast of having a standard infectious disease hospital? But Honourable Minister, and even at the national level, do we have the FCT? So this is an opportunity for us to say never again. But do we wait until there is an outbreak before we look at some of these issues? Now, as a follow-up to what she asked, what about routine surveillance and medical intelligence, which is the backbone of any health sector anywhere in the world? Mm. Do we have that? You, do we wait until when there is an outbreak? No, no, that's exactly what we are saying. We, we, you see, we must have a holistic approach to this. We should not wait. But the question is, what experiences or what lessons are we drawing from this and how are we trying to rectify? And that's why I made reference to this. We had had that before. Now, all this, but it, we the weaknesses you enumerated, uh, Honorable Minister, uh, are, are profound. But at the level of the Federal Executive Council, at the level of the Governor's Forum, how is there any synergy, is there any collaboration? Uh, oh. to, to bring about real changes. Oh, definitely. We like did. like is advocated. Yes. The, in fact, that is, that is part of the presidential mandate or the terms of reference of the PTA, PTF, that is Presidential Tax Force on COVID-19. The need for us to collaborate, to engage the states through the governors and, of course, the state as well to engage the local government. So what can you say of the responses so far? Well, we have 36 states. Yes, so far, FCT. so far, so fair. Uh, some of the states, they are really pulling their weight in terms of putting in place structures to mitigate this present you know, situation. Some of the states. But I cannot really say that all the states are doing. And of course, you will expect that, uh, again, maybe the resources available to the states will also be a factor in determining what and what. But on a general basis, we are having very good uh, cooperation okay. with, the, with, the, with the states okay. in terms of, uh, you know, uh, yeah, response to, to this uh, COVID-19. Uh, okay. Honorable Minister, at the rate at which the virus is spreading, um, it's pertinent that we have um, a recovery rate uh, mechanism, you know, and I'm asking this because there have been uh, publications out there in, in terms of uh, the number of uh, ventilators we have for patients who are currently in uh, the isolation centers. Some had said 16, some said 100, some... Mm -hmm. the, minister, the minister had said, you know, some ties back, I think not less than 500 or so. Now that you are here, just to, you know, give us um, the, uh, the true picture of uh, what we have as ventilators. I know they are not uh, sufficient for now. We could still mm -hmm. ask for more. But what's the state? What do we have? How, do we have enough? In fact, At least uh, I think some media quoted uh, the minister saying we need a about 100 to 500 ventilators. Well, you see, like uh, you did say earlier on, that what lessons are we drawing and what efforts are we making to rectify the situation and, of course, uh, prepare for the future? Because there is no guarantee that we will not have, if you look at medical history, you will see all sorts of things that have happened 
from the bubonic plague to uh, Spanish flu to mass to uh, SARS. All these things have, you know, they, 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 they plagued the, 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 the you know, human race. So, and uh, this will not be the last as well. Now, so we should take advantage of the experience from a particular situation and prepare for the future. I know that uh, I cannot give you the exact figures because they, 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 we, we, are, we are beginning donations. to... Yes, we are having donations, we are having... Uh, all this, all this. But the good thing, the good thing about COVID-19 is that only about 4% of patients infected will need the intensive care unit. And that's where you need the ventilators. All right. Most people, 80, 81 percent, would ever that, that again, that is the bad news. 80, 80 to 81 percent of the patients of COVID-19 are such that one, they may be totally asymptomatic. That is no symptoms at all. Or where they have symptoms, those symptoms are mild to moderate. They can just pass for common cold. Because coronavirus belongs to the same class of the virus that causes common cold. So somebody can just complain of a bit of headache, uh, nasal stuffiness and all that, and they're feeling weak. So th that is a good thing. So only a very small percentage will even need hospital care. But it's better to prepare for the worst. Mm. That is why the issue of this uh, um, ventilators and all that, you know, really. So, so now you don't know how many we have. Is mm. that uh, from the patients we have, we have more people with um, mild symptoms. Oh, yes. So that's oh, the apparently. Nigeria situation. Oh, yes. Okay. Yes. So because how, you don't know how many ventilators we have right now. We, 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 I, we have, well, from my own, I don't know the figures you, you talked about that you had before, mm. but from my, from, from my own, uh, you know, estimate of what I have seen, we, we have... Maybe uh, over 100 to 200 uh, vendors that are available, but they are coming in. These things have been, there are donations here and there that are coming in. Because these ventilators are not something that you, that uh, the routine patient will need. Okay. No. So most in, of the fact, patients fact, available chances, that don't require... Chances are that most of the ventilators that are even in existence right now used. Have, never, have never even been used. Oh. But it's any good hospital particularly at the epical uh, level, you do, you know, both at the, well, both at the secondary and tertiary, because the, you, the, you, it's not every patient that will need a ventilator, not every patient that will need ICU, that is intensive care unit management. No. So that is, that is the good news. As a member of the Presidential Task Force on COVID-19, it will be, I think, appropriate if you can address the, the funds that are coming in from the private sector. We understand it's well over 15 billion naira now. <laughs> and, uh, there is a need to assure Nigerians on how effective mm. these funds will be utilized. Well, and what, I, what parameters have been put in place to I, ensure? I think to the best of my knowledge, mm. most of those donations, they, they, they are statements of intention. Not that we can say, to the best of my own knowledge, that this money has been deposited here or there. Because the question will be into which account. And I'm not aware of any account right now. So no money has I been... I know that there is a move to, you know, if that is even the presidential mandate, that this should be channeled to the account. It takes, a, you know, well, the process to... But, but the central to bank authorities are quoted in the media to have said that they will render account of all monies uh, pledged or, or donated or promised. So the task force has not had any contact with the CBN or what? What? The, the, the various subcommittees of the task force. And uh, this, the, the answer to this question will probably be best, you know, uh, be addressed by the chairman himself. And if some people have made their donations to the central bank for onward transmission, we, I, I know that there is supposed to be set, uh, a bit, uh, an account is supposed to be in place 
Whether that account will be domiciled in the central bank or not, I cannot, you know, tell you that at this point in time. But we, and I can't even tell you that this is the account number now until that is really handed over to us through the appropriate subcommittee of the PTA. But rest assured that this is a government that has zero tolerance for corruption. corruption. So we have a duty to ensure that every couple of the money, and some of, the, some of these donations are not necessarily in the cash. In fact, most will probably be in kind. But whatever that is donated, whether in cash or in kind, will have to be you know, the account, there has to be accountability. Okay, for, for and this. Um, since the virus is already here and something we're contending with in Nigeria, what about, um, I want you, as a medical practitioner now, I want you to, you know, advise people, especially um, people who are older. They say they're more vulnerable, especially when they have pre existing condition. Yeah. I'm talking about managing the virus. Yes. If we must record cases of um, people being discharged, just a few numbers or discharge. We want to hear, um, you know, more numbers have been discharged. What about people who are not old, the younger ones? What should they put into consideration in terms of immunity boost? Well, you see, the, the yes, we do say that from the research, from the experience of some of the other countries that have this, we established that those that tend to succumb, they're usually the elderly mm. and those with pre-existing conditions. conditions, either HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis, cardiac conditions, um, diabetes, what have you. So they, usually they have had, and even the cases that, that died here in Nigeria, they fit into those uh, categories. Yes, categories. You know, people coming with, with somebody already with mm -hmm. cancer, uh, with uh, diabetes, with uh, they, you know, they fell into those categories. But having said that, it is not an excuse for people, especially the younger ones, to now say because That's the huge. figures we are getting in the U.S. now do not necessarily suggest that. Mm -hmm. So it's like it's cut across. So no one should have this false sense of uh, that being immune, protected, mm. you know, mm. good and not good. No. So everybody, in fact, that is why this has been described as all of society response. That is, everybody has to be alert and they do the, the needful. But having said that, the basic things that we, we, we know, the simple things, hand washing, use of I mean, uh, alcohol-based sanitizer, then of course uh, keeping uh, what we call respiratory hygiene, observing that, keeping social distance and all that. But particularly in response, I mean in response, don't forget primarily, primarily the, the, the healing process comes from within, that is based on your immunity. Yes. Mm. And one of the ways that your immunity becomes strong, you know, they are also part of the basic things that will, good food, that is balanced diet, well, of course, having all the things, protein, uh, you know, the carbohydrates, uh, what have you, fruits, and all that. Then, sleep. If you need to sleep well, you need, we, 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 we say, you need to have uh, about eight hours sleep for your systems to function, you know, well. If you, are, if, you, if, you, if you have stress, if you undergo stress for too long, it has a tendency to weaken your immunity. There's no doubt about that. Mm. That has been established. Then, you, we ask you, of course, some of these, uh, even home remedies, you know, well, of course, you know citrus fruit is very rich in vitamin C, which can help the system. Well, on the other side, uh, alternative medical uh, practice or herbal practice, they have talked of uh, garlic, they have talked of... I cannot, because that's not my... <laughs> that's yeah, okay. I, said, I, just, I was just, I was just so, going there. But I'm, people have talked about these things. That the you know, to, you mean you have not tested that yourself? 
Well, don't ask me what I thought. <laughs> You know, in as much as uh, the WHO had issued guidelines regarding treatment, it had asked nations to be innovative, look inward. We know that when the when uh, COVID nineteen broke out in uh, China, they had their treatment protocol, and we know what China stands for. China. When you at, at the mention of um, complementary uh, medicine, integrative yeah. medicine practice, China mm. is just the hub for that. You know? yeah. that's and true. that's why I'm asking now. Mm. People have come up, even mm. though we have issues of um, um, what do you call it now? Regulation. Regulation. Yeah. So I'm asking mm. if, if we know what you know the you know the role this other alternative you know medicine practice you mm. know play. Why are we not uh, you know, taking them into consideration? Are we taking them? Rabin, we are. We are. are. I can tell you, okay. so many people called me and are still calling, coming forward with one remedy or the other that can help. And uh, what I do is to refer them. We have, we have, we have a the department under the Ministry of uh, uh, Health that is in charge of what we call TICA traditional uh, alternative medical uh, practice. So we have a department, complementary and alternative. Mm. So I usually refer them to this, uh, to, 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 to the, the director in charge of that. Because whatever you claim still has to be reasonably evaluated yes. before we can say yes. But whether you come up with evaluation or not, the, 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 the reality of our situation is that the bulk of our people, they still patronize this uh, um, uh, traditional uh, they do. Yes, they do. traditional Even medical Even without them they, being infected with coronavirus, people are already taking are, are we at any no. point? Are we at any point uh, adopting some part of the protocols that the Chinese, uh, if you like, adopted and made sure now oh, Wuhan is, uh, is in mm. our history yeah. as far as COVID-19 uh, is concerned. outside orthodox. You, you know that um, it, it's not just, a, you see, there is what we also call non-pharmaceutical management. And part of the non-pharmaceutical management is this social distancing. Mm. And one of, the, one, of the, one of the factors for success in uh, China is discipline. Discipline and uh, what you can call enforced compliance. Mm. So those are very critical factors aside any other thing done in China. Mm. Discipline is very critical. People are giving instructions or giving you know advisories. Back, back to your point, and, attitude. And, and, yeah. But to the attitude, point you make attitude. attitude. And, the, and, 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 and and of course people will keep to it. Mm. And of course where they are not keeping to it, they, some of these things are enforced. That's what I call enforced compliance in the overall interest of everyone. Let's uh, go back to the issue of uh, orthodox medicine now. You know, um, following uh, President Trump of uh, the United States of America's um, comment on uh, chloroquine as yeah. being efficacious mm -hmm. in the treatment of COVID-19, it was something that generated a lot of, you know, well, panic and what have you, such that back home in the country you saw people, you know, rushing to procure chloroquine and went invariably went into self-medication. Right now there are some that are dealing with toxicity that came, you know, followed that in hospitals as I'm talking to you now. And what I think didn't help matters will be the fact that just a few uh, on that same day, a few minutes or maybe like an hour after the, we, had, we had took the, the Minister of Health on the issue and he had explained the fact that chloroquine had been phased out of the country. At that time it was used for the treatment of malaria yeah. following the development of uh, resistance. Yeah. And we had the DG NAFTA, not quite long, coming on uh, one of the television stations you know, saying something about the same chloroquine and people misunderstood her and started, you know, stocking up, uh, what do you call it, the chloroquine, and of course the adverse effects that followed. Mm -hmm. Can you just let Nigerians know, uh, you know what they should know about the true situation of chloroquine? Because I'm really scared about the toxicity now. Yeah. 
Thank you very much. You, you, you are right. You see, there have been various uh, documents, research materials talking about the certain protocol for the treatment of treatment. I say treatment, quote and unquote, because ordinarily, I, I told you earlier on that it's your it's your immune system that is the main thing in this in, you know, in what we're dealing with, and oftentimes what you also do in addition is by way of supportive supportive uh, treatment. I mean, if you're having headache, you're having body aches, you give, we give, of course, we give you paracetamol, which an, is an, an, an analgesic, that is something that will, you know, we counter pain. pain and all that. If you're having fever, we give you, if say, paracetamol also has the function of, uh, you know, we call it antipyretic, that is something that lowers your, your, your high body temperature. We give you all that. But we are, we are not treating COVID-19 with that, we're just treating symptoms mm -hmm. of COVID-19. Mm -hmm. Now, but there are studies that have shown that uh, chloroquine has a role in terms of affecting, well, it's, it's a bit complicated, but it's affecting the, the, the cell and vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the virus. The, 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 it, it doesn't enable the virus to, to, to survive. You know, Does it or, or to, weaken or it or it you know eradicates it? That's it's a, well, if it weakens it and uh, it, it it becomes uh, uh, powerless, so to speak. Mm. So it it it, it, does it, means it is treated. Of it course, is treated. Uh, yes, yes. Mm. It, 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 of course, the use of a particular antibiotics too, which is which we know antibiotics does not does not uh, work for virus. virus it yeah. works for bacteria yeah. uh, because if it is suspected or establish that there is a secondary bacterial infection. Just like we, when you have your common cold, uh, you, whether you do something or you do something, your so common cold will take its course. Of three days. And uh, more, maybe more than that. And, so but days. if it does not, we may start suspecting that there is a secondary bacterial infection, mm. which could cause maybe infection of the airway, you know, bronchitis or what have you, or, and all that. Then we give you antibiotics. The antibiotics you are giving is not to fight uh, the virus cold. causing mm -hmm. common cold, mm -hmm. but to fight the secondary bacterial infection that has come in. For so those who are these are some uh, chloroquine. What will you be saying to but them? The, 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 yes, we, the basic thing is that don't take a drug not prescribed for you. That's the most important thing because every drug is a potential poison. Mm -hmm. It depends on under what circumstance are you taking this drug. Mm -hmm. Is it prescribed? Or it's just you are just you know working on that self medication, which could be that's why the kind of thing you said. People are already now showing with uh, chloroquine yeah. toxicity yeah. because the question is, are they taking this chloroquine if they must at all, taking it under prescription? Is there a that, prophylaxis for prevention or what? For now, for it. now, for now, the literature has not told us that uh, there is a place for prophylaxis. That is, you know, prevention. That is taking something as a prevention against, because that, that is the essence of prophylaxis. Honorable Minister, uh, our time is almost the, uh, up now. So to round off, what message do you have for Nigerians? We, we know that there is a daily briefing of the Presidential Task Force on COVID-19, but you are the guy now in our guest here in the studio, what is your message? My message is simple. One, the hand washing has to continue with soap and water, under running water, and uh, where that is not available, that's the first choice. Where it's not available, we ask you to use alcohol-based sanitizer. And this is also important to say, there are a lot of fake sanitizers in the market. Yes. That is, they do not, because when we say alcohol based, we are talking of hand sanitizer that has minimum of about 60% of alcohol. But I have seen myself, some of this in that, even by the time you put them on your, your pants, you know that, no, this is, this is not. <laughs> what, what of those who say you can use just soap and water? Soap and water, that has been established. That's the first choice. Mm -hmm. that where you, it is the first choice. If uh, it's superior to, uh, to uh, alcohol and sanitizer. And should people use alcohol alone because I've seen someone using alcohol? You see, we have even seen situations where some people will pour 
you know, very strong alcohol, pure yeah. alcohol. Yeah. And, and, for, and the danger is, in fact, we've been in fact, we've some seen, took methanol in Iran. We've and seen, and yes, and uh, we've uh, seen people oh, no, Mr. We may have coming to with burnt hands. We, we may have to live in <laughs> there. Uh, 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 Honorable <laughs> Minister of State for Health, <laughs> distinguished Senator Oloru Nimbe Mamora, uh, has been our guest on platform. He's been addressing the Nigeria's containment of the coronavirus, otherwise known as COVID-19. Senator Mamura, thank you so much for your time and uh, we will allow you to maybe go and join your colleagues at the daily briefing to, to continue the public, enlightenment, public engagement and education that is necessary for this period. Thank you very much for inviting me and I cannot thank you enough for the good job that NTA is doing, the largest in Africa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank, you, thank you, you, Honorable Minister. Rabi Abdullah, head of the NTA Health Desk. At some point, uh, I, the language between the <laughs> minister and you were really the same. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Ruth thank Abuel, you NTA Rabi, 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 Thank you. Rabi is a doctor. Uh, thank, uh, don't ask me. Uh, don't, don't, don't ask me. Uh, no, the minister, the minister has, has already confirmed you as a doctor. Uh, that's <laughs> platform for today. Thank you so much for being there. I'm Muhammad Kudu Abubakar. Bye-bye for now. Call you. It's football time. No, we still at some time. Haven't you heard of the lockdown for two weeks? Lockdown? Of course we had, but that doesn't mean we can't play ball. After all, our neighbors doesn't affect us. It doesn't matter, Ayo. Coronavirus is very deadly, and the best way to stay alive is to stay apart and maintain good street hygiene. Wash your hands regularly and sanitize. Keep a safe distance from everyone. Use a tissue to cover your nose and mouth every time you sneeze and cough. Avoid touching your eyes, nose and mouth before washing your hands and stay at home till the lockdown is over. I see. Off I go, my friend. See you after the lockdown. Don't forget to wash your hands. We won't. Staying apart is the best way to stay alive. Keep your children locked down at home. This message is from the National Film and Video Sensors Board. has gone mobile. Catch your favorite programs anywhere in the world by going to Play Store on Android and App Store on iOS. Search for Vision TV UK. Download and install.
Hello there and a very warm welcome to you. Thank you for taking time out of your very busy schedule to keep our company on wellness and living. My name is Thelma Wobaz. You know how we like to do it. We like to come out, talk with you on the streets and get to share in your views and together we can be further enlightened today. We're taking a very close look at drug abuse and this time not from the medical professional's point of view. We'll be talking with a woman who has worked with drug addicts as well as somebody who is on the heels of those who sell drugs and who have become a danger to our society, to our families, to our friends. And this is what Sheldon Whitehouse says. It says, drug addiction is a very tough illness and those who took the path of recovery are making a very brave decision and they deserve our support, our encouragement and our admiration. And that's what we'll be sharing on the program today. But first off, let's come out and talk with you. One thing is that uh, they need their re rehabilitation. They need to be taken to a rehab center where they will rehabilitate them, give them what they need. Some of them, you employ them, especially those ones in the garage, those ones that are living under the bridge. You take them from there, give them something that they can live on. Take them so that you can bring them back to the society. I think that's the best way to rehabilitate a drug addict. If I have somebody that is a drug addict, I will not report him, I will only advise him and pray for him. Because even though you arrest even though you arrested him and take him to the police, they will see they will see release him and we will still go back to the drugs. So it's for me to it's for me to offer prayer for him to change. In most cases at times it could be as a result of our frustrations. So when you want to address such, I want to tell them that they shouldn't uh, maybe imbibe into such art, you come up with policies that at least we influence them and uh, we motivate them to drop such art. If, if we just maybe we just want to descend heavily on them, telling them don't do it, don't do it, without knowing the consequences and uh, telling them the consequences and knowing the causes, you can't address it. And still you know the causes, the remote causes that uh, maybe has uh, made them to become a... I will inform the, the social welfare I think they are the one that is in charge of all those things. I will inform them if I talk to the person, maybe as a brother or as a sister, and the, the person did not take to my advice, I will inform the social welfare they should come in and help the situation. That if there is adequate education of the populace, all these things will be sorted out. We are only trying. We will, we, will, we will try as human beings. But let me see, let me see one thing, as Vincent Oliver, Charities starts from home. A great, of, a, a great number of all these things starts with the parents money their words properly, making that they are children of good behavior. And I was just say today, parents don't send your children to go and buy cigarettes. Parents don't send your children to go and be buying beer. I'm saying the truth. It's always very interesting and enlightening to hear your thoughts and share them to some of the opinion that punishment is what they deserve. Some believe that uh, rehabilitation is the best course of action. Whichever side of the divide that you belong to, um, what is important is that guardians and parents must identify warning signs early on and nip any form of addiction in the bud. Moving forward. I don't know Ken Hensley, but what he says is of great interest to me, especially at this time that we're talking about drug addiction. He's of the opinion that we cannot understand drug addiction except we've experienced it. And there's no better time than now to talk with somebody who has worked with drug addicts, drugs, 
the sellers, the buyers at different times and in different positions. Talking about Chinyere or Bijiro, when we listen, indeed, we will learn. All categories of people abuse drugs because we say it's no respect of persons. However, the most vulnerable are young people. And in our society, we find that the young people from 12 to about 35 are most prone to drug abuse. And we also see these days that we're actually getting younger people than 12, people who are 7, 8, 9, 10 abusing uh, um, substances. That's what we're finding out and that's how to tell that this problem has really become a national epidemic. A lot of times you now have peer pressure that come in. The parental guidance might not be there because at, at, as young persons you find that your what we find is that the, the opinion of your peer and per, perhaps some people in school, could be your teachers, actually count more than your parents. And then you see that when people begin to um, abuse one kind of drug or the other, your parents now are not so uh, enlightened. They are old school, they don't understand you. They don't know what time it is and what is happening. So you're looking at the people who you think are uh, enlightened and you want to uh, emulate what you see on the, in the, in the, on the television, what's, what's going on in the social media, but that's, you don't, what they don't realize is that that is not a, a, a reality. You take drugs, you're bold, you can, you know, uh, you belong to a certain group of people and all that. So that's what we see with young people. If you start with, um, even if it's alcohol, you go into maybe cannabis, you go into cocaine or syrups, and that is because you need more, as you, because your body develops tolerance for these drugs. So you need more and more of it to achieve that level of, um, of high. It has gone beyond just you, because your action now affects a lot of other people. Your family is now involved, the society, your community, the society is involved. Young people in universities believe that when they take some of these drugs, they're able to study more. Unfortunately, by the time they double into it, and the problem now associated with it, now come in, they are unable to finish their studies. We're losing a lot of our traditional values. You know, family life, that as we knew it, is being eroded every day. In the past, every child belonged to the, the community. It wasn't just your child. Your neighbor would discipline your child. These days, even your teacher talking to your child, the parents will go to the school and embarrass the teacher. When the problem now come, we start running helter skelter. We forget that some of this is as a result of our own action, or most or inaction. And then we don't even have time for our children. We throw money at them. We are out the whole day. We leave the, 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 the bringing up of children to house helps, nannies, and uh, maybe other relations. Most times we don't even know who the friends of our children are. The consequences of drugs are numerous. Of course, it leads to fatality, you know, death. That is the worst that can happen, which we don't pray for. But so many others in between, you know, from um, uh, distractions, you know, the person has no, no motivation, you don't want to go to school, you don't want to work, you know, the, the, the personal hygiene and um, general well-being of the person deteriorates, the person's health deteriorates because um, the drugs affect different organs of the body, including the heart, the kidney, the liver, what have you. So all this, you know, you have your health, the health um, um, issues, you have the physiological effects, you have the psychological effect, all of it 
you know, um, uh, um, coming together. Then you now have the uh, uh, economical aspect of it. Because if you're supposed to be in school, you're supposed to be working, you can't work. So what happens? Man hours are lost or the, person, the, 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 the ability of the person to finish school. Of course, education is truncated. What happens in a family? You have a lot of uh, um, uh, altercations in the family. We've had instances where children fight their fathers, their mothers, carry uh, um, weapons, knives, whatever they find, cutlasses, to and you know actually inflict injuries on members of the family who maybe wants them to stop um, doing what they're doing or stopping them from taking something to sell or unable to provide for them the, the means to go and uh, continue where, to fund their habits. A child that needs help needs help. Get the child professional help, get the child religious help, whatever help that child needs. Get the child help. Don't hide it in your house or your family. Hiding it does not solve the problem. It only covers it for a little while. And then before you know it, it is out of hands. You cannot cope. Young people had all kinds of activities. You would do sports. There were all, all, all those. Now, many children are in the house playing game, one game, indoor game or the other. So what do they do? They now experiment with all kinds of things. The National Drug Survey that was released last month by the government says that 14.3 million Nigerians abuse drugs. 14.3 million is almost 10%. It's between 8 to 9% of the total population of this country is abusing drugs. So that tells you that this is a huge problem and it is really worrisome. And we must do something about it. John Zamat Zin says that all the suffering, all the depression, and all the illness that drug addicts and their families go through comes from the drug addicts not realizing that they are already what they are looking for. Perhaps this short package will throw more light on that as well as uh, the positive impact that is health tips will have on us little things like don't leave onions a day old and put it again in your stew or in your soup did you know that already we'll tell you a lot more eat fruits on an empty stomach or before your main meal in times past we were advised by medical practitioners to eat fruits after our meal over time it has changed now medical professionals and researchers advise us to eat fruit on an empty stomach or before a main meal some people say when i eat watermelon for example i burp according to professor ken anugweje this is because they do not eat fruits on an empty stomach Professor Ken goes further to say that when you eat fruits after a meal, it mixes with other foods and putrefies and produces gas. Hence, you bloat. He's of the opinion that green hair, balding, serious outbursts, and dark circles under the eyes will not occur as easily when fruits are eaten on an empty stomach. All fruits are acidic and become like alkaline in the body, according to Dr. Herbert Shelton, a researcher in the United States of America. Professor Ken Anugweje of the University of Patakot further opines that when you eat fruits on an empty stomach and before meals, you prolong your life. You improve your health quality. You improve your energy level. You are joyful and you stay in great shape. Let's talk about fruits, especially fruits in and out of season. They all have benefits, health benefits that is. For example, watermelon. Watermelon contains potassium, lycopene, which is a cancer-fighting oxidant. It contains vitamin C. It boosts the immune system. It also contains glutathione, a major energy booster. Oranges, we come across them every day. They are affordable, they are accessible, and we can find them all year round. What do oranges do? Oranges lower our cholesterol level. Oranges dissolve kidney stones, 
when we take oranges off food, we lessen the risk of colon cancer. We will tell you more about fruits and their enormous health benefits in our next package. There's this lady, I don't know her name, but I know that had someone discovered her much earlier on in her life, perhaps she'd be with the Super Falcons today and perhaps another big team talking about female football. <laughs> Let's watch this. We're sure we'll learn something. I'm going to move up my <laughs> push it forward. The idea is to let this folded hand push your body forward. Stretch your body as much as you can. Just some stretches to make your limbs nimble. So now we swing our arms to the right. Hold it there for the count of 10, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. The other side, we go to the left. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. Okay, let's do some other stretches. Take your right hand to your left foot, to your uh, yeah, left hand to right foot, and then right hand to left foot. Okay, so let's go. So we now turn. Hmm? Now right hand to left. The other arm is up there. Hand is in the air. Let's now go fast. Let's do ten. One, two. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. Fantastic. Okay. Are you feeling a bit light now? Okay. And also to get the blood pumping. It's not good to go from inactivity to activity without any uh, warm up. Okay, now for the meaty matter. You know what we call squats, right? Yes. These are squats. Hmm? So, we're going to do like normal squats, your hands up, forward. When you stand, it's going sideways like this. Okay, so let's try and do 15 reps. We pause for three seconds, another 15. We pause for three seconds, and the last 15. Okay, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Let your let your head and your back be straight. Don't tilt your body forward. 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15. Fantastic. Check our legs. Pause for three seconds each. Okay, so like this, hands up. You're not jumping jacks now. Like this. Oh, okay. you go. Okay? All right. So let's go. One, two, three, four. Eight, nine, and five. 
kan zitten. It's often hard to believe and to note that addiction of any kind is a mental illness and it's a challenge not just for the sufferer but for everyone involved in his or her life. The family, the friends who all have a role to play and the most important role we should play is that of a positive support system. Sheldon Whitehouse puts it this way. He says that recovery is a very tough process for someone to make up their minds and say, I want to stop this thing. It has a bad impact on myself or my life or my family. I want to make a positive change. They deserve our encouragement, our support, and if we want to spread it, our admiration as well. Be a part of our program, Wellness and Leaving, on our social media handle, Wellness and Leaving, at Nigerian Television Authority. We'd love to see you there. We've opened the doors of communication and looking forward to hear from you. My name is Thelma Obaze. I'd love to see you again. For now, it's bye. When it comes to the immune system, one of the things that you have to pay attention to, and I've talked about this over and over again in the laws of life, is that you need adequate sleep. You can't be shirking on your sleep. You can't be messing up where that is concerned. You need to have seven to eight hours of sleep in a dark environment with very little noise or activity. Uh, your, the night time and that sleep time is when your body is repairing. Your body is repairing its brain, your body is repairing the organs, but most importantly, your immune system is recovering from all the activities of the day. So you've got to have enough sleep so your immune system can recover. And remember, your immune system is the one thing that is standing between you and coronavirus. All the reports say point to a compromised immune system as a reason why you not only do you are you more susceptible to the virus i'm not saying that if you have a strong immune system you won't be susceptible to it uh, but you'd be less susceptible to it if you have a strong immune system and even if you do have the infection you're going to have a much quicker recovery time and a more complete recovery if your immune system has been strong and you keep the immune system strong so it's very very important that you sleep well so you can recover well and so you can continue to live a long, healthy, lasting life. COVID-19, the coronavirus, traveling is, can actually expose you to a lot more risk, whether it's traveling by road, traveling by air, traveling by sea. One of the reasons for that is that you're always going to be in close contact with other people and the risk of meeting somebody that has the virus 
is much, much, much higher. Now, in a plane, especially if you're traveling overseas, 15-hour flight, oof, you have in the air that is circulating. So if someone has a virus on the plane, uh, there's a greater chance that you'll be exposed. So some of the tips that people talk about is trying to get a window seat, that there's less exposure to it than if you're in the aisle seat. Uh, of course, you can't control that. But what I would do, what I will continue to do, days before I, st I travel, I'm traveling very soon, days before I travel and on the plane, I'm going to be taking a lot of vitamin C. You need at least, I, I'm going to just tell you what I do. And this is, uh, research bears this to be true. You need at least five to six grams of vitamin C a day. So I just take a whole big teaspoonful, put it in a bottle of water, and I drink it throughout the day. You don't, you don't want to take it all at once. Now, vitamin D, you can take that all at, all at once. So normally you should be taking about, I, sh I take about 10,000 international units a day. People say that's a lot, but the research says that 10,000 is good. Some people take as much as 150,000 and beyond. Um, so it's uh, to each man or each, each, each his own, but that's what I do. Vitamin D, vitamin C. I also talked about nano silver. This is, has a lot of research behind it. This is not colloidal silver. It's an activated nanoparticle of silver that comes in liquid. It's, it's extremely safe. There has no toxicity whatsoever. I'm not saying, saying you should do, this is a treatment, but I take it for myself so that I can boost my immune system. If you can't afford this, you can get a lot of garlic. You can take a lot of ginger. You can take a lot of cucumber. Just take those fruits and vegetables that will strengthen your immune system. I want to avoid fried foods, especially fried foods, processed foods, um, and all the other foods with all the extra sugars in them. So you want to, because sugar really depresses your immune system. So the less sugar you take, the less, the fewer fried foods you take, the more of the raw vegetables that you take, especially the ones we've mentioned, the stronger your immune system will be. So please pay attention to that. COVID-19 transmission is mostly through droplets from sneezing and saliva. The most effective way to protect yourself from the virus is to practice good personal hygiene. Wash hands with soap under running water or use an alcohol-based sanitizer if water is not available. Maintain at least two meters distance between yourself and anyone who is coughing or sneezing. Cover your mouth and nose with your elbow or tissue when you cough or sneeze. Dispose of the used tissue immediately. If you have traveled recently to a country with COVID-19 outbreak in the last 14 days and you have a fever, cough or breathing difficulty, call NCDC toll-free numbers before going to the hospital. This message is from the National Orientation Agency. or confectionery product to be acceptable by consumer. Quality is key. A lot of bakers in Nigeria enjoy loyalty and recommendations from clients just because they are known for tasty and fluffy cakes. If you really desire greater height in your cake making business, pay proper attention to quality. This is Baker's World on NTA, your one-stop Baker's show on television. My name is Funke Oyele. Thanks for joining us on the program. We have a rich lineup for you today on Baker's World. We will be showing you how to make a yummy and refreshing cake with a bold flavor. Our guest baker is a retired superintendent of customs who started baking as a hobby. We will let you into our world in our interview session. On Baker's Gist, 
We have a motivational talk by a life coach and some business management tips. You just relax and enjoy all we have for you on the show. Coconut is a fruit that has gradually become a versatile confectionery commodity. Many people love it either for its nutritional benefit or its flavor. On today's episode of Baker's World, our baker Lydia and our assistant will show us how to make a fluffy and delicious coconut cake. So don't go anywhere. We are going to first of all wash our hands. So now we will put our butter in the mixer. So now our butter has been well creamed. Let's see how it looks. Here is the color now. Remember it was very yellow before. Now it's pale, it's fluffy, and it's soft. The next thing now is we want to add our lemon zest. So we let the mixer run for a few minutes. Now we want to add the eggs. So we let our mixer run. So now we want to alternate our yogurt and our flour. At this point we are going to reduce the speed. Now I'm adding a bit of the yogurt. And then we'll mix again. So we are alternating our flour and the yogurt. So I'm adding the last bit of the yogurt now. And then our remaining flour. to add our coconut flakes but to do that we won't be using the mixer this is the coconut flakes and I'm adding it now why we use hand to do this is that when you add the coconut flakes with the paddle the paddle it tends to clog the paddle so that it doesn't spread evenly in the butter. Here is our butter. Now we have to spread it out. While we wait for our butter to be baked, we'll take this quick break after we'll be having a conversation with our guest baker. See you after this time out. actually a passionate baker. I don't rest until everything is done. When I entered university, anytime I'm broke, I'll make cupcakes and go and sell to the other students. Decorating cake is, it's an artistic thing and art is, you know, dynamic. Join us on Baker's World every Thursday at 3.30 p.m. on the network service of the NTA. Baker's World. Celebrating creativity. Don't miss it. Baking has procedure that you must follow if you want to have good results. And the number one 
procedure is measurement. We have with us today a retired customs officer and talented baker. Born on the 28th of July, 1957, to the Ilebode family in Otuo, Owan local government in Edo State. Lydia Omo Atane had her early education at St. Stephen's Primary School, Otuo, and proceeded to Anglican Girls Grammar School, now Federal Government College, Ibilo, Edo State. She joined the Nigerian Customs Service in 1975 in order to further her education, Lydia got a study leave in 1980 and had her tertiary education at Abraka College of Education, now Delta State University, where she obtained a national certificate in education in English language. Lydia also attended Faith Theology Seminary Otta in Ogun State and bagged a degree in theology in 1996. Lydia Atane's journey into the cake world started by chance through a baker friend she later discovered her interest in cake making and started to bake leisurely for her children's birthdays and family friends at no cost. Lydia did this for several years because she enjoyed cake making and was just satisfied with the thrills of surprised reactions her cakes gave to people. This amazing baker's interest in cake making continued to increase till it became a passion. At this point, she realized her need for greater creativity in baking and decorations. Not minding her age, she grabbed every opportunity to acquire professional trainings from renowned bakers across the country. After her retirement in 2010, Lydia eventually turned her passion into a full-time cake business. Her brand, Lydia Cake Bakery, has produced confectionery products for many celebrations and cake exhibitions in Abuja. Lydia is happily married to engineer Stephen Atani and blessed with four children. Join us as we chat with this determined, result-oriented and purposeful baker, Lydia Omo Atani. You're welcome to Baker's World. Thank you. How have you been able to achieve creativity with all your years of experience? Achieving creativity, one, you have to train. So I had a, a level of training. And then because of the interest in this uh, baking, because of the passion I had for it, I just discovered that anything I saw, the first thing that would come to my mind would be how I could incorporate it in uh, decorating a cake. And that was how, and then sometimes, inspiration. I just come from within, I just okay, I do this less. There are times I'm decorating a cake and something out of what was originally planned. You just come in and I just and it comes out beautiful. With all your years of experience, I know you must have so many stories, but what I want to hear about is your first rookie mistake. Tell me about that. The very first that I can't forget. A sister was to celebrate her son's first birthday and uh, all the women in the church gathered in my house to bake. We were very busy and uh, we baked this cake. This uh, sister who taught me how to bake did the decoration of us were there. I remember that day we baked far into the night and we had to be escorting all the women to their homes. And it was rainy. That was a Saturday night and um, Sunday after service we all gathered in the house of the sister whose son was. Uh, marking his birthday. The children gathered and after eating, dancing and all of that, or trying to cut cake. And by the time they put a knife to the cake, the cake was like two. <laughs> it was not well cooked. And nobody could eat you. Nobody could taste wow. the cake. <laughs> I know a lot of kids were expecting, you know, this cake and they were already waiting. So what did you learn from that? The lesson that I learned is that baking This is the network service of the NTA. We now join our outside broadcast crew for a live telecast. Please stay tuned. That have indicated to ask questions have already been given their numbers. I shall now invite the chairman of the presidential task force, Mr. Boss Mustafa, to please address 
the nation. Thank you. You have come again. Stand there. <laughs> Honorable um, members of the Presidential Task Force, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen of the press, let me once again welcome you most sincerely to the national daily briefing on COVID-19. And as usual, we shall be updating you on developments regarding our national response and also bring you up to speed on what to expect. The implementation of the lockdown order in Ogun, Lagos states and the federal capital territory Abuja is taking shape. We unveiled the guidelines to you yesterday and have started communicating to the security agencies and all those involved in the enforcement accordingly. The Presidential Task Force wishes to emphasize that this measure is not punitive as the government is conscious of the well-being of all Nigerians. The COVID-19 is a potential danger to all of humanity and threatens our economy and national security. You will all understand, therefore, why we must at, times, at all times take very difficult decisions in order not to disrupt the economy and particularly the supply of power to our homes. Government yesterday, as I informed you, has already exempted essential staff of companies in the upstream oil and gas sector from the restrictions and exempted further the movement of fertilizer and related items so that we can keep our agricultural economy working. This is all in order to facilitate availability of gas to fire the turbines that generate power for the supply in our homes and also to ensure that our farmers have fertilizer and other necessary components as the farming season is about to begin. That underscores the intricate nature of decisions that we have taken and those that will be taken. As we continue to assess the readiness for containment and management, we recognize strongly the importance of synergy with the states. It is important that states, whether in the front line where cases have been reported or where cases have not been reported yet, to intensify the preparation of facilities that will help in the event of a surge. Training of personnel in the management of these facilities is also a critical factor to the success of our strategy. The Presidential Task Force shall intensify consultations with the governors and other state agencies to achieve the much needed collaboration. In furtherance of this consultation, we are requesting that the subnational governments should provide at least a 300 bed facility, facility, either a hotel or other facilities that are available to them with options and graded in different categories so that they provide a place where they can provide basic nursing and other required procedure before patients are moved into the isolation centers or 
the teaching hospitals or any other health facility. And those facilities starting from 300 bed should be expandable as the need arises. The commitment of our health workers is critical to the success of our national response. In this regard, the Presidential Task Force wishes to assure our frontline workers and those retired personnel we are mobilizing that adequate measures are being taken to protect them, knowing fully well the hazards associated with their job. In the interest of humanity and our nation, the Presidential Task Force appeals to every Nigerian to take this exercise very seriously by obeying all protocols and measures put in place. Staying alive is more important. I also appeal to leaders of our society, the VIPs, the religious leaders, the captains of industries, to comply with the rules of testing so that the spread of the virus does not spiral out of control. Ladies and gentlemen, we are in difficult times and these difficult times refer, require tough decisions. And we will continue to update you and give you basic information that will help in mobilizing Nigerians and putting them on the trajectory of realizing that we are the only people that can safeguard ourselves and also do all possible within our means to ensure that we curtail or flatten the curve of this pandemic. Ladies and gentlemen, the following members of the Presidential Task Force shall elaborate in their reports to the nation for today. They are the Honorable Minister of Health, the DG Center for Disease Control, the Honorable Minister for Information and Culture, and any other minister that would have a critical requirement to speak from the podium or answer questions as the questions are thrown. I shall now yield the podium to the Honorable Minister of Health to report to you. Thank you. The Secretary to the Government of the Federation, Honourable Ministers here present, Directors and uh, ladies and gentlemen of the press. As of today, 10 a.m., 2nd of April 2020, Nigeria has recorded 174 confirmed COVID-19 cases. 91 are in Lagos, 35 in the FCT, 14 in Oshun, 8 in Oyo, 5 in Akwaibom, 4 each in Ogun, Edo, and Kaduna, 3 in Bauchi, 2 each in Enugu and Ekiti, and 1 each in Rivers and Benue states. Those discharged from hospital are still nine, but others are pending once their final tests are done. Two fatalities are the only ones still on record, and these being cases with other serious pre-existing illnesses. As contact tracing and testing capacity are being ramped up, more and more cases will be found and the number of new confirmed cases of COVID-19 is expected to rise initially. We also worry about persons, especially Nigerians, returning to the country through land borders who run a higher risk of infection if they are with an infected person in a confined space for a long time 
like transit in a crowded bus or a car. Therefore, it is advisable that all travelers postpone non-essential travel, whether by air or by land, and whether national or international. In this regard, all Nigerians are advised to remain where they are resident and to stay safe and obey the rules and the laws that are provided, except if they are returning home from a previously arranged journey or from a business trip or a vacation. With the expanded national case definition and the addition of two laboratories to the NCDC network of molecular diagnostic laboratories, national testing capacity has increased. Moreover, lockdown in half of the states presents the advantage of reduced population mobility and leaves more people at home to be found during contact tracing. As I said, all this means that more people, more samples can be collected, can be tested more quickly, and the turnaround time is shorter, and it means that more cases will be discovered. With 71% of over presumed 6,000 more contacts now traced, the number confirmed may rise dramatically, but contrast tracing will still be intensified to reduce the number of outstanding ones. We shall continue to expand isolation centers and prepare ICU units across the country for those who may have complications. We have also expanded bedding and intensive care space in Abuja, Guagualada, and have had urged all states to do the same in their states, starting with tertiary hospitals. All facilities, including uh, those where isolation, all facilities where isolation and treatment of coronavirus are to be conducted will be inspected before accreditation by a team of experts that has been put together as announced yesterday. The Office of National Security Advisor shall also be represented due to the national security implications. The facilities in Abuja are currently being inspected as I speak to you by the experts. I enjoin all states and facility managers to cooperate in the exercise because it will largely determine our success in containing the spread of the virus. Yesterday, I had a meeting with the Nigeria Medical Association leadership and they came to offer their cooperation and also to mobilize their representatives to be able to support the national response to the coronavirus. Uh, threat. We have urged them to invite retired members, particularly in Lagos and Abuja, to register and volunteer their service. In view of the prevailing global shortages of particular commodities like masks and uh, protective gowns and even of ventilators, we have been having, we are going to have uh, conversations with the Ministry of Industry, Trade and Investment to look for indigenous producers, indigenous manufacturers to try and support the um, effort to find more uh, uh, facilities and, and commodities that we are going to be using for uh, protection and personal protection equipment. Thank you. The Director General, NCDC. Uh, Chair, Honorable Ministers, ladies and gentlemen of the press. <coughs> Firstly, to thank you very much and to thank Nigerians for all the support that uh, the teams have received over the last uh, few days. Nigerians have generally, across the country, been really showed their support for the teams in different ways, in whatever way they can. We also thank you for your understanding, 
for the small inadequacies that we've had in certain aspects of the response while promising to keep improving on all of that, uh, specifically on the call center and on the speed with which we've issued out results. We've had the largest number of positive cases yesterday, but we had also the largest number of people tested ever yesterday. And we've made sure we've prioritized getting back the results to all the positives. Uh, there has been some delay in calling all the negatives, but we're working on that, and by the end of today, we should be all through with the backlog. So we're grateful for the support. The one area I'd like to talk on a little bit today is the work that we're doing from the federal government in supporting all the states in Nigeria. We currently have 15 rapid response teams uh, supporting 15 states. It's the largest deployment of public health resources for an outbreak ever in our country. Unlike other outbreaks that are localized, even the Ebola outbreak was still Lagos and Port Harcourt. This time, every day we add a new state, every single day we have to deploy a new team. It requires resources, people, logistics, efforts. This is a significant exercise, and we're assuring every state that we will continue to do everything necessary to support them to respond to these events that are unfolding in our country. We're not doing this on our own. Every single federal government agency has offered us support, people, vehicles, together. Uh, we are deploying these resources to the states. We rapidly train, we bring them into the team. It forms one federal government team, uh, both uh, National Primary Health Care Development Agency, the National Health Insurance Scheme, uh, the Medical Laboratory Council, everybody has supplied staff and resources with which we're deploying. However, these deployments will still not be possible without our partners. Uh, WHO is in the room, the Africa Field Epidemiology Network. Everybody has really come together to deploy to support the states across uh, the country. We are building up on some investments that we have made over the last few years. Over the last few years, We've set up 22 public health emergency operation centers in the states. Our plan was to get it up to 37, uh, so to cover every state but plus FCT. Unfortunately, we were not quite there when this outbreak struck. But this will also give us energy to reinvigorate our efforts, our efforts because it is within those EOCs at the state level that the response comes together. That is where the federal, state, and everybody not just the public health forces, but the immigration, our, uh, our security agencies, everybody comes together within the context of an EOC every day to define the response, identify gaps, fix those gaps, define the next strategical uh, strategy, and keep improving on the response. So those EOCs are important, and that the meeting space uh, where the rapid response teams uh, meet. Now, the expertise in these rapid response teams would not have been possible without months and years of training, support from the World Health Organization, the West Africa Health Organization, Public Health England, and many other partners. Now, every week, somebody is going out to, be, to build on a specific skill. And these are not just contact tracing. That's the most obvious one. It's supply chain management, laboratory deployment. There are all sorts of various skills that are required to keep a response like this moving. And it's like riding a bicycle. You can't afford to stop. If you stop for one minute, the bicycle falls. So the response has to keep going and keep moving forward every day. We solve problems, we move forward, we solve the next problem the next day, and we try our best to support every state in Nigeria to be able to respond. So today really is about celebrating these colleagues on the front lines. They really are going over and beyond the call of duty. Many of them work for 18 hours every day. We get sit reps sent to us. Some of those sit reps arrive in my inbox at 1 a.m., 2 a.m. that morning because the next day they have to go out again. So from the federal government side, on behalf of the PTF, we are doing our best to support every state. Just yesterday, five new cases were announced in Akwaibom. This morning, a large team has already deployed to Akwaibom. 
as we speak, they must be halfway. It's, no, it's not possible to fly uh, very easily at the moment, especially if we need to do so rapidly. We need to collect supplies from the lab uh, to collect uh, samples. We collect IPC materials, everything they need to respond. And by 10 a.m., they were already on their way to support Akwai Bomb State. So that's how the response is panning out. That's how we're supporting every state in Nigeria. Uh, Lagos has the biggest team, close to 50 people, a joint team from WHO, Affinet, supporting them. The FCT has the second largest team, obviously because of the numbers of cases in these two states. So I want to assure every state in Nigeria, you're not alone. No matter what happens, we will support you to prevent, we will support you to respond, but we need to remember, Mr. President called on us to have one response across the country, one response led by the PTF, whether it's in Zamfara or Akwaibom, whether it's in Kwara or Adamawa, we have one coordinated response through which to respond to this global pandemic of which Nigeria is just a part of. Thank you very much. The Minister of Information and Culture. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and um, gentlemen of the press. The spike in fake news is actually dis distracting our fight against COVID-19. And I think this is quite unhelpful. It's been trending on the social media that the equipment and aid that we receive from China, from Jack Ma, they've all been infected with the virus. This is not true. Also, I was quoted yesterday as having said that uh, the PTF had distributed five billion naira to the most vulnerable people in the last 24 hours. That also is not correct. The whole idea of this daily briefing is to eliminate any disinformation or fake news. Because here, we give you the latest development on the fight against COVID-19. And there's absolutely no need to go elsewhere to source for any other information. Whatever any other person in the task force does, either by appearing on television, radio shows, or great interview, is simply to amplify what we've given you here. So by being here, you get authentic information, real time, on the fight against COVID. Having said this, I want to once again thank you for your time and resources, if all devoted to informing and educating Nigerians on our resolute fight against COVID-19. Thank you very much. The National Coordinator will now report. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my own will be quite brief. Um, I would like to provide additional clarity uh, with regards to the issue of markets, which um, I understand is not very clear with the public. So the decision of the PTF is that um, satellite markets uh, will operate um, every other day for four hours a day, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. This does not refer to the, the, the main markets that are already closed, and neither does it refer to markets that have been closed by local authorities. Uh, we do not expect them to open. But for markets that um, supply uh, neighborhoods, we would um, allow them to operate uh, for just four hours a day, every other day. Um, having said this, I need to re-emphasize again to shop owners, particularly those uh, with, um, operating supermarkets and food stores, that uh, they are allowed to operate only if they are dealing with food and perishable items, including pharmaceuticals as well. We also expect them to respect the self-distancing uh, rules 
to avoid mass gatherings and to make sure that they have available uh, equipment for measuring body temperature and also hand sanitize, sanitizing hands. If um, we will be having inspection, regular inspection of their premises and uh, stores that um, repeatedly uh, break these rules will be asked to close. Thank you very much. And that concludes the, the first part, the reports. We will now go into the question and answer session. We have two tranches of questions, first seven, followed by uh, responses, and then another seven. Uh, please bear in mind that, um, okay. The Honorable Minister of Environment will give us his report before we go into the question and answer session. Thank you. Uh, the SGF Honorable Ministers, press, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, from the Federal Minister of Environment, just a quick update on two issues. One, on personnel. Second, uh, equipment and, of course, the ongoing decontamination and disinfection we started yesterday. Uh, on the personnel side, we are currently assembling about 3,000 additional community volunteers that can be trained uh, quickly in terms of uh, advocacy at the grassroots, uh, counseling and advices as appropriate, especially in terms of hygiene, uh, sanitation. Also, we have alerted some of our retired personnel that uh, to be on the lookout if there is need, we'll again, just like the Minister of Health is doing, we'll also reach out to them and see who we can get in to come and uh, help in this respect. As for the decontamination we started yesterday, I can report back to you uh, areas that have been completed uh, up to this point. Uh, the Federal Secretariat, Phase 1 and 2, Head of Service, Office of the Secretary to the Government, uh, all Secretary... Uh, the, 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 all Secretariat and also Federal Minister of Youth and Sport, Minister of uh, Environment, Works and Housing, Science and Technology, uh, Central Bank, NNPC, which is ongoing currently, Office of Ecological Fund, and also currently uh, Federal Minister of Foreign Affairs is ongoing. Uh, uh, also, I'll be happy to report that uh, we have acquired additional trucks. This time we have expanded our collaboration with the police. I spoke with the IG this afternoon and he graciously released 10 specialized trucks that we can use uh, for the fumigation. Another agency has also released one truck and we intend to look at any other agency, military or paramilitary, that have some of these trucks that we can uh, acquire, which will make the disinfection and fumigation uh, decontamination faster. So this is where we are as of this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Minister. We shall now go into the question and answer session. We will take in successive order questions one to seven. The okay. Thank you. Um, good evening, the SGF, Honorable Ministers, and my colleagues. Uh, my name is Rohila Lassa. I report for Voice of Nigeria. Uh, most of my questions here are feedback from the audience. Uh, this, the first one, the first set is sent in from Kaduna State. And uh, the person says, why is the NCDC boss not wearing masks while others are wearing masks? and who is supposed to wear the mask. Um, the number, okay, it, it continues. The number of new cases is increasing and the lockdown is being relaxed continuously. Is it not more risky that this could promote the spread of the virus, more so that contacts of some index cases are still being traced? Two, how much have banks contributed how much have individuals contributed so far? Are the billions of Naira donations being received by government or the committee by any alert? Or there is politics of donation as in pledging in public 
and fail to, rele to redeem the pledge privately. And uh, the next one says there are video clips going around uh, the social the social media of security agents forcing people, even those sitting outside their homes, to go in. And the complaint is there is no light. So they are asking if there is uh, going to be palliative for them. Maybe uh, the SGF could talk to the power boss if they could provide, uh, make light electricity available to people and then maybe at a subsidized rate. Okay. The next one is government discourages gathering, gathering why sharing money rather than depositing via account number of beneficiaries by the Honorable Minister of Humanitarian Affairs? Secondly, how can the Honorable Minister account for this money with proper and approved data from government? I have. And then the last one, someone says, I want to know how and what to do if someone or a group of persons want to donate relief materials to ease the burden of the COVID-19 pandemic on the government. And are there approved places where hospital equipment can be bought? The last one says, are banks also going to operate? Thank you. Before we take the next question, please uh, be reminded that um, you make your questions as compact as possible, maximum two questions per person, and don't repeat what others have already said. Thank you. Good afternoon to the task force and Nigerians at home. My name is Mitaire Ikben of the NTA. My colleague has already asked uh, a basket of questions, so let me just uh, seek clarification for the task force on this. Uh, some parts of the FCT today seem to be bubbling as uh, residents uh, seem to be abusing uh, the leverage given by the task force or the window of opportunity for shops selling foodstuff to open between uh, 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. Now, we want to ask, uh, if I'm staying in the Federal Capital Territory, if I stay in Apo, for instance, and I feel uh, foodstuff will be affordable in a place like Karshi, should I be traversing that long distance to go and make uh, that purchase, or I'm to shop in my locality or immediate vicinity? I think we need to clarify that. Or let's say if I stay in Lagos and I'm in Ikbaja, do I need to move to Yaba to go and get uh, purchase food stuff? I think we need to clarify that. And again, uh, there are parts of the Federal Capital Territory, some far-flung communities in uh, Kuje, for instance, that, you know, it seems as if life is still normal. It seems as if there is no uh, lockdown. So I want to ask what the task force is doing especially with relation to uh, strengthening the enforcement as it borders on uh, strategy and deployment of uh, personnel to the grassroots of uh, the affected states to enforce the lockdown. Thank you. Good afternoon, sirs. Good afternoon, man, and my colleagues. So I would like to speak in Yoruba and I will take the audience of the Minister of the Interior, person of Ogbene Raouf Aregbenshola to answer this question in Yoruba, sir. Iberi emi a koko ni wikbe, kini oruko te mini abiyodun ulo yidi pupola lati ili ishi akidi Nigeria, voice of Nigeria, ni ye ka ide Yoruba, ati wikbe a wabiri ti mufe biri yi, oje a wabiri e yiti wabiri, I won't be a ton beery, but pat, pataki jolati low carry. Oh, she jack in February near the Ruba K. Bally, that were long data. If you are coconi, nepati, illu, a jibu, nep, in lay or shun. Are you pay? I want your low about a little relay in Nigeria, Latiquari, or let Latu relay. 
a de ru pe awon alekun tin de bayi awon eyan to to ni arun yi lati ilu inu ilu ejibo kini ise kini a ilepa ijoba orilede nigeria lati ru pe adiku de ba awon eyan to ngba enu bude wa wole pelu arun yi pataki julo ni ipinle osun eni to bere bere yi ati lo america lo ti te iwe iranse si mi e keji ni pe kini awon nkan ti ijoba ni fun awon to je pe yato se awon to ku die ka to laujo awon bi awon to wa oko lati fi je awon to je pe won o ni ise mi bi ise ijoba to je pe ipare osu ni won gba owo ati awon mi be be lo kini ero ngba ti ijoba n gbero lati ri pe alekun na de ba won po se wa ni le ati pe awon lopa kini a kini um ohun ti a nse lati ri pe won o fi ya je awon ara ilu bi won se fe tori pe opolopo la nri lawujo to je pe o kan nu awon ala ilu bo se won ni nitori pe kini won ni pe covid 19 won ni ta e thank you very much sir good afternoon sjf good afternoon honorable ministers my name is musa aminu dambo I will ask the question in Hausa language. The first question is go to the SDF. Akoyi tambaya de tafuto de ga jihar kanu inda jia chikimbaya ninka kabaye ni chiwa gumina tintareya zata raba ton dubu saba inna abanchega al umma. Me tambaya kukuma masi tambaya sana bukata nsuji matakanda za okadu mangani nyakega al umma msamang amatakin karkara. Saya tambah ada view juga ke Menteri Muhalli. Indah akan itu tambah ada gejahar kaduna. Metambah, ya itu tambah akan cewajia amparin pesi abuja. Sengon ini mata kay government entaraya kerja semua ekater Muhalli takiat awak. Dua mangan abunya kega seorang juhohi. Musim mata ni amat akan kerkara. Honorable Ministers, my colleagues, my name is Amaka Ode. I report for Arise News, and no, I am not going to speak in Igbo. <laughs> well, it's a good thing that the Honorable Minister of Humanitarian Affairs is here because uh, we want to say well done to the tax force and you in particular, because we saw the pictures online yesterday. But uh, I need um, a follow-up, really, in terms of your data as to who is getting these palliatives. Are we sticking to the 2.6 million households that you said your data already captured, or how many other Nigerians have you included in um, this new palliatives that you're distributing? And uh, the next question will be for the Honorable Minister of Health as well as the DG of the NCDC. Well, it's more of good news and uh, we need clarifications on certain things. Well, we've seen 174 confirmed cases in Nigeria. But thankfully, only two fatalities. And the question is, yes, it's cheering news, but are there any particular reasons we can adduce to the low fatality rates in the country? And is there anything that Nigerians at home who probably have not been tested but feel some sort of symptoms that might not be COVID, but that they can do really to just keep their health up, really? Thank you. Good afternoon, members of the Presidential Tax Force on COVID-19. I have a couple of questions, but I'll try as much as possible to make them come back here. Uh, Honorable Minister of Information, sir, this quest, first question is for you. Oh, he's not here. Okay. Okay, I can Okay. Uh, the question I want to ask is, him is, when he came out, he did talk about uh, the issue of fake news uh, affecting the fight against COVID-19. I would also want him to respond to uh, a report by a Twitter user saying that uh, a high-risk member of the government has passed on as a result of COVID-19. I would want him to respond to that. Then secondly, sorry. Secondly, I also want to ask uh, the Minister of Humanitarian Affairs. Uh, Madam, newspapers were watched today by reports from NGO asking for transparency in the handling of the money from captives of industries and corporate bodies. What is your reaction to this? I also want to ask that there are allegations of selective care for COVID-19 uh, patients, that preferential treatment is being given to high-profile patients, especially in Lagos Center in Yaba, 
We had a report uh, yesterday on our station AIT where a man whose wife is COVID-19 positive was screaming out his frustration and it was not an isolated incident. Can you respond to this? Thank you very much. Good afternoon, sirs. My name is Friday Okirigbe. I'm a reporter with Channels TV. My first question, I appreciate it if the Honorable Minister of Interior can provide answer to it. It has to do with the cases that are reported or that were reported in Oshu State. We have a report that most of them are those returnees from Ivory Coast. And uh, I wonder why we should have returnees from Ivory Coast if our land borders are actually closed. Then the second question, I will appreciate if the NCDC bus will help us to provide answer to that. Uh, on Tuesday, you told us here that um, we're tracing uh, about 5,000 contacts. I would like to know how many contacts so far have been traced from this estimate that you give to us. Thank you. With that, we have come to the end of the first wave of questions. We will be responding in the following order. The Minister of Health, followed by the NCDC Director General, the Minister of Interior, the Minister of Humanitarian Affairs, Disaster Management and Social Development, the National Coordinator, and finally, the SGF. The Minister of Health, please. The questions that uh, came out here are uh, in the public health arena. And so I invite uh, Dr. Chikwe, CDC, to come and answer the questions. Uh, thank you, Honorable Minister of Health. Um, firstly, uh, I'll go through the questions and I'll come back to the question of masks at the end. Um, firstly, the reasons for the low uh, fatality case fatality ratio at the moment um, is, is, is too early to talk about anything being low or high. Um, where you can see the numbers from other countries, um, we're at uh, just over, or just under 200 cases. There are still cases in our treatment centers. We've only discharged less than 10 patients. So it's too early to, tie, to try and uh, conclude that the case fatality ratio is low, not to talk about the reasons for its being low. So the message really is for everyone to keep pushing on the care provided, early identification, bring them into care, let's provide the best treatment possible and hope that we can keep those numbers as low as they are. Um, now, the question of what to do to keep up your health uh, during this period of uh, uh, staying at home, um, I agree. Uh, there's no scientific um, answer to that. We can all come up with ways uh, to exercise within our compounds, uh, you know, vary the work that we do. So in this case, you are actually more the experts than we are. But yes, we have to find a way of keeping healthy. And I know uh, the circumstances in which many Nigerians live uh, make this a little bit difficult. But just take this as a period of sacrifice uh, for our country and for uh, long-term health, growth, and sustainability. Um, there's a question about preventional care to high-profile uh, patients in our treatment centers. Um, this is just simply not true. Um, everyone in the treatment center, both in Lagos and Abuja, is getting the same level of care. Um, if there are any variances, um, I will be very surprised. But the healthcare workers are really working very hard to make sure everyone is supported uh, through their period of care. There are some adjustments that are being made in the treatment centers to make this period of isolation and treatment a bit more comfortable. Uh, thankfully, most of our patients have mild symptoms, which makes it very difficult sometimes to remain on treatment and isolation. So if you have a very severe medical condition, there's no time to worry about uh, whether you're in a room for 14 days. But when you're physically well, but still infectious, because we repeat the sampling, it's a little bit difficult for that individual to stay in a room. So we've really urged them to use uh, their phones, 
and other means of communication to stay in touch with their families and friends. And now some arrangements are being made for very careful, uh, uh, allowing them to come out uh, to the fresh air under controlled circumstances so that they can, uh, you know, just continue life and bear this uh, period for a few more days until then they test um, uh, negative because it's not, there's no defined period of um, isolation when you're in hospital. You just have to stay until your test turns uh, negative. So it's a very challenging period. And we call on all the family members, friends of uh, these individuals to stay in touch with them, uh, to keep encouraging them through this period. On our contacts, we have traced and are monitoring 71% of all of them. Um, by the end of today, that percentage will increase. This is really what uh, the period, these two weeks are for, to enable people to move around a lot easier. Uh, Lagos has really been transformational over the last few days. The teams are able to move uh, incredibly quickly across Lagos to make sure uh, they monitor all these contacts. So we have, uh, we're 71% of all those listed are currently uh, in, uh, in contact with us. The numbers are going down. The early patients, the early cases had large number of contacts because all, many of them were in airlines and we had to basically uh, contact everyone in that uh, flight when they came back. But everyone being identified now as a case has 30, maybe max 40 contacts. So the number of contacts per confirmed case is reducing because we no longer have people that have been exposed to a plane uh, in the most recent uh, cases. Um, on the final question around masks, at the moment we don't have a national policy on wearing masks. Um, when we do get to that, we will announce that to the country. But at the moment, everyone is advised to carry out an individual risk assessment. But having said that, the most important people that we need to keep as many masks as possible for our healthcare workers. Our healthcare workers are the most at risk, and my responsibility as the leader of the Nigeria Center for Disease Control is to work with all our partners, all our friends, all our donors to make sure that every single mask in the country that we have available to us is kept for healthcare workers so that they can work safely to keep the rest of us safe. H having said that, it's everybody's uh, a right to procure masks, to use them as they deem fit, to control their own health and limit their exposure, especially people, uh, many people in this room uh, that have to be out every day. Every other person in Abuja is at home because they have been instructed to stay at home. So many of us in this room have to be out because you have to keep walking. And then everyone can make that individual decision on whether to wear a mask or not. So I hope that clarifies that and I hope not to come back to this specific question. Let's focus on questions that relate uh, to the response itself. Thank you. Minister of Interior. Well, let's all of all greet Nigerians. It's, it's nice having the opportunity to talk to you all. Thank you. Iberia, Koko, Tia Biodun, Tivon, to Nikaso, Lilori, Oni or Rangwe Jibo. If you buy a lot of Jeti, Rangwe Jibo, to all I do, no, she will listen to Nigeria, but I'm going to see you. I call my bearer, Pelu, away your back on you. One you cook, one you cook, one no mammon, until a bad issue, one yali amu your way. The English of those two proverbs is simple, if I must translate it. The home is the refuge of man. And if you take that, well, you're banned on the king, sir. Taba mo pe ile la bo si mi uko bin chi so aye wa ipe a shoro ki ori le ide kan ko so pe ki awon ori le ide ohun kon ma wo nu ilu ohun ko si ofin te le se gbogbo ofin le aye lo so pe ko ko 
ni boju mu ki orilede ko ta omo esonu bi o tile je ba koko ta wa yi o je akoko ti o je elege ti o de nira a ni sha isoju se wa fun awon omo orilede wa papa julo awon ton gba ton ma gba ton ma wo oko le wole sugbon kan ta gbe kale re eni keni to wa fe wole lati awon ibode ile ti o wa o lati wa ni ipamu apapa ndodo eleyi o nse self isolation ipamu apapa ndodo ti ijo ma pese ki a to je kon wole ki a to gba won laye aba ijoba ipinle ogun ati ijoba ipinle iku aba won soro tori awon lo awon awon ipinle meji yi ni won ni ibodi ton ma gba wole ijoba ipinle iku o lo ma ku awon to fe wole lodo ohun o ma ku won si ibi ti won ti nura ye jade fun oye ojo ti ijoba kale ojo merinla ijoba ogun o lo won gba won wole won gba ton di odo ijoba ogun o ri pe won o nse omo ipinle o o wa pe o lori ijoba ipinle osun o re ijoba ipinle osun pelu oye ti o ni lori oju se re fun awon omo ipinle osun o gba won o si ko won si ipamo ni ipinle osun ibe ni won ti se gbogbo ayewo ti o fi won yi pe awon ti won ti gbe jade yi won ti ni arun covid 19 yo mo yoba covid 19 ajakale arun ti gbogbo wa nba yi gbogbo won ti ni covid 19 na won pe bi yen se lo ni e to ma le ti le fi won si pa won ton fi won si won le ko arun yi ba ara lu gbogbo o n ti joba ni lo fi n so won ni bi ton wa lo wa ti lese pelu ran lo wa won ajo ta ti gbe kale lati se abewo won ka de ri pe won o ko arun yi ran elomi eni ki la n se si awon ti won ri ton ton mi o fe pe won ni mi o fe pe won ni alagbe awon ti je pe ise ojo nu n se eni ki la n se fun won ko n se ibi ise temi wa lo mo ju to sugbon mo gbo ti oludari eto anu ati ran lowo fun awon ara lu to so fun wa bo n se n se awon eto yi mo de mo yi pe won n soju se won fun awon eyan ti won ma ni ipalara lori bi a se se awon agbegbe kan ni ile nigeria agbegbe bi abuja eko ati ogun abi odun ka so lori eto awon omo eniyan o da mi loju yi pe pupo ninu awon agbofinro wa no soju se won ton de fun awon eniyan ni eto won lori eto ise isede ti are wa pase ti o gba de moju to sugbon a le sha lai ri kudi e kudi e ati awon alaseju olori awon olopa ti ti fi otele ipe olopa ki olopa agbo finro ki agbo finro to ba koja ala lori awon mo nigeria won ma fi mu edorin emi de gba pe eyan ti soro nipa eto awon mo eniyan ti gbo wa mu ni okunkundun The question in English is why should there be returnees or why should there be entry into the nation from the land border? I've said it in Yoruba, I'm just repeating it in English. It's simple. Every citizen of any nation has that right, it's fundamental to return to his fatherland whenever he or she wishes regardless of the situation even at war 
Yes, depending on the characteristics of such a returnee, he could be picked up based on his record and detained. And in this instance, the arrangement made by NCDC and all other agencies involved is to isolate such returnee. We have even signed into an international treaty that says no human being is stateless. We are not even talking about those who are accredited nationals of Nigeria. We are saying by our own admission and commitment, we do not believe any human being is stateless. So those who either to were referred to as stateless citizens or state, stateless personalities are no longer even so uh, identified or recognized in Nigeria. Every human being must be from a nation. If that is the case, it's difficult for us to abdicate our responsibility to our nationals who return by land border. So when they get to our land borders, what the accredited officials of state, immigration officials in this instance, what they do is to first of all determine that they are Nigerians. From their travel document, from, from, their, from their physical appearance, and from their claims. Once the issue of their citizenship is determined, governments are contacted, particularly at the border level, to find out if they could accommodate them in their isolation centers. So I am here advising all governments, all the subnational authorities at the land border area of Nigeria to rapidly develop capacity to accommodate and isolate this type of people, which also was done in this instance by the government of Ogun and the government of Lagos. Lagos accommodated about less than 20 of such returnees who are students in Benin Republic. Lagos accommodated them in an isolation center. And I want to believe, because we've not had anything from that center, there has not been any challenge from there. But Ogun government took charge of those from Abidjan who are largely from Ejibu. Acquired them for a while and contacted their home governor or government. And that was how they were moved under cover and protection to an isolation center in Oshun. And that it's from there that the discoveries we are reading about came from. And if, I mean, appropriate action has been taken to ensure that they do not interact with any of the citizens who are not suspected of having the virus. So, in compliance with international treaty and law, we cannot deny our citizens entry to our nation. If you do that, it will be embarrassing, and it will not speak well of our nation. And I want to even assume that the press will be the force to antagonize us. So, but appropriate, appropriate guideline, I must not fail to have this, appropriate guideline will be issued by the PTF on the modalities of having returnees here, not just keeping them in isolation for a period of time, which will be 14 days. They might have to be responsible for some few things that will have to accompany it. On this, I submit. I thank you. Honorable Minister of Humanitarian Affairs, Disaster Management and Social Development, followed by the Honorable Minister of Environment. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, distinguished colleagues, uh, members of the media. Uh, let me start uh, with the first question on why we did not um, why we did disbursements uh, where we have a lot of crowd. 
Well, some of these things are very inevitable. Uh, we tried as much as possible to see that uh, we take into consideration the social distancing uh, uh, policy. If you, if you watch that video, if, or if you were there, you see that uh, the people that were brought in to start to do the disbursement, so they, they were spaced. They were spaced. But people outside that might not be even the beneficiaries decided to be there uh, to be onlookers. And I want to say here that uh, this stay-at-home um, policy that, that, that I was uh, given, when I went to Kuali yesterday, most people were just moving about doing their normal businesses. Uh, so, Mr. Chairman, I think this is the point where we really have to uh, enforce this uh, stay-at-home uh, you know, directive. Many people did not even, it didn't look like they, they are aware that there's this uh, stay-at-home uh, uh, policy. So, there, there are issues that we really, uh, scenarios that we really cannot uh, you know, avoid. But henceforth, we we'll try to see how we put in measures uh, to to avert that. And the question around how many people we have in the social register or how many people we are capturing in the cash transfer, uh, this is a program that has been on for four years. It has been there since 2016. And the, the national register as we have, the national social register as at 1st March 2020, is made up of over of 11 million 45,537 poor and vulnerable uh, people in 35 states and 453 local government areas uh, across the country. I think I have given that uh, statistics um, earlier on in, in this uh, briefing. And uh, now currently what we have, what we are, uh, what the beneficiaries that, that we, we give this cash transfer to are 2.6 million people. In FCT we have 5,982 households. In Nasarawa State we have 8,271 households. Casina has 6,723 households. And Anambra State have uh, 1,357 households. And the household composition by, uh, by the uh, general standard is six persons uh, per household. We are thinking of expanding the, the register. We are in talks with the UN Social Protection Donor Group uh, to see how the register can be rapidly expanded uh, to cover additional 1 million uh, households. But we have 11.4 uh, million uh, households in the register that are ready for, for this uh, intervention. And uh, the way these people are captured really is by uh, community engagement. Uh, we go into the community, uh, we reach to the community leaders, the opinion leaders in that community, religious leaders, they are the ones that decide which uh, family falls within that uh, category of poor and vulnerable household. And that is what we use. So there's really transparency and accountability uh, in this regards. Um, this is what I uh, can say on that. Uh, I think these are the questions raised, but let me use this opportunity to also please appeal to, the, to, the, to, to our citizens uh, to really desist from you know, spreading this uh, fake and very malicious uh, uh, news around. Yesterday, we, we just started the, 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 the program of this uh, cash transfer. And as I mentioned earlier, we have different states with, their, with the numbers and all over the country. No section of this country is going to be marginalized. This, this is a national program. It is a, irrespective of uh, religion or political affiliation. It's a program that has been on. Nobody is going to be shortchanged. Let us be nationalistic in these very trying moments of our lives. You know, everybody is committed to this work. 
So please, everyone should contribute his own quota in seeing that we're able to go to uh, get through this, 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 this pandemic that we're all in. Thank you very much. Honorable Minister of Environment. Uh, the question as to whether other cities and villages will be decontaminated, disinfected, even though it was asked in Hausa, I will just answer and then just say a word or two in Hausa. Um, well, as I said yesterday, we are looking at the situation, we'll assess and analyze. And yesterday I said danger prone zones are the places where we started, where there is a prevalence of a lot of people or prevalence of the disease. The infection like Lagos, Abuja disinfection is ongoing because we have more cases uh, in these areas. Uh, we are reviewing, watching the situation. We are hoping we don't need to uh, disinfect or decontaminate all the cities and villages because that means then we have a lot of infection everywhere. So that's not the case. We will be watching and uh, where we need to, we will go and do that. Tambay and Akai Dazun Shine commands the end of AKP Shi Anang Abuja, Ko Hakazai Asaudan Brani, the Karakara, Awadan Sugurari, Tambay and the Gakadunani To. Among the Miki Pata Shine, Karala came look at Chendaza Ache, Semun Peshi, Kowani, Bruni, Kokuma, Kowanakawe. In Haka Pariki and Kamunku in other Akochu Turkin, it on the Chutang, Imba Ankaita Guriba. Ko wani da yake da shi a wani guri ya je can ko wani daga can ya je ya dauka ya kai ba yawo take yi a iska na tsawon lokaci da za ta je daga wani gari zuwa wani gari ba saboda haka muna sa ido muna dubawa in bukata ta taso na aife shi a wani guri za a yi saboda haka masu tambaya daga Kaduna shine idan har wannan bukatan ta taso ina tabbatar muku zamu duro gurin nan zamu feshe wurin amma ba ma fatan haka ya kasance muna da sa ido Magani, Mese Kasanching, and Laeda. Now, good. The National Coordinator. Thank you. I, I believe I, I had um, two questions. The first one has to do with um, how far do you travel to, um, to get food? Well, uh, we expect people to be sensible. You're not going to traverse the whole of the FCT just in order to to go and buy um, a yam in, in, a, in, a, in a market. So the purpose of the lockdown is to ensure that people stay at home and keep safe distances so that we can interrupt the transmission of the virus. That's why we are allowing neighborhood markets to open and we are allowing the big shops and malls to open, but for shorter periods of time. We don't expect people to travel long distances in order to obtain food. We expect that there will be markets that will sell food or shops that will sell food, groceries, etc., close to them. Um, I would like to appeal to the public because this is a joint effort. It's not just government alone. It's a joint effort unless we come together and own this as a responsibility, we will not be able to get on top of the epidemic. So please cooperate with us. At the same time, we are also appealing to the security agencies to understand both the restrictions as well as the exemptions that we have put um, in terms of the lockdown. Uh, the second question had to do with handling of funds. I believe I have already answered this question yesterday. The private sector has a separate fund which is um, run through the Coalition Against Coronavirus Disease. That's where you get most of the announcements. This person has given a billion, this person has given, etc. And this is a separate account. It has nothing to do with government. And the money will not come to government. We appreciate the effort of the private sector in helping us, and they will be providing us with commodities. But the money that they are currently um, collecting will not come to government. It's a separate bank account. There's also a separate account run through the UN system that involves engagement with other UN agencies as well as international donors. They are running that fund separately and they will do their own procurement process separately. The government um, accounts will continue to run in line with normal governance processes and transparency. 
but we will not be mixing funds together and we have nothing to do with the money that is being collected by the private sector. Thank you. The chairman, PTF. I, I, I think, let me add my voice to the issues of donations so that we can put pay uh, to the entire issues. Uh, let me inform the nation that so far the presidential task force has not received any donation directly in terms of cash uh, for this exercise. We have received donation of material, particularly the ones that came from Jack Ma, the Chinese billionaire. And that has adequately been distributed by the Nigeria Center for Disease Control. Uh, in terms of monetary contribution, the national coordinator has just informed you. There are different organizations and individuals that are pioneering their own efforts. So far, I know of four different efforts. The first is the one that is being driven by the central bank and the corporate organizations, jointly being handled by the governor of the central bank, and Alaji Ali Kodangote. They have spoken to the press. I want to make a copy of the press release that was done by the governor of the central bank in Lagos about a week ago, where they outlined how they will raise their funds, the committees that they have established, starting with the steering committee, which they have invited me to chair. They have a funding committee, they have an operation committee, and they have a technical committee. They are going to run, fund, execute projects, buy equipment, all in furtherance of fighting the coronavirus. At the end of their exercise, they have explained in their document that they would appoint an accounting firm that would undertake an audit of their exercise and make a report to the donors for the purposes of accountability and transparency. Government does not have control of those funds. The presidential task force does not have control of those funds. The second effort is the one initiated by the NMPC, which involves players in the upstream, the middle stream, and the downstream levels of the oil and gas industry. They also have their own processes. They have their governance culture and rules. They will raise their funds. They will liaise with the PTF in the same manner that the central bank and the corporate world initiative is liaising with us. They will ask for locations. They will ask for the list of equipment. We will supply them. They will raise their funds. They will administer their funds. And at the end of the day, they will render accounts to the people that have donated to this particular enterprise. Government does not have control of this particular endeavor. The third is the one that is being driven by the United Nations family. We do not have control over it. They will raise their funds from their home governments, from their donor agencies and partners, they will decide, based on our needs assessment, the kind of equipment, the kind of capacity building, the kind of products and facilities that we require. They would administer their funds, they would account to their donors, so government does not have control over that. The fourth source of funding is what government will put into the coronavirus engagement. I have just received a letter from the Accountant General informing us of the account that has just been opened yesterday. 
So obviously no funds have gone into any account. Hopefully in the coming days, we will receive funding for the work of the Presidential Task Force in terms of the different components of the multilateral or multi-sectoral engagement. That is the one that government would have control over, and at the end of the enterprise, we would account for it. So I want clarity on this so that we don't come back to this question again as to what funds have been received and what is the account. The three first sources I explained are quite distinct. They are operating on their own. We do not have control over it. All we do is to provide them with our needs and our requirements. They procure through their pro pro procurement processes. And most of the major companies that are involved have got their own governance culture. They've got their own procurement processes that is not subjected to the procurement process of government. So I hope that is very, very clear now. Tomorrow we should not have a question as to which account has been opened, who is controlling it, and where have the funds gone. I took this length of time to elaborate on it so that we have clarity. We have control over only one account, and the account was only opened yesterday. I got the letter today. Obviously, no transaction has taken place in respect of that account. Somebody asked a question with regards to uh, the problem that the, uh, we are having in the power sector. Even before COVID-19, we've had some epileptic supply of power. And that is attributable to so many factors within the power network system. One is an inadequate supply of gas to power the turbines. Two, there has been a major challenge as to whether the discourse are able to lift and distribute adequately to the people. There have been any issues of even tariff. If you remember very, very clearly, just a couple of days ago, the Nigerian Electricity Regulatory Commission had to suspend the issue of tariff. That has been a constant battle in the last couple of years as to whether our tariff regime is adequate enough and feasible for implementation right now, considering other costs that are related to the power system. So it is not COVID-19 that is creating that problem. We have had the problem before we got where we are. But you remember yesterday, I did say in my statement that the president had to even grant an exemption to allow for movement of the upstream sector of our power and gas, I mean power, power and gas system, so that production can continue to, be, to enable us supply gas to these uh, uh, stations for them to power the turbines so that there is adequate supply of electricity even in the midst of the lockdown. I know there are a lot of inconveniences, but our appeal to Nigerians is that we are confronted with so many challenges at the same time, and we need to bear. I know the spirit of every Nigerian is a resilient spirit. It's a very strong spirit of endurance. My appeal to our countrymen and women is that we should continue to be patient and endure for this just short while of period while we get out of the woods. The issue of uh, relaxation of the lockdown, I think it was uh, the NTH app that asked that. I don't think the protocol we provided yesterday has relaxed anything. As a matter of fact, it has further reinforced the restrictions that have been put in place. And according to Mr. President in his broadcast, he's quite categorical about these restrictions. And that is why he signed the quarantine declaration, describing that there will be cessation of movement in these three locations within a period of 14 days. It's very clear. All we try to do was to provide for the exceptions with clarity because of the feedback we got that even some of you that were exempted clearly as members of the 
uh, media or the information uh, and telecommunication family had difficulties getting to your places of work. So we wanted to bring some clarity to it. Things are restrictions that have been put in place by the governor of Lagos, by the governor of Ogun, and by the minister of the Federal Capital Territory remain in place. The markets we were referring to are the satellite markets or the neighborhood markets. Even that, we are further restricting the operations of those markets. We are saying that the markets cannot operate seven days a week. We are asking that they be restricted even in their operations to every other day and within a particular segment of the day from 10 to, I think, 2 p.m. Four hours of operation should be enough because those markets are supposed to serve the purposes of the purchase of foodstuff and grocery. You don't need more than four hours to walk to a neighborhood market. All the neighborhoods in this state, I mean in FCT and most of our states, are within walking distances of the residences of the people that live within that particular community. So I believe what we have done by the protocol that we have, re uh, we have, we have, we have released yesterday and upon which we are improving to release a final copy probably today or tomorrow, it is to further reinforce the positions of the two governors of Ogun and Lagos State and that of the Minister for the Federal Capital Territory. Uh, the last one I want to take is the issue of the National Grants Reserve. Uh, the question came in Hausa, but let me explain in English, then I will answer it in Hausa. Mr. President, very categorically in paragraph 49 of his speech, said that he acknowledges the pains of the communities, the satellite communities in these three locations, and that everything will be done to ameliorate those hardships and pains by way of giving them support. And the first step he has taken is to authorize that from our strategic grains of food reserve, which is held by the federal government to be used in terms of national disasters like this, a certain portion of it be released. And yesterday I was very, very clear that we are starting with the three states, two states and federal capital that have officially been prescribed in terms of restrictions of movement. About 6,000 tons will go to them. But he has approved on a blanket because we have to extend this to some frontline states in addition in a, a total of 70,000 tons of different grains from maize, sorghum, gari, wheat, uh, millet. These are the, 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 the current things that are held in the National Strategic Grains Reserve. It is from there we will take to make sure that a cushion is provided for the people that have already been segregated by the Ministry for Humanitarian Affairs and in direct relation to the activities of NEMA. We already have a system. They already know the households. They already have a certain percentages of their calculation as to the portions or rations that should go to different families. So these things are all worked out. They are scientifically based and they are worked out. And once they begin to deploy, you will have evidence of that deployment in first the three locations and thereafter to some front lines. Thank you. Ah, I forgot about Hausa. Uh, uh, well, Tambenda Akeshini Akanchewa Shugabankasa Ya Bada Izini Ayampani the ton dubu sabain na kaya abinchi gaskiya ne haka ne shugaban kasa ya ba da umurni ya ba da kuma zarafi akan cewa tabbatar an raba ba mutane talakawa wadannan abincin amma za mu fara da Lagos da Ogun da Abuja bayan shi kuma akwai wadansu juhohi wadanda ake ce da su frontline state za a je kansu na tabbatar nan 
ba da ba ba dan an ci gaba in wannan an ba liya din ya ci gaba a kasar nan kusan kowace jiha za ta samu wannan guduma wannan abin shine wanda gwamnati take tsaya ta ajiye don irin wannan lokaci dan an samu an ba liya irin wannan gwamnati sai ta fito da wadannan kayan abinci don a taimaka wa talakawa da da ta bai a tsakanin mu su samu abin da za su ci ba wai zai biya bukata ba amma taimako ne wanda take zuwa daga hannun gwamnati don a tabbatar mutane ba su wahala sosai ba na gode thank you very much we now go into the second wave of um, questions we we have seven persons lined up and they will take the questions please make your questions very compact not more than two at a time thank you my name is mohammed saliu nazif i work for voice of nigeria specifically full full day service uh, i wish i could ask the question in full full day considering this uh, briefings today that uh, reflects the diversity of our country which is beautiful uh, mr chairman members of the tax force my colleagues i want to ask a question one or two or three if time permits my first question is what is government doing especially federal government in reaching out to nomadic flanis who are in various bush and forest and i ask this question because these people or this category of people they are borderless and we always hear that uh, considering the vast nature of our border is difficult for our personnel to man the border 247 we don't know what is happening at the other side of our border whether the uh, measures is like our measures so i'm asking this question is there anything government is doing towards reaching out to these people because they move with their animals they don't stay in one place they cross border and come back and go in and they would potent a potential danger and even reduced the limit of effort government is making in containing this uh, virus uh, second question is as the number increases instead of decreasing i pray the number will decrease what happened after 14 days is government considering extension of the lockdown and restriction movement and the third one is earlier uh, the issue of uh, allowing the local businesses at the community level to operate is fantastic but there is a price hike people are exploiting as i'm talking to you now if you go there things that used to be 100 naira is 200 250 is there anything government doing either through the ministry of information to reach out these people to see that they bring this in. because where they are getting those things the price remains the same but once they take it to the community level they tell you it's covid 19 covid 19 kind of making jest of the buyers thank you ahambo chinedum chimezia radio nigeria abuja ajun we do to or to tunde maduna lanye ha na atu jodi egu maka ori abu corona virus no zo si amuba wobot na lanye brozie chibo anu ozo ni nka ha toro iga mennyocha maka imata ma hanwere ya bo ori ajo na akpo corona virus mana so bu ha bu amayo oge ba gaga menka ha to mari ndi mmadi binimi mo bodanye ajo ha webro si otu awede no de okenpa itinye nkwa ndi aho eji emenyocha ni me state ni ile na lanye to mari no ge olu aho ike ni ile de na ime council obodanye ha ni na odi mma ka atwa nwo nwo ewoji ngbechi eji be na ka chiji oganye sobu nde wonu who is answering your question oni Onye DG, NCDC, Agent Nakon, one of the 
Oruko temeni ojo Suleiman lati le se radio Nigeria Abuja ibe mi lo sodo ogbe ni Rauf Aregbesola an pe ologi lowe orun la ronu ebi si wo nu koro mi owo a fun wa ni na wa fun ron owo awon to wa ni igbere ko tori mi start to wa fun tojo mo ni so le kan wi pe won ti se to bi won se fe pin kini ohun daddy mi wa ninu ogbo ni gbo ninu reserve ona wo ni kini o gbadodo won ati pe kini le ti won tori pe won o se pe an gba we on today when you come on let's see The chairman of COVID-19. My name is Adini Ibakari. I work with Radio Nigeria. The first question I ask, I'm going to ask is going to the DG NCDC. The question that is on the Twitter and a lot of agitation is, do we have enough equipment and manpower to respond to COVID-19 cases in the country. Number two, the chairman has responded to this partly on the issue of 70,000 metric tons of grains. When is it going to start? Thank you. Good afternoon, sirs. My name is Juliana Taiwa Baloye. I write for the Sun newspapers. This question is for the NCDC DG. Uh, we just got a press uh, statement from the Aquaibom State Government. They are disputing that there's no uh, COVID-19 uh, cases in Aquaibom. They allege that there were irregularities in testing and, re and in testing and reporting procedure and the healthcare professionals in the state have been called to reconfirm the test to be done. So you might want to uh, ask, answer that. And to the SGF, sir, um, we on, another development, the, the lockdown has turned ugly, according to reports in Delta State. A young man has been killed on his way to pick his dad to the hospital. I don't know if you are aware of that. And Nasarawa State Government has also imposed 24-hour curfew. How come government and the subnational level seems to be working at cross purposes? Maybe you might want to reassure Nigerians or clarify. Thank you. Good afternoon, sirs. Good afternoon, my colleague Rachel from the News Agency of Nigeria. My question is for NCDC. Uh, DG, I would like to know um, the modalities being used to share the Jackman um, gift for Nigerians to the 36 states. And um, I would also like to know the quality of testing kits that will be going to the seven um, laboratories. And um, from news we heard, um, or your state governor is trying to get testing kits for, for his people that they have shortage. I don't know how um, NCDC will be able to address that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We have come to the end of the second wave of questions. I will now invite the Director General, NCDC, to please respond. Thank you. I'll, I'll respond in reverse order of the questions. Um, the first one was on the uh, donations from Jack, the Jack Ma Foundation. Um, these kits have been distributed. It's been announced here. We actually went further to put up on our website, on our Twitter handle, uh, the exact states that got and what they got. So everything has gone round. None of those things are in Abuja anymore, apart from the uh, lab reagents. So they've gone round, round to every state. Okay, every state government was asked to come and collect their own uh, part of this donation. Uh, so some of them we took to the states, mostly the liaison officers 
here in Abuja collected what was due to every state. So all of them have gone uh, round. In terms of the quality of kits uh, being used in the labs, it's exactly the same reagents that we use in Abuja that are being used in all, every lab we activate. We go there, we activate them if they're ready. So both Ibadan and uh, Abakliki that have just been activated use exactly the same PCR kits that we use here in Abuja. So there's no difference in the quality of uh, reagents being distributed to every, every new lab. Um, a lot of governors are very anxious about uh, new labs. Uh, but the honest truth is you can't build a new lab overnight. And the equivalent, the example I like to give is a power plant. It, it takes time. So right now we have a process to get samples to the network of labs. We're increasing the network every day, so making the distance shorter. So the key thing is not do I have a lab or not. The key thing is can my samples be tested or not? And that is the second question that we are answering. You can see that we have uh, cases confirmed in 15 states now. We don't have labs in 15 states. So what we do is take those samples to the labs where we have them and make sure we get the results back uh, to the labs as quickly as possible. Um, I just read the press release of uh, my brother, the Honorable Commissioner for Health in Akwaibom State. Um, you know, I, I think it's a, a little bit unfortunate. There was some delay in reporting the results to him because the team that was leads the lab where these results, these tests were um, done, were actually on their way to Abuja to carry out an important national assignment. These tests, and I'll say it publicly, were done in the Irua Specialist Teaching Hospital. This is our oldest and most experienced lab in carrying out PCR diagnosis. So there's really no reason to dispute the validity of these results. Um, we must focus on the challenge at our hands. Every new case in a new state always leads to a little bit of anxiety. And people need time to accept that these results are what they are. Uh, but they are what they are. I have no reason to doubt the results coming out of any of our labs, and especially the Rua Specialist Teaching Hospital. Uh, yes, they'll be tested at a specific time. You know, we, after every positive uh, case, we would retest anyway after three, four days because the only way you can know whether people are recovering or not is by retesting them. So that will be done. But um, I, I think now, and like I have said over and over, and as uh, the chair of the PTF has said, this is not a time to dispute and doubt, especially within government. It is a time to come together. Um, it is not a time to release press statements against other government bodies. It is a time to come together. And so this is really my appeal to every state. Uh, there's no reason why anybody would give results without verifying. We're working very hard to make sure these results are correct. Sometimes we delay in releasing these results and we get a lot of flack. Why are the results taking so long? It's because the test is being repeated so that we can be very sure. But if there's one lab in Nigeria that I can almost be 100% sure on the validity of their tests, of course, there might always be mistakes. But to have mistakes in five results in a lab like Irua will be very unlikely. So I'd like to call on all, everyone across all the states in Nigeria to have confidence in the uh, work that we're doing. And we're not doing this in NCDC. Irua is not an NCDC-owned lab. It's a lab that we support. Uh, and make sure that the testing is done um, appropriately. So uh, back to the first question, which was Adibo. Um, in here, Jeromo, um, test I name, Ile, Mandi, Mada, and we're already in a good mark here. Kehime, Onyo, Lana, he went here. And Kehime, Nauhuna, Obodile, Nobodai, and we came with him in here, Jelima, Mada, and we're already here. I na bali, I na bali sike, kain I me he ulogwa, kame kame eba ane le mama don we oria na uboni ubodo ubodoni le no bodai kama I aga he me we a siteta roechi I ge jimwa yo so eba na me he ya kai ubi royala na eba ha one me ho kashire me so biko we nundi di kai jimwa yo rupo tata ulo. 
Why on why on? Go rob on your blood. But you hear them, but a Bob Limer, I let it, I let it, I'm a tester. Cahon emetry of my. I won't hear any like an emotion, so I get Jim Why on my. Can I make a roller? Ulo, shake Thank you very much. Thank you. We will take the Minister of Interior and um, the Chairman PTF will round up. Thank you. Onti Anagba Tiwala Tiridu Nigeria Bere Nipe Bawo ni Kile Kile to Tan Shifan Motowa ni Ibiriko Go to the King Solid you by the way, Kila and Shifa to an Ibiriko. O Ludari Le Sha Jobatu Afun I told you and we know a tea to anu ni by shuru. Also, I will pay one tin a cosile bubu and one tio could dear car to fun, no related in Nigeria. On token, oh, there, oh, there, car on, you can let a tia mo ye a bully tin one tea to a new a college. Call your party to the people who can cut on a bacoco. Taba lossy. Website, he lay shed Timon soy, a Maria, a pinle in bed at your own, too late to art, too late to form at your own old job. Could see be a coco shilly near at all? Kiamani, but here at Mandrawan, only convert to move a coffee corner. It did you bounty and ya yellow co be a more joy in you. And Jaye Loko be a one you do ye ni Uri or Kere Uri a Paru Coco Lori yon tail of fun and Jaye Loko be a one you do ye ni Toba di Piara Buleo Valley Jemo while I do to Alice of Pay Angbo 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 to Tia Jacale Anuji Kawaba be you pay Ara Okolo Moon Jewale. Oni bafungwa da nile, oni bafungwa da loko. Ti abara bure di lo fungwa da loko. Bada oni mu isu wale o. So, owa o ya mile nu ipe, awara bure no tin so ipe, ti jopo baron on lo. Oni ni jen. E jo, afen fi a koko yusof kuba wanyan wa ipe, isi agbe ni she le wa o. Ma jade, ma jade. Ko niki en to fe lo so ko ma lo so ko. Are wa so fun wa ipe. Ise de ji o ko mu a on to se se a gbe o. Tori a le wa fe bi para wa. Tori pe an sa fun du kuluku. Mo be wa mo de ro wa o. A on to wa ni ibe riko. En to du ko ebe wa ni nu a ko le fun a on to fe yon lo wo do ba. Ton de, ton de ne e to a ti ba. On m'a dit, 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 on I now invite the chairman of the PTF to respond. Well, the first question here that I took note of is what is government doing about the Fulanis who cross borders? Well, uh, that, that, that's, that, that, uh, that, 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 that is a very, very serious issue uh, because as they move around, they, uh, sometimes they, uh, they go in search of pastures across borders. Uh, it's a major challenge. Uh, we will look at that and uh, begin to address it. But that also comes to one fundamental issue that has been a very, very topical issue in the last one or two years as we, to whether we needed to 
make provision of land in our constituencies so that we can domesticate this nomadic posture from one issue is dovetailed into different issues. I, I know that there is currently an ongoing initiative which has been uh, the, uh, driven by the Office of the Vice President, the National Livestock Transformation uh, Program. Uh, and some states have subscribed to that program where they would commit some certain hectares of land in their constituencies for the creation of reserves where facilities will be provided for these nomadic families to reside within a contained area. If we eventually get that done, this kind of issues will not arise. So as a nation, we must be holistic in our approach going forward so that we can cater for each and every one. I acknowledge that, yes, as long as they cross borders, uh, uh, they create a problem for tracking, for infection, uh, because our neighboring countries are not isolated from this pandemic right now. The reports we are getting uh, is that uh, uh, some of the infections that have surfaced, not confirmed though, uh, uh, from uh, aqua ibom and uh, some of the ones that might begin to show uh, across the eastern flank would be as a result of people crossing just on foot across from other borders into our domain. Uh, the Minister for Interior will be looking at that to see how we can enforce those closures on the land borders uh, through the established designated outlets and also the porous areas that we have not been able to cover uh, uh, with uh, facilities to restrict movement across the borders. You know, we come from a long history of uh, relationship with our neighbors that have shifted over the years, either through legislation or through court judgments. Uh, that has made substantially a long stretch of our borders to be porous and communities live across each other. Uh, that is an accident of history that we must live with but we must find solutions for that. The other question is the issue of what is government doing about profiteering? Government cannot do anything about profiteering. And that is a negative spirit that we have as a people, that in the midst of crisis, we want to maximize our profit. I know that we have this compassion or compassion Net, uh, spirit as Nigerians. But sometimes we also have this exploitative spirit that we take advantage of crisis in order to maximize our profit. But the Nigerian person, as an individual, has this compassion to care for his brother or his sister. But when it comes to business, the exploitative spirit too manifests itself like coronavirus manifests itself. So uh, there's nothing government can do about it. I remember during the times of Ebola, there was Ebola price. During the times of uh, uh, polio, they have a way, uh, the local traders, the local businessmen have a way. But I think we are only appealing to their conscience that this is not the time for exploitation. This is the time for us to show compassion. If it is not going to affect your profit so much, you can even reduce the price like government is doing with petroleum products. We came from 145 
to one, uh, was it 25 or thereabout? We've come down to 123. So government is, is, is doing its bit. Is doing its bit in this regard to ensure that at least as the prices are falling internationally, correspondently, instead of government to maintain its earlier position, it has decided to drop so that it can really soften the effects of the hardships that Nigerians are being confronted with. So my appeal is that we must be compassionate, we must be our brother's keepers, that this is not time for exploitation. It is a time of giving so that we can collectively be able to survive this current situation. Uh, the other question has to do with uh, governments in different states uh, putting up restrictions, some imposing curfew and the rest of it. For now, the president in his wisdom decided to test run the effect of the uh, 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 the, 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 the restriction of uh, movement in three locations. But you also have to concede to the fact that subnationals, by the effect of the Quarantine Act, also have responsibilities. And I know that some state governors had convened their state's House of Assemblies and have gotten them to allow them to sign the same declaration that Mr. President did. So the state governors imposing certain restrictions under the law have the right to do that. I won't question why they decide to impose coffee because it is within their uh, prerogative to do that as governors of their states. They must have taken so many things into consideration. Probably nightlife in those states is the height of mingling of persons, and they feel strongly that if they can just impose a curfew so that they slow down their populations, because it is the moving around and mixing that would accelerate community transmission. If we can just slow down and allow the officials of the Center for Disease Control and other health agencies move in and track and trace and perform tests, we will be able to condemn this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, before we close this um, national briefing, I just wish to inform you, especially those watching us and listening to us from home, that uh, we have been supported by NAPTIP, that provided the sign language, and we have been reaching you in English, Hausa, Igbo, Yoruba, Fufude, French, and Arabic. On the, channel, on the platforms of the following stations, the NTA, the FRCN, Voice of Nigeria, Channels, AIT, TVC, Arise TV, and Kaduna Network Center for House and Listeners, as well as the News Agency of Nigeria. We thank you very much for sharing this time with us, and we look forward to joining you again tomorrow at 2 p.m. Thank you.
Hello and welcome to Nationwide. We are live in Abuja on the network service of the NTA. I'm Hawa Salihu Adama. This will be an abridged version and we are sorry we are reaching you late today. We start with the update on the ravaging coronavirus pandemic in Nigeria. The number of COVID-19 cases as at today stands at 174 following 23 new diagnoses in the country. Latest figures reveal that of the 23 new diagnoses, nine are in Lagos, seven in the FCT, five in Aquaibom, one in Kaduna, and one in Bauchi State. We will now be joining Mitaire Ikben, who's standing by at the conference Hall of the Secretary of the Office of the Secretary to the Government of the Federation. Mitai Ray, if you can hear me, could you take us through the major highlights of today's briefing? Thank you, Hawa. One of the uh, highlights of the briefing by the Presidential Task Force today is the fact that uh, the personal protective equipment received from China, such as uh, face masks and others are not contaminated with the coronavirus. Minister of Information and Culture, Lai Mohammed, uh, gave this clarification against uh, the background of rumors making the rounds that such uh, personal protective equipment are contaminated. Also, the chairman of the presidential task force and secretary to government of the federation, Boss Mustafa, made it clear that the task force has not received any funds and will not receive any funds from uh, private donors. It says that it only receives commodities and personal protective equipment from private donors. Those were some of the highlights of today's briefing. I posed a question uh, moments ago during the briefing, especially as, as it has to do with the four-hour window for shopping. It will seem as if a lot of uh, residents in the affected states are taking uh, or put, are, are using opportunity of the four hour window to flood the metropolis. For those who missed uh, the clarification by the task force on that, I have now joining me uh, the national coordinator of the presidential task force, Dr. Sani Aliu, who will give uh, this clarification again for the benefit of our viewers. Dr. Sani Aliu, uh, when, we, when, when we talk about the four hour, does this infer that all uh, residents in the affected states can go around, traverse long distances, or flood the metropolis? Uh, not at all. So let me start first of all by saying state, uh, the various states, i.e. Lagos, for instance, and Ogun, can set up their own restrictions. This is advice from the federal government as far as we are concerned for Lagos and Ogun. But for the FCT, it will stand. And the clarification I wanted to make is that when we say markets will be opened, we mean neighborhood markets, i.e. the satellite markets, the markets that are close to you. We do not mean the main markets uh, because we need to make sure that we restrict um, mass gatherings and also make sure that um, social distancing is maintained. You talk about the four hour window. The four hour window actually refers to the shops and malls, the bigger shops and malls. Um, whereas for the market, uh, we said 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., if you remember. But the markets, yes, to, to 4 p.m., but the markets will not open every day. They will open on alternate day, and there will be restrictions on how many people are able to get in at any one time to maintain that social distancing. And we would also expect that local authorities working with the market associations will design their own system to make sure that there's hand hygiene, for instance, available, uh, to make sure that there's some form of checking or monitoring of um, symptoms. But even more importantly, only people that sell food and perishable items related to food and pharmaceuticals will be allowed to operate in those markets. I would like to emphasize that the task force will continue to review these, um, this guidance that we'll be putting out. It will be published online. It will be um, advertised on TV and radio as well so that people know. 
but we will continue to review it because it, it's in our best interest to make sure that the restrictions that are in place work. And if it looks like they are not working, we will change them, we will enforce them. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. So, so that's it from here, it's back to you, Hawa, in the studio. Thanks for the update, Mitairi. Moving on, meanwhile, as Nigeria sustained efforts towards containing the coronavirus pandemic, President Muhammadu Buhari insists that value be retained within the economy while the poor and the vulnerable remain protected. The president gave the order at a strategic engagement with the presidential committee addressing the impact of COVID-19 on the nation's economy. State House correspondent Adam Musambo has more. President Muhammad Buhari and members of the committee headed by the Minister of Finance, Budget and National Planning, Zainab Ahmed, analyzed the COVID-19 crisis on the economy, the various intervention measures introduced by government, as well as further steps to be taken in the best interests of Nigeria and Nigerians. Speaking to NTA News after the closed-door meeting, Finance Minister Zainab Ahmed said, Discussions also centered on the negative consequences of the lockdown on the economy, especially small businesses, and what needs to be done to mitigate such. His directive is make sure salaries are paid, make sure critical infrastructure uh, projects like roads, rails um, are, are protected. As much as possible, use local inputs so that we uh, we retain value within within our economy, and also make sure that you have measures that protect the poor and the vulnerable. The Minister of State for Petroleum Resources, Timipri Silva, said President Buhari also engaged the committee members on the situation in the global oil market as a result of the coronavirus pandemic. But, uh, the economy is not in the best of shapes uh, due to COVID-19. Oil prices are also collapsing every day. Uh, so we need to be on top of it uh, and uh, to prove Mr. President regularly. What have you suggested to him? I can't say that. <laughs> we are still, the discussions are still ongoing, so we can't really uh, say where we are now. You know, it's a developing situation. We live here now, oil prices will be different from where we left it when we were outside. So we can't really say exactly uh, what we are discussing now, because it's uh, something where we need to be updating regularly. So what was his response? Of course, uh, he has given us his directives. I mean, he has looked at what we, we have uh, told him, and he has also given us uh, some direction on how to carry on. It's not looking as easy as everybody thought it would be. Um, the global economy, not naturally like we all know at this time, will certainly suffer some very serious growth problems that may even lead to recession globally. So what we want to do is to see what can we do as a country um, to rescue our own situation so we don't go the direction many will go. It's not going to be easy, but we can only just assure our people that we are on top of it and that we'll resolve it and Nigerians will still be better for it. At the instance of the president, the Zainab Ahmed Committee continued its strategic engagement with the Presidential Committee on Economic Sustainability led by Vice President Yemi Oshibaju. From the State House, Adamu Sambu, NTA News. Today is the three of the restriction order issued by the federal government as part of efforts to curb the spread of coronavirus in the country. Oyeyemi Ajayi from different locations brings us up to speed on the level of compliance. Now I'm in front of the uh, shop right area of Apple here and looking at the level of compliance, uh, the police seem to be blocking the road uh, due to the fact that they, they have claimed that many people tend to cut uh, with different ID cards and tend to pass and this is to them not acceptable. As you can see beside me here, some people trekking have actually been told to, to sit down and kneel down by the police. We are working here. Sit down here. Behind me here is the popular fish market at Apple and as you can see there's a catchy activities going on here basically for those that have uh, actually having uh, food items to sell. This is in line with the exemption given by the president talking about food items in order to allow people buy and sell. But aside these other, those that are also selling things that are not uh, of um, edible items are not opened at the moment. Many shops here are not opened. I'm going to talk to my So go and do what? I'm, I'm, I'm going. 
They just pick this. Why you? Why you using that madam as an excuse? Give me your key. So, but she can't. But she can't. She can't. Give me your key. Give, give, give me the key. They say people should stay at home. You can't go over. Don't do motor. You don't even have license. They go market. The police are not the only ones enforcing the restriction order, as the men of the. NSCDC, the VIO, even the Federal Road Safety Corps, talking about FRSC, were seen at the Berger and Area 1 locations doing so. I could see that uh, people are complying, especially as it relates to where I have covered, I could see that uh, very scanty vehicles on the road and the movement. And the uh, few people that are on the road are actually essential. We shall not relent until uh, the pandemic is over. Men of the Abuja Environmental Protection Board, APB, were seen on the road working with some of them sweeping, while others were seen actually carrying refuse in order to ensure cleanliness in the FCT. In Abuja, Oye Yemi Ajayi, NTA News. No doubt, Abuja is still officially in lockdown mode. And indeed, we have been monitoring activities here since it came into effect with reports indicating a significant level of compliance. Earlier today, we got reports that the Nyanya Kubo axis of the Abuja suburb witnessed some holdup resulting to traffic violations. Ruth Aguele now joins us live from somewhere in the central business district of the FCT. Hello, Ruth. Is there any significant event you came across while monitoring activities within the city center so far? Um, thank you very much, Hawa. Well, I don't know what you call this one, um, if it's significant or insignificant, because right now we are at the business, central business district here in the federal capital territory. And this, if you're familiar with this road in the FCT, this is one of the most busiest roads. But few cars we see plying the roads. And what beats my imagination is the fact that there is a security um, vehicle just directly opposite me. I don't know if the cameraman can get that for us, but they seem not to be stopping these vehicles plying the roads. Now, we don't know if some of these vehicles are essential workers as directed that they should be free to move around. And then I've also noticed some persons taking a stroll around this road, which is quite unusual. I even noticed two persons jogging on the same road, just by this CBN building there. They were coming from the other end, and directly opposite is the Women Development um, Center. But how are, uh, yeah, how are? Uh, I can hear you, Ruth, go on. Okay, okay. I'm just wondering, now, you said you saw some few people jogging and all that. What's happening to the law enforcement agents? Are they not visibly on, on present there? That's what I was trying to, um, you know, trying to understand because they're just packed directly opposite where we are here. But they're not stopping anybody from moving. They're not stopping the vehicles from going around. And you just wonder then why are they positioned there? And then I tried to talk to some of the persons I saw taking a jog and she said, well, this is something she doesn't really do often, but because the roads are free, that's why she can freely do it. And nobody's stopping her from moving around. Now the directive power we know that is for people to stay home. So I'm wondering if the people are asked to stay home and shops are locked, malls are locked, because on our way to this place, we went around town, we even went to Wuse too. A lot of um, people, you know, were seen moving around that, we we'll say, um, two areas. So you okay, okay, Ruth, exactly. considering what you found on ground, does it help drive home the point of what we are up against? I don't think so, Howard, because if people are meant to stay at home, then the directive should be stay at home. But yes, if people are coming out to go get some few valuables, like food items, then it, should be, it shouldn't be a constant thing of, you know, because we've been out here for about one and a half hour. We've been going around the town and you, it's like a normal, they do the roads are a bit um, empty, few vehicles, but it's still like a public holiday, so to say. Thank, thank but, you very much, Ruth. I guess that would be food for thought for the security agents in charge. Now, we do know that efforts are ongoing to flatten the curve in the incident rate of the COVID-19 in Nigeria. As these efforts intensify and culminate in more restrictions, focus is rapidly shifting to how individuals and families are managing time and their mental health. 
while taking shelter in place. Professor Andrew Zamani is a clinical psychologist and joins us now in the studio to discuss the issue. You're welcome to Nationwide. Thank you. Prof, the state of mind of an average Nigerian at this point in time is one that drifts from fear to boredom and, again, anxiety. How can that be managed to make for healthy, healthy mental health? Well, first, um, I'm glad to be here and to make a contribution. Uh, the truth is that we are up against a very serious challenge and all of us have to uh, put our minds together, uh, put our heads together to deal with the problem. Um, I would want our citizens not to um, see the, the lockdown mm. as punishment by government, but as a necessary step to curb the spread of the disease. Mm. Uh, I just watched the uh, report uh, given by the presidential task force and I was really very happy because in contact tracing right now the number of people per person that have you know has tested positive mm -hmm. has greatly reduced and so uh, one can say with every uh, confidence that the step taken just a few days ago is yielding great results just by the mention of uh, lockdown uh, people uh, are naturally built to adjust and to adapt and so we believe that um, they can harness their mental and emotional resources mm -hmm. so to do. The family is the basic unit of society and the, families, uh, the family is supposed to be the best place. Yeah. Uh, I see a lot of advantage uh, in the lockdown as far as, uh, you know, family unity and coherence and cohesion is, is concerned. I see opportunities for uh, family members to improve on their communication. I see opportunities for family members to uh, relax together and, you know, rather than uh, police and, and, and uh, each other and quarrel uh, and, and find fault, uh, family members can now find avenues to engage in leisure, mm. like indoor games, like even doing indoor exercises, uh, like uh, teasing the best out of each other in mm. terms of um, the, the, the cultural and the intellectual uh, requirements of life are, are, are really concerned. While we are that, you know, the current situation is aggravated by stigmatization, the perceived notion that this could be a death sentence. How do we reverse that before it degenerates further? Yeah, this, this relates more to uh, people who are suspected cases mm. or people who have been diagnosed as, as positive. Uh, you would be amazed and that uh, despite the hues and cries, mm. uh, we only have two deaths. So it can't be a death sentence. There is an appropriate reaction. Uh, there's an appropriate response. Everybody is on the beat. The media is on the beat. The, uh, the security agencies are on the beat. The health practitioners are on the beat. If we all accept to do the needful, then the fear that uh, COVID-19 is a death sentence would not be. Uh, secondly, I want to say that we can also defeat the uh, the, 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 the fear that um, when people come down, there won't be help. We've just been told that uh, the number of testing centers are being increased all over the place mm -hmm. and uh, government is also making available uh, relief materials to uh, disadvantaged people. Uh, so, and, and I believe that faith-based organizations and okay. other it's humanitarian agencies are responding. Barriers. They are really responding to the needs of their various congregants. Mm -hmm. So to the, that extent, I believe very strongly that we have every course to hope that very shortly we'll get out of the woods. 
because I was just wondering how we could leverage on the human mind to move beyond those physical barriers. You know, the mind is a very delicate and funny <laughs> organ. You know, if you ask me, uh -huh. and this is an opportunity for me during the lockdown uh, to find out more about my children, uh, to rediscover my wife, uh, and, and to engage them in, you know, uh, planning for the future of, of the family. The truth is that we have gone, gotten so very busy okay. that uh, we know less and less of each, mm -hmm. of each other. Mm -hmm. This is an opportunity. I believe that COVID-19 um, is uh, a, a, a clarion call for this kind of turnaround in our nation and indeed uh, the entire world. It's making a lemonade out of this situation. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor Andrew Zamani, for coming on Nationwide. Thank you. Okay, moving on. Hope for COVID-19 patients, as medical experts say, timely intervention may save more lives. Let's join doing who is standing by at the University of Abuja Teaching Hospital Isolation Center, Guagualada. Thank you, studio, for joining me. I'm standing just a little far away from the University of Abuja Teaching Hospital Isolation Center, where we have about 25 uh, beds for patients who are uh, to be isolated for the treatment of the COVID-19. And I have with me uh, one of the medical experts that has been on the forefront of uh, providing health care. And of course, the team lead of the isolation center here, who will be telling us about the center. Sir, can we know your name, sir? I'm Dr. Tahiru Yunusa. Uh, the capacity for now, as it stands now, is 25 bedded capacity. Uh, when we started, we started with a patient where we are isolating for those that are suspected. And when they get their result and when they are negative, they go home. For those that are positive, we hold them back to start their chemotherapy, their treatment, and then we'll take good care of them, nutrition and all those things, and make sure that the viral load has gone down and then becomes negative, then we'll discharge them at the end of the day. If you are positive and you are positive for COVID-19, it is not a death sentence because we have had amazing patients that are doing very well. And very soon, we are close to us. It's time we're going to discharge some of the patients. Currently now, we have uh, totally about 18 patients. But you know that this thing is fluidy because the, our colleagues, our hard-working colleagues at the FCT APID department, you know, uh, they'll be doing some fantastic work, amazing work, and they'll be going to contact tracing and they've been bringing in patients. Okay, thank you for your time. Um, I've been speaking with the team lead of the isolation center here at the University of Abuja Teaching Hospital, Guagualada. It's over to you. Thanks, Doin. We will go on a break now. Nationwide continues after these messages, but I've just been told that we will actually be running the full course today. For now, the best and most efficient way to avoid getting infected is through regular hygienic and sanitary practices, as well as social distancing. As individuals, we remain the greatest weapon to fight this pandemic. By washing our hands regularly with clean water and soap, disinfecting frequently used surfaces and areas, coughing into a tissue or elbow, and strictly adhering to infection prevention control measures in health facilities, we can contain this virus. Thanks for rejoining us. For obvious reasons, Lagos is the epicenter of COVID-19 in Nigeria. So let's now join Hingino for details of efforts to contain the virus in that axis. Thank you, Hawa. 
Most residents of Lagos State, the commercial hub of the nation, are complying with the 14 days lockdown directive aimed at containing the spread of coronavirus. Jennifer Igwe reports that a few Lagosians are disregarding the stay-at-home order to engage in various activities. Business areas in Lagos State are still devoid of their usual chaotic din, as most Lagosians heed the presidential stay-home directive to check the deadly coronavirus pandemic. In some residential areas, however, people gather in small groups to discuss challenges that hinder compliance to the all-important directive. No lights. Never have dead lights. We don't even see light for this street. You know what I mean? When they put small things for a camera, then they stay at home. We agree to stay at home, no problem. And I think we are out now. We, are, we, we sell, we do everything. We will be able to provide money to buy food. More presence of the Lagos Neighborhood Safety Corps is helping to disperse youth who have turned the empty Lagos roads to football fields. But we're pleading with them. In as much as you want to play football and all of that, what are the dangers in it? So we had to lecture them on it and they complied with us. A few petty traders who live off what they make daily have chosen to be outdoor. A situation that mirrors the hand-to-mouth lifestyles of the urban poor. In Lagos, Jennifer Igwe, NTA News. And the fight against the spread of COVID-19 across Lagos State recently received a boost when the Lagos State government deployed equipment to all the 57 local governments and local council development authorities for sanitation and disinfection of public spaces and surfaces such as markets and bus stops. No Sausla completes the story. One of the most effective ways to fight the spread of the novel coronavirus is to disinfect highly touched surfaces. Across the world, disinfection teams have descended on state capitol buildings, markets, airports and public roads. Lagos State Governor Babajide Songwulu had earlier in a broadcast said that the state would commence with the disinfection of public places at the local government level to curb the spread of the virus. Local government, health and environmental officials were cited wearing the mandatory protective gear as directed by the Ministry of Health as they go about their essential duties. What we have done is to do uh, the contamination and disinfection of public places. Our health centers will be uh, motorized uh, naps are given to us by the state government. That we have done today. And we hope to continue tomorrow, like for like for like 10 days, as directed by the ex executive governor. For all the material being provided to enable us to sanitize the area. Officials also commended President Muhammadu Buhari for the lockdown order as it made it easier for them to disinfect the environment. The Oriade Local Council Development Chairman said that the equipment would expand the reach of the exercise to all public spaces in the states. In Lagos, Nusa, Osula, NTA News. That's it from Lagos. It's back to you, Hawa. Very well, Hingino, and we are not yet done with the coronavirus pandemic as heads of security agencies in the Federal Capital Territory have expressed concern over the attitude of residents in the suburb to the lockdown directive to curtail the spread of the disease. This was after the monitoring of the lockdown at Nyanya, Dutse and Zuba, amongst entry points to the nation's capital. Ilias Odnotu, Yakubo has more. Abuja, an active city, struck with a sudden bitter pill, too difficult to swallow. The lockdown. So to evade the measure, residents at the suburbs employ decoys against the enforcement team. The change the enforcement teams are now facing is a new culture amongst residents who choose to take advantage of essential workers coming along this way to fill up vehicles and then probably have one or two essential workers with ID cards in front of the vehicles to deceive the enforcement team. You know how our people, these things were clearly spelled out. People need to eat and there are help from places. But you are explaining they are not understanding, and that is Nigeria for you. That was at the Nyanya access. 
The story in Zuba is even worse. Most surprising is this motor park opened with commercial vehicles lined up and waiting to convey travelers. We don't need anybody to enforce. You should weigh the consequences of what you are doing. You may do, get, do what will result in wiping away of, of your entire family. And therefore, persons that are privileged should be careful in what they do. And as you saw, uh, we will not just allow them and ask them to be careful in what they do. We have the capacity to ensure we fix them out. The task force says it will intensify enlightenment alongside the enforcement until the target is achieved. Meanwhile, the Inspector General of Police, Mohamed Adamu, has cautioned officers and men of the Nigerian police force deployed for the enforcement of the lockdown and social restriction orders to ensure that the rights of Nigerians are not infringed upon under any guise. A statement by Force Public Relations Officer Frank Umba says, Persons on essential duty duly exempted from the restriction order must be accorded due courtesies and unfettered access to and from their places of duty. The statement further states that the IGP directs zonal assistant inspectors general of police across the country and commissioners of police to immediately commence supervision to ensure compliance with the standard operating procedure guiding special task. The AIGs and CPs are also to ensure robust anti-crime patrols and surveillance around vulnerable targets. The IGP expresses profound gratitude to Nigerians for their resilience and compliance with the social restriction orders and cooperation with the police at all times. Guests on Good Morning Nigeria have called, for, uh, have called on Nigerians to be more security conscious at this time. The guests who lauded the presidential initiative on the lockdown to contain the COVID-19 analyzed the emerging security threats following the situation. Murjanatu Adam Said reports. Like many other countries, Nigeria is grappling with an enemy, COVID-19. With the numbers increasing by the day, efforts are on top gear to bring the spread to its bearers minimal. However, security experts say in the midst of the unsettling situation, Nigerians must be extra vigilant. People that are at home, no food to eat. People that are traveling, they get stranded on the highway. Some of these guys might be pushed into committing crimes. And that might not be too good for a security situation. So we have two, two issues. Coronavirus on one side, the health issue, health security, then physical security. To provide security for we Nigerians, infrastructure and all of that. So to micromanage this lockdown situation, we have to first and foremost get to that step at the bottom of the ladder. If you refer to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you'll see that at the bottom of the ladder, you need food, shelter. Uh, people send you messages, is this true? You know, you have to go through a lot of um, seven to identify what is true and what is not true. The guests also advise government at all levels to check on the factors that could hinder the implementation of the lockdown and human security across the country. And who have access to power? We're watching TV, charging their phones to have access to all of this we're talking about. Let me also uh, suggest that the police needs to go deep down to the grassroots. And Beyond the synergy among the security agencies. The guests also highlighted the need for government to re-strategize on some of the policies for achieving the purpose for the lockdown and the containment of the common enemy, COVID-19. In Abuja, Murjana to Adam Said, NTA News. And for more on efforts to fight COVID-19 in Nigeria, it's over to Zulay in Kaduna. You're on. Welcome to Kaduna. 
From Katsina, we have a report that the Emir of Katsina, Abdul Mumuni Kabir Usman, has enjoined district heads within the Emirates to liaise with security operatives towards enforcing government's directives on the ban of large gatherings to contain the spread of COVID-19 in their domains. The Emir was speaking at the palace during a sensitization of district heads and imams on preventive measures against the spread of the pandemic being undertaken by the officials of the Katsina State Primary Health Care Development Agency, Shewo Adamo reports. As the world continues to take measures against the current challenges of COVID-19, government at different levels intensified efforts to complement measures towards preventing the spread of the pandemic in the country. Similarly, traditional and religious leaders have followed suit in admonishing the public to ensure strict compliance to all the measures adopted by government to curtail the spread of coronavirus. Emir of Katsina Abdul Mumin Kabir Usman advised the public to always maintain distancing while interacting with one another. This will of the mind, Shina Halizucha, this will of the body, Shina Kakai Jikinka. This will of the environment, Kakai Mahalanka. This is part of what we are doing. Uh, sensitizing the all the uh, the entire Emirate Council on the importance of being vigilant. The enlightenment session attracted questions and answers during which participants pledged to implement all the directives and disseminate same at the grassroots to guard against the spread of COVID-19 in the state. In Kasana, Shehu Adamu, NTA News. And in Kaduna, it's barely a week since the state government locked down its citizens, engaging them through the media on precautionary measures of personal hygiene and social distancing aimed at containing the spread of coronavirus pandemic. Mohamed Omar Rajingi visited some families in Kaduna to find out whether or not they are complying with the public health warnings regarding the global health crisis. The report. Global coronavirus pandemic has forced authorities at different levels to adopt measures targeted at protecting the people. With the number of victims rising by the day in Nigeria, Kaduna State Government, like in other climes, locked down its citizens. Abakwa is one of the most densely populated communities in Kaduna city center. And this house, for instance, accommodates scores of people. This woman, including 10 of her children and the husband, stay in a single room. Buba Yawa, an ex-service man, also lives in this house. Though worried by the poor environmental condition of the house, Buba, like other occupants, say they have no alternative residence. We are in critical condition and survival is becoming difficult. Disturbed by this situation, especially at this period of global health concern, I asked the district head about what is being done to sensitize such families. Coronavirus is real. But Thank God for the support and cooperation of the elders and youth of the community. Lack of compliance with safety warnings and preventive measures according to medical experts contribute to the spread of COVID-19. So stay safe. In Kaduna, I am Muhammad Umar Ajingi, NTA News. And we're back to Hawa in Abuja for more on Nationwide. Sure. Following the Imo state governor's, government's directive on total shutdown of markets in the state as a preventive measure against COVID-19, major markets and business outfits along strategic roads in the state capital are devoid of business operations. Kingsley Ononiu reports that the traders are however appealing for palliative measures to cushion the effect of the shutdown. Though there has been no confirmed case of coronavirus in Imo State, the government is leaving nothing to chance in preventing the killer disease from spreading to the state. This is evident in its decision to shut down the markets and other commercial activities. A visit to Ekonuwa, Alaba, Relief and World Bank markets shows total compliance with the shutdown order. Because of the virus, that is spreading everywhere now. They say we should close and we admit it so that it will not come to us. Everything is done and they, we, we don't have anything to back ourselves up. The government should find a solution that is not going to affect us. The State Commissioner for Commerce and Industry, 
Kingston and Nigeria says the total shutdown of markets is in the best interest of the state. But we're all on board together. Palliative will come by God's grace, but those in their, within their purview to do what they're supposed to do should do so. Security operatives we are seeing enforcing the ban on trading activities along major routes leading to the affected markets in Oweri, Kings Leonaniwu, NTA News. And Kemi in Ibadan has more reports for us on Nationwide. Hello, Kemi. And welcome to Ibado. This is always one of the steps apart from the symptoms which could influence suspicion. In this report, corresponding to Rafi Animashan Badmos, takes a look at the process beyond the initials in Oyo State. The two diagnostic centers to be opened, according to the governor, are awaiting the Nigerian Center for Disease Control Validation. The agent for testing already ordered are also being awaited. He maintained his ban on social gatherings, emphasizing that gatherings should be limited to 30 persons or less. Governor Makinde later paid an inspection visit to one of the isolation centers in Jericho, where he promised to make available 100 best places for affected persons, adequate facilities, and necessary medical attention to address the COVID-19 pandemic. With the confirmation of the first case and a clear understanding of how this disease can be transmitted, it cannot remain business as usual. But these are the sacrifices we need to make to preserve and protect our loved ones. In the meantime, you work from own directive ahead of service of the Federation for non-essential federal workers has taken effect. So as it is now, all my staff have left for home, except those that are on essential services. In the battle, Shalom Wahid, NC News. The report was by Shola Wahid. Money is a medium of exchange either in form of coin or banknotes. Grace Bamedeli in this package examines the possibility of the spread of COVID-19 through handling of cash. Although no record of COVID-19 yet in Oshu State, Governor Uyitola in a statewide broadcast said government has taken proactive measures by bringing in experts in respective fields in order to keep people safe from coronavirus. Governor Boye Goyetola enjoyed all citizens to strictly observe high level of personal hygiene and avoid non-essential travels within the country. We are also in partnership with the African Center of Excellence in Genomics of Infectious Diseases at the Poesy Investigation. We also created a coding center to isolate and treat possible reported cases. The government urged the people not to panic, but cooperate with the government by obeying the instructions and directive. In Oshobo, Timitok Wodebumi, NTA News. Timitok Wodebumi's report will conclude our contribution from here in Ibadan. Hawa, it's back to you. Very well, Kemi, and we will, straight, we will go straight for another commercial break. The government of Niger State has set up a COVID-19 fundraising committee to solicit for support from well-meaning Nigerians and corporate organizations to assist in the fight to curb the spread of the coronavirus in the state. You can save lives by sending your donations through the following account number. Account name, Niger State COVID-19 Intervention Appeal Fund. 10227517730 Sort code 0331631189 Bank UBA God bless you as you lend your support to save lives For further information please contact 080-3636-5891 Announcer Ahmed Ibrahim Matani Secretary to the Government of Niger State and Chairman Niger State COVID-19 Task Force <laughs> And Jenny in our Port Harcourt Network Center is next on our lineup. Thank you, Hawa. Welcome to Port Harcourt. Thank you, Hawa. Traditional leaders in River State have called on citizens to cooperate with relevant authorities and strictly adhere to the security measures to curtail the spread of COVID 19 in the state. Jenny Kumel Ulolo completes the story. 
it was a pleasant surprise to be handed an alcohol-based sanitizer and face mask at the palace of Eze Mankia Lechi, an indication that there is high level of awareness to contain the spread of COVID-19. We have to do the needful before getting down to business that brought us here. The measures that His Excellency have enumerated, though very, very, very draconian, if those of you who are in law can say, but they have things to save our situation, so we must abide by it. After government placed a number of restrictions on socio-economic activities in the state, traditional leaders on their part urged rivers people to adhere to medical experts' advice and comply with restrictions by authorities to curb the spread of coronavirus. The government is doing a lot. The government cannot do all. It is rest in the hours of the traditional rulers to make sure that their localities are being sensitized. They called on all citizens to cooperate with government efforts to curtail the spread of the virus by adhering to precautionary measures and maintaining good hygiene. In Port Harcourt, Danukume Ulolu, NTA News. River State Governor Yeson Wike monitored the level of compliance of the curfew imposed by the state government on Obriquere Junction, Ozoaba, Rumoluagu to Choba, and from Education Bus Stop to Ajib Junction. Ogedi Yekwere reports. The curfew was imposed on Obiriquere Junction, Ozoaba, Romalogo to Chuba, and from Education Bus Stop to Ajib Junction after residents of these areas failed to comply with directive on the closure of markets across the state. The curfew is aimed at ensuring that residents of these areas observe the sit-at-home directive to check the spread of coronavirus in the state. While monitoring the level of compliance, the governor made his observations to the security operatives on ground in the curfew affected areas. What is the blockage? This way, to this dedication for staff. This, this is how it goes to here. This place and this place should be blocked. Yeah, the other place where this tank are. Yes, it should block them. Don't allow them to move to anywhere. The state government says that the curfew imposed in these parts of the city is 24 hours till further notice. In Port Harcourt, Oge Dinyekwe, NTA News. And that's it. It's back to you, Hawa. Very well, Jenny. Let's now take you to Benway State, where Governor Samuel Otom has charged council chairmen and traditional rulers to be highly committed to sensitizing their communities and ensuring compliance with all directives regarding the spread of coronavirus. The governor said that these at a maiden meeting with members of the local government COVID-19 Action Committee at the government house in Makudi. Charles Abba has that. Governor Samuel Otom, who says his administration places high premium on the health and safety of the lives of the people, emphasizes that COVID-19 disease is no respecter of persons as Many high-profile personalities have tested positive to the virus. The governor maintains that all hands must be on deck to curb the spread of the virus. As your governor, I have declared one month fasting and prayer against this virus and pray to God to have mercy. The chairman, Benway State Traditional Council, Professor James Ayasi, who calls for palliative measures for the less privileged in the state, says that he has continued to address his subjects on precautionary measures against the pandemic. We have some concerns at the rural areas. A lot of our sons and daughters are coming back home from areas that are endemic, from Lagos access, from Abuja access, and they are coming in large numbers. The inaugurated local government COVID-19 Action Committee has levels of council, kindred, and streets. In Makudi, Charles Abba, NTA News. Sports now. Global sports calendar continues to readjust amid coronavirus pandemic. Kene Imagwadike tells us more on sports update. <laughs> 